Hello, everybody. My name is Simon Hiscock, and I'm the director of Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this international symposium celebrating botanic gardens, past, present, and future, sponsored by Plants People Planet. In the year we celebrate the 400th anniversary of Oxford Botanic Garden, we wanted to join with our collaborators and botanic garden partners in the UK and around the world to celebrate all our histories and the important work we all do at our various botanic gardens, and also to think about the role of botanic gardens in the future. Over the next two days, we will be hearing about a wonderful diversity of subject material, but being taxonomically inclined, we have tried to group these talks into four key areas of botanic garden endeavor, research, education and engagement, collections and horticulture, and conservation. Between these sessions, we will have four keynote talks that span these themes. To aid the smooth running of the symposium, many of the talks have been pre-recorded with only the chairperson appearing live. However, at the end of each session, speakers will come together live to answer questions and take part in a discussion facilitated by the chair. Questions to speakers should be placed in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and will be collated for the discussion at the end of the session. Any other questions or technical issues should be placed in the chat function. We have a technical team on hand who will deal with these and respond to you quickly. Also, Please note that the symposium is being recorded, but your cameras are switched off, and so you are not being recorded. By bringing together so many botanic gardens and botanical institutions around the world, we hope we can inspire and ignite new collaborations and partnerships. To this end, I am delighted that we are joined by speakers from botanic gardens in cities twinned with Oxford, some of whom we at Oxford Botanic Garden already work with and others that we do not yet. Oxford City Councillor Bob Price, who joins me now, has championed the city's international links for many years. Bob, I'm delighted you could join us today Perhaps you could say a few words about Oxford's international links and in particular, its twin city partnerships. Thank you, Simon, and welcome to everybody to this wonderful symposium. Uh, I'm delighted to be representing the City Council here today. Uh, as Simon said in his introduction, the University of Oxford has been an international institution since its inception. Uh, and has a global reach uh, intellectually and personally. And the city has followed suit. In the last 75 years, we've developed eight city partnerships between the people of Oxford and the people of eight partner cities across different parts of the globe, from France, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands, in Western Europe, Perm in Russia, Ramallah in the Middle East, Leon in the uh, Central America. And that provides for us a tremendous source of uh, enjoyment and richness in Oxford's life. Each of those cities uh, is twinned through an association of Oxford citizens, a voluntary association that seeks to foster links between those cities and Oxford citizens, whether they be interested in choirs or dance or science or schools. It creates links between people with similar interests across those cities. And on many occasions in the last uh, 70 years, we've brought them all together uh, in Oxford or elsewhere to celebrate the international partnerships and international reach that we, we all have. The links that we have, I think, are, have been reflected in this wonderful seminar. 
and we're delighted that at least five of our twin partner cities have been able to uh, appear today and tomorrow uh, as part of the symposium through their botanic gardens. And we hope that this will be, as Simon said in his introduction, the beginning of even greater partnerships between the various cities. Thanks very much, Bob. And on that last point um, about being joined by five um, of the eight, um, we were to be six. And uh, I'm very sorry to say that the Paul Kessler, who was going to join us from Leiden, had to withdraw because of ill health. So, uh, Paul, if you are watching, um, we wish you all the best and um, hope you make a full recovery soon and we'll hopefully re-engage with, with Leiden um, soon. So, um, Bob, yeah, you've, you've been doing a lot over the years um, for Oxford uh, in, in its international links. Um, what, what, what are some of the most, um, what are some of the, the, the most important achievements you think you, you, you've, you've made and initiated? Well, I think the biggest uh, impact we've been able to make, uh, Simon, and I hope that this is also going to be reflected in what we can do in the uh, general world of botany and plant sciences, has been between young people across our eight twins. I think every twinning association has hosted quite large groups of young people from those uh, eight cities over the last 70 years. and there have been strong links built up between uh, the various schools in the different countries, uh, which allowed those um, associations to continue over the years. The, the children, of course, move on, but the schools themselves remain closely in partnership. And I think in the context of the global challenges we face in terms of climate change and ecological degradation, uh, it's really important that we use our international associations as a means of being able to link up the young people across the globe, across our eight uh, twin cities and our botanic garden friends in those cities to illustrate the ways in which plant sciences and ecology can be linked uh, to the curriculum and to their practical lives as school students. Uh, I know from the last two years of links where we've been linking primarily over Zoom with the Twin Cities, that young people are absolutely committed to combating climate change, to doing their bits as much as they can. And if we can actually reinforce that process through the partner gardens, through the associations in the next five to 10 years, I'd be more than delighted. That's, that's great. And, and I do hope that we can, um, in, in terms of Oxford Botanic Garden and the education work that we do, um, strengthen some of the links between Oxford and young people. Um, certainly this year in our 400th, we've, we've made a, 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 a conscious decision to really engage more with schools in, uh, in terms of, of what can be done to offset um, the effects of climate change and reduce um, carbon footprints. And as part of our 400th, we did a, a campaign to plant 400 trees in and around Oxford with, with local schools, and we far exceeded that, of course. Um, and we're, we're continuing with this programme. And so maybe that's something we can look to uh, extend through our memoranda of understanding and also the twin city links between uh, with the botanic gardens in, in our twin cities and their links with, with schools and do more. In, in that, because of course the young people are the future botanists, the future plant scientists, and that's really what we've been thinking about in our 400th year. And that particularly came across in the exhibition that we put on at the uh, Western Library part of the Bodleian um, Roots to Seeds, where we had plant science, young plant scientists, um, uh, students from Oxford present their thoughts for the future. And so that was a great one to uh, end on. And uh, I hope we can do something like that with, with, with other, um, spread the word across our twin, twin cities. Um, 
Bob, it's been great that you can um, join us at the start of, of this meeting and we're, we'll be hearing from um, some of our partner gardens at Twin Cities um, soon. And I hope you can stay with us for the rest of the, the, the programme or as much as you can. I certainly will be. Thank you, Simon, very much. And thank you very much again for inv inviting me and the Twin Associations for taking part. Great. Thank you, Bob. Now, um, before we start the programme, um, for context, I will present a potted history of Oxford Botanic Garden, how we are celebrating the 400th anniversary and our aspirations for the future. Uh, this has been recorded so I can be kept to time. So. Oxford Botanic Garden is the oldest botanic garden in the UK. It was founded in 1621 by Henry Danvers, first Earl of Danby, as a physic garden for teaching the medical students of Oxford about plants used in herbal medicine. And Danby is commemorated in our iconic entrance gate, the Danby Gate, pictured just below. The first 20 or so years after the founding of the Botanic Garden was spent building the garden itself, uh, lifting the level of the land. It sits on a, on a floodplain near the River Charwell, and that was done with 4,000 wagon loads of muck and dung um, obtained by the university sca scavenger. And as well as raising the land over that 20 or so years, a wall was built around the garden with four magnificent uh, entrance gates in the style of, of um, Renaissance physic gardens within Europe. So it wasn't until the 1640s that the garden was really ready to plant. And to plant the garden, the first um, keeper or horti hortus perfectus, um, as they were called then, um, was appointed. And that was Jacob Bobart. Um, a local man who was uh, a great nurseryman um, and grower of plants. And he came to the garden in 1642 and started planting the um, medicinal plants, the simples as they were called for the purpose of the garden. And also he planted some interesting exotic plants that were coming in from different parts of, of, of Europe and the rest of the world, especially, which fascinated him. Um, and he also grew vegetables and fruits, which he sold to the residents of Oxford to supplement his fairly meagre income. This is what the garden looked like um, in terms of the plan in the um, mid to late 1600s, uh, laid out in the conventional style of a Renaissance physic garden with uh, a cruciform arrangement of central paths and four segments within the walled garden with its four arches. And this um, print is from a, a, a plan of uh, 1675, one of the oldest remaining plans of the garden. Following um, Bobart the Elder's death, his son, Jacob Bobart the Younger, took over as the keeper of the garden. And he worked closely with a very influential lady, Mary Somerset, Duchess of Beaufort, who had a grand estate um, with the Duke at Badminton in Gloucester. And they started exchanging uh, plant material and also corresponding with other physic gardens um, and monastic um, communities in Europe to obtain seeds of a more exotic nature for growing in her garden at Badminton and also for the garden at Oxford. And in effect, um, Bobart the Younger was a sort of um, botanical advisor to Mary Somerset and their activities in obtaining seed from different parts of Europe um, are thought to be the basis of the, the modern way of exchanging seeds between botanic gardens around the world and the inception of index seminar that say what species are available from particular gardens. One um, famous plant that they um, introduced to the British Isles um, is the eponymous um, ragwort of Oxford, 
the Oxford ragwort, Senecio squalidus, uh, which I have been doing research on for many years now. And the plant is called Oxford ragwort because it was first described by Linnaeus from specimens sent over to him from Oxford. Um, and this plant has a history of, of beginning its uh, spread from um, across the UK from the Botanic Garden in Oxford. It, it started to um, grow in the walls of the garden and some of the old college buildings before escaping along the railway lines during the Industrial Revolution. Now, interestingly, this plant is a hybrid between um, two species that are native and um, grow on uh, native to, to Sicily, Mount Etna in particular, one growing at high altitude, the other growing at low altitude. And it was um, it was conventionally thought that the that the hybrid material that that Oxford ragwort is derived from um, came over as hybrid seed from Mount Etna. However, um, research by the curator of um, the Oxford herbaria, Stephen Harris, identified the fact that both parents of the Oxford ragwort were actually growing in the garden of um, the Duchess of Beaufort at Badminton, whereas only one species, one parent species, and the hybrid were, were contained in the um, herbarium records at, at Oxford. So um, we carried out a, a fairly in-depth genomic analysis of um, Oxford ragwort, its parents and various populations in Europe and in Sicily um, a few years ago and used um, Bayesian probability computation combined with large genomic data sets to explore the timing of the hybridization that created Oxford ragwort. And lo and behold, the greatest support came for, from, um, came for a, a more recent origin than would have predict, been predicted had it arisen by hybridization on Mount Etna. So we published a paper in Molecular, molecular Ecology last year, um, which gave strong support for a hybrid origin in the garden of the Duchess of Beaufort, which um, is, is an extraordinary uh, sort of continuation of this story that began with the Duchess and um, Bobart the Younger uh, importing seed from, from Sicily. Other famous historical characters that um, crop up in the garden's history are Robert Morrison, um, who was the first professor of botany uh, at Oxford and who was um, largely responsible for creating one of the first, if not the first, uh, systematic uh, taxonomy of plants. Previously, they were classified according to um, medicinal use. And he also made great use of um, fruits as a, 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 a taxonomic character and created the, the first um, botanical um, uh, monograph of the of a particular group in the umbelliferae, the carrot family. Then there was Johann Delenius who came along um, later in that, that century and um, he was responsible for creating a famous flora, the, the, the Hortus alphamensis, and also um, compiling a very, one of the first comprehensive floras of, of, of mosses and liverworts and hornworts. John Sibthorpe later, um, collected plants on expeditions to Greece, the Eastern Mediterranean, following in the fo footsteps of Dioscorides. And that led to two uh, large herbaria, but also famously to the Flora Graeca with Ferdinand Bauer, the botanical artist who accompanied him, which is one of the greatest works of botanical um, art ever produced and one of the most wonderful floras in the collections here at Oxford. Then moving on, Charles Daubeny um, was the man who gave the name Botanic Garden to the garden here at Oxford, changing the name from the Physic Garden um, to, to um, represent the fact that um, the garden was changing in its, in, its, in its science 
and becoming more experimental based. Daubney as a chemist was very keen on finding out more about plant nutrition and the, the effects of fertilizers and did many experiments. He also created the first glass houses and grew the um, newly discovered uh, giant water lily from the Amazon. Then moving on into the 20th century, um, Cyril Darlington, um, great um, geneticist, chromosomal biologist, who um, discovered the intricacies of crossing over during um, meiosis and establishing the, the basis of, of, of variation caused by crossing over an exchange of chromosomes. So that was a, a bit of a, a rush through some of the historical moments of the garden. And this year we've been doing our best to celebrate uh, 400 years since the foundation of the garden during a, a pandemic. And uh, we've, we've managed to uh, pull off a few uh, important small events during this year. We'll have more next year um, when it's safer to do so. Um, and our, one of our first um, visits to the garden, uh, the VIP visits came with the um, G7 health ministers visit um, in June when they held a conference here in Oxford discussing the vaccination programme across the world and, and vaccines generally. And they came to the Botanic Garden to acknowledge its foundation as a physic garden 400 years ago and each planted a, um, a, a Japanese cherry tree uh, in memory of those that had died during the pandemic. Um, and ironically, this um, got the Botanic Garden the first ever, I don't know of any other Botanic Garden that has featured on the cover of our uh, famous, most popular satirical magazine, The Private Eye. Then we had some other, um, other important visits not long after the G7 health ministers, we had a visit from His Royal Highness Prince Charles, Prince of Wales, who is the patron of the Botanic Garden and the friends of the Oxford Botanic Garden. And he came along and like the um, health ministers, he also planted a tree. He planted a black pine, which is a, a descendant of the famous uh, tree that grew in the garden between 1830 and 2014 when it split down the middle and had to be uh, removed um, for safety reasons and he was delighted to plant this offspring of that famous tree because it was so uh, loved by J.R.R. Tolkien the author of Lord of the Rings and he got great inspiration from that tree so it was a fitting one for the, His Royal Highness to plant. Then on the actual day of the founding, July 25th, we had a visit from the Chancellor of Oxford University, Lord Patton of Barnes, um, who was guest of honour in a small group of 50 or so people celebrating the founding day. And at the same um, event, we launched a very special new hybrid rose to celebrate the 400th anniversary the Oxford Physic Rose, which is one of the legacies of the 400th, along with a, a number of other um, things that we've created to mark the 400th so that we have not just celebrations, but lasting legacies. These include um, new poetry from the Professor of Poetry, Alice Oswald here at Oxford, um, some new compositions by uh, the Oxford Leader Festival, um, in a song cycle that commemorates the garden and is inspired by the garden. And we have um, even a, 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 a celebration whiskey created with local distillers, the Oxford Artisan Distillery. And that's where we are in 2021. We're celebrating 400 years and we've got a year of celebrations uh, planned, which this wonderful symposium today is is part of that year of, of celebrations and we're also looking forward to the future and we have some very ambitious plans for redevelopment at the garden and at the arboretum we desperately need new glass houses to replace the glass houses we currently have that are not really fit for purpose and certainly don't have a carbon footprint that any botanic garden should be proud of and we hope that we can create um, a new 
glasshouse experience here in the centre of Oxford, a tropical rainforest in the centre of Oxford, where we'll be able to grow incredibly exotic plants, particularly parasitic plants. And our, 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 our um, expert in growing parasitic plants, uh, Deputy Director Chris Thurgood, who you'll be hearing from this in, in this symposium, has grand ambitions to grow uh, Rafflesia, the, 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 the largest flower of any uh, plant, which of course is a parasitic plant, and maybe our new glass houses will give that opportunity. We also have plans to create a visitor and learning centre at the Arboretum, our sister site at Newnham Courtney, just outside of Oxford, and we're awaiting um, the, uh, the, the, the result of an application to the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, to help fund that uh, important addition to that wonderful um, sister site of 140 acres of wonderful woodland and pine eaten. As we move towards 2022, we will be looking to renew our um, strategy for the Botanic Garden and currently our core strategies chime to some extent with the, um, with the, 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 the four sessions of this symposium. And our strategies have focused on research, education and engagement, conservation and visitor experience, all bundled up within hard science and science messaging um, within our interpretation and all the work that we do. And our motto, um, our mission motto is sharing the scientific wonder and importance of plants with the world. So I'll just finish by saying, a little more about what we mean by um, sharing the scientific wonder and importance of plants with the world. This wonder of plants is something I experienced as a young child when I saw my first bee orchid. And like the poet Langhorn, um, who wrote, I sought the living bee to find and found the picture of a bee, I marveled at the beauty of this little floral recreation of a bee and wondered how on earth this could um, have come to, to, to be, if you pardon the sort of pun. There's so much wonder wrapped up in that image, that flower, evolution, pollination biology, ecology, developmental biology, developmental genetics. It's extraordinary to think that evolution molded such a flower. And during the course of this symposium, we'll be hearing more marvels of the botanical world. So I'll end by saying, let the wonder begin. Now let's uh, get the symposium underway. So welcome to session one, where the focus is on research. For those of you just joining us, please note this symposium is being recorded, but your cameras are switched off. So you're not gonna be recorded. If you require any technical assistance, please use the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, which is being monitored by our team and someone will get back to you as soon as possible. If you want to post a question to a speaker, you can use the Q&A function at any time and these will be collated for the speakers to answer at the end of the session in the discussion. So our first speaker today is Barbara Bolden, Director of the Padua Botanic Garden with which Oxford has an MOU and it's also uh, one of the uh, twin cities of, of Oxford. Barbara will be telling us about ongoing research at Padua Botanic Garden and especially about her own research on the role of pollination in controlling ovule development in ginkgo. So over to you, Barbara.
Thank you, Simon, for your kind presentation and for inviting me to present you the oldest university botanic garden in the world and the research that takes place there. The botanic garden was founded in 1545 to meet the wishes of Francesco Bonafede, the teacher of Lectura Simplicium, a sort of present-day pharmaceutical botany at the School of Medicine of the University of Padova. Francesco Bonafede uh, thought that uh, it should be of paramount importance uh, for the student of medicine to see uh, the true medicinal plants uh, and to learn how to recognize them. Actually, the Botanic Garden maintains its original location and the uh, original elegant plan shown in the first illustrated guide of the garden published by uh, Girolamo Porro in 1591. Uh, the garden is divided into main sections uh, with different uh, educational and uh, conservation tasks. Today, the plant species uh, cultivated in the garden are about 4,000. It houses uh, uh, thematic plant collection and uh, monumental trees. Among them, uh, a camera psumilis uh, uh, specimens, uh, 15, uh, uh, 18, uh, five planted, that you can see here in this picture. Uh, this plant is uh, celebrated as the oldest plant in the garden and uh, has the uh, plant described by uh, Goethe in his book on plant metamorphose, uh, written after his famous travel in Italy in 1786. During uh, its almost uh, five centuries of activity, it has experienced the, the evolution of botany from science applied to medicine to uh, basic plant science, uh, with a constant uh, adaptation to the most advanced uh, discoveries uh, in botanical and educational sciences. Uh, the garden became a model for uh, other botanic garden and uh, it has represented an exceptional witness of scientific and cultural uh, significance. Uh, for this uh, reason, in 1997, it has included in the uh, UNESCO World Heritage List. And here in this slide, you can see uh, the main motivations for the uh, inscriptions. Another uh, fundamental event uh, marked the botanic garden history, the biodiversity garden birth. Nowadays, the uh, ancient garden is uh, surrounded by houses and buildings and without any possibility of expansion. An available closed area was bought by University of Padova in 2000. In uh, this area, the construction of satellite garden has been completed in September 2014. Uh, the biodiversity garden is uh, constituted by several new greenhouses, uh, where plant representative uh, of the main habitats uh, of the world are grown. Uh, the biodiversity garden allows visitor uh, to make uh, um, a virtual phytogeographic uh, journey through uh, various biomes uh, ranging from tropical to humid and from temperate to arid one. Visitors can appreciate the, the richness of the plant diversity in the world and then uh, they can appreciate it the story of the millennial relationship between plants and the human being. The new glass, glass houses uh, have also spaces that can be used for didactics and scientific research. This uh, means a, a new input of the garden to its mission of conservation, education, research in a modern and updated surrounding. 
actually, uh, after a long time frame in which low research activity was performed, we are engaged in uh, the following research subjects. First, uh, a revaluation of the uh, herbarium and scent collections. Uh, in particular, we are performing a molecular characterization of the Saccardo Mycological Collection. This collection is composed by almost 70,000 dried specimens. And this work uh, aims to link the sample morphological description to uh, molecular data, provide an equivocal identification of fungal species by DNA barcoding approach. Some papers are already published about this uh, topic. Another um, topic uh, we are studying is uh, the study about flower and fruit development of Infealis using uh, Madbox genes as marker. One paper has been very recently published and one uh, about fruit development is in preparation. Now we are uh, interested in the diverse gymnosperm fleshy structures associated to the seed. We published this year a review in which we discussed the uh, available evolutionary hypothesis that subtended the processes uh, responsible for the formation of these seed uh, associated structures. Uh, within this context, uh, I will focus our, your attention on the uh, last research data obtained concerning the uh, role of pollination in controlling ginkgo biloba of development and uh, seed coat formation. In angiosperm, the two seed coats development is uh, triggered by fertilization, while in gymnosperm, uh, the mechanism activating the single seed coat development is quite unknown. The uh, ovule formation in ginkgo biloba starts in winter uh, within the closed parts. In early spring, ovules, once extruded from the buds, uh, release um, the liquid pollination drop that allows the capture of pollen grains. Nevertheless, the fertilization occurs four months after the event of pollination, at the end of the uh, summer, and seeds are ready to be shed in uh, late autumn. Despite uh, the importance of the seed coat, almost nothing uh, is known regarding the molecular aspect of the seed coat formation in gymnosperm. Our goal is to understand the process of integument initiation and its subsequent development into a seed coat with two different approaches. The morphological approach uh, that uh, allows us to identify the ovular development stages, stages uniquely uh, to provide an atlas based on uh, appreciable morphological changes and uh, make uh, this atlas available to the scientific community. And the molecular approach that uh, through uh, RNA-Sec, uh, QRT, PCR, and in situ identification will provide uh, molecular pathways responsible for the ovule integument development in Ginkgo and uh, identify the uh, processes leading the seed coat uh, formation. We uh, first uh, produced a morphological atlas describing the ovule structures and the developmental timing uh, from initiation here to the uh, fertilization. The um, um, description uh, allows us to characterize and precisely describe 13 stages of ovule development 
giving origin to uh, this uh, already published table uh, in which uh, all these uh, steps are uh, listed. Starting uh, from the morphological studies, uh, we um, observe that ginkgo ovule integument acquires uh, typical uh, characteristics of the seed coat uh, long before the fertilization takes place. Indeed, uh, in its uh, single uh, ovule integument differentiated three layers, the uh, inner endotesta, the middle sclerotesta, and the outer sarcotesta. Long before the fertilization, we assist to the hardening of the sclerotesta and the softening of the sarcotesta. We also have observed that uh, after the pollination time frames, ovules that uh, haven't uh, received pollen aborted. Thus, uh, we suggest that uh, the pollination is uh, the trigger event that leads uh, to the further progression of the ovule development and uh, seed coat formation. The, to determine whether uh, the pollen arrival is fundamental in driving uh, these processes, we have performed transcriptomics and metabolomics analysis on ovule uh, collected around the event of pollination. Omics analysis uh, were performed uh, before the uh, pollination, after the pollination event, precisely on the um, pre-pollination stage, the pollination drop stage, and the three uh, pollination drop substages of the ovule uh, development. For transcriptomic data, uh, the, the gene ontology uh, analysis and the CAG analysis performed comparing pre-pollination stages and drop stages uh, here, uh, revealed that uh, two ontological macro categories of different cellular processes uh, namely the mobilization of energy resources and the construction of the cell walls included many differentially expressed genes. Indeed, the same pathway are mostly down regulated comparing substages after pollination. We observe that some MIB family transcription factors uh, belonging to the lignin regulatory network are uh, differentially expressed comparing the pre-pollination stage with the post-pollination ones. In particular, um, putative uh, ginkgo ortholots of Arabidopsis activator of the lignin biosynthesis pathway, um, in particular MIB B6126-46 uh, were up regulated. The, in in Ginkgo, uh, on the other hand, the uh, majority of the putative uh, Ginkgo orthologs uh, of Arabidopsis uh, switch genes, uh, I mean uh, genes that are activated or repressed after fertilization, are not uh, differentially expressed between pre-pollination and post-pollination drop start stages. Uh, uh, neither uh, between pollination drop and post-pollination drop substages. On the same stages, we uh, also performed metabolomics analysis. Uh, the CAC based enriched analysis revealed an enrichment of the pathway for starch and sucrose metabolism and uh, amino acid metabolism. Uh, Transcriptomics and metabolomics analysis result su uh, suggest that uh, in Ginkgo biloba, the single seed coat differentiation starts upon the event of pollination. Lignin biosynthesis genes essential for sclerotest formation and genes required for the accumulation of fatty acid 
and the butanoate metabolism genes that are major components of the mature sarcotesta are up regulated after the pollination has uh, occurred. Most importantly, uh, this analysis highlights uh, also the accumulation of secondary metabolites involved in uh, lignin biosynthesis. These results uh, indicate that uh, this switch is triggered by pollination long before fertilization. The untargeted metabolomics analysis strongly supported the transcriptomics data about the uh, development of the three layers of the single uh, integument. Lastly, uh, to acquire insights into the mechanism that regulate ovule development in Ginkgo biloba, we uh, have performed uh, in situ hybridization of uh, homeotic genes on ovule primordia within the buds and on ovules uh, around the time of pollination. First, we uh, selected some genes known to be involved in the integument development process in angiosperm, as Bel1, uh, Antegumenta, Agamus, uh, Canadi. I will, uh, I will show you some preliminary uh, results. For instance, the expression of class 3 HD ZEP transcription factor orthologs in buds in Hopo Primordia, uh, where the, uh, the signal were, was detectable in the developing vascular tissue, both in leaves and in ovules while in ovules around the time of pollination the signal was detected in the female gametophyte region with a strong signal coming from the tapetum and a weaker signal uh, at the calasal side of the micellus. The expression of two orthologs uh, of Bell 1 uh, were also investigated in bats uh, the first uh, bell is expressed principally in the apex of the ovule, in the area where uh, nucellus and integument will differentiate. While this bell one, uh, it seems not to be expressed in ovules around the pollination time. The other bell one uh, is expressed only in the female gametophytes region in the ovule around the time of pollination. The Ginkgo uh, uh, Yab 1b that belongs to the Yab family of transcription factor does not seem to be expressed in the ovule primordial, as uh, you can see here in this uh, uh, picture, but uh, is expressed uh, at high level in the abaxial side of all developing leaves. And in ovules around the time of pollination, YAB 1B is restricted to the female gametophyte region. Although the uh, same set uh, uh, of gene is expressed for uh, the ovule development in Arabidopsis and Ginkgo ovules, the pattern of expression and the timing of expression of this orthologs are not always conserved. Some genes, uh, as uh, uh, Agamus or uh, HD ZIP, are expressed um, where the orthologs are expressed in Arabidopsis and also in other gymnosperm, suggesting a conserved function among seed plants. Other genes, uh, for instance, uh, Bell1 Yabbi, uh, display patterns of expression only partially comparable to those of other seed plants, with uh, some particularity uh, concerning uh, uh, the Ginkgo. So these uh, peculiarities are unique to Ginkgo. Uh, this project was uh, financed by a national project, the PRIN, and uh, also uh, this project has received funding from the uh, European community 
under the Marie Slodowska Curie uh, Grant Agreement. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Barbara, indeed. Um, our next speaker is Alex Antonelli, Director of Science at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q, who will be telling us um, about how artificial intelligence can accelerate biodiversity research and conservation. So over to you, Alex. Thanks, Simon, and huge congratulations to yourself and your team and everyone else at the Oxford Botanic Garden for this fantastic celebration. 400 years is an amazing age. And what I'd like to talk about today is how artificial intelligence and some other new technologies can help us to really understand how biodiversity is changing over time and space and how to prioritize our efforts and resources uh, for the conservation and study of uh, biological diversity across the globe. What I'd like to do is just to give you a bit of context of why this is so uh, absolutely crucial for us today. Of course, we know we are living in an age of extinction. About one million species now face extinction. That's an estimation that is based on both current assessment of extinction threats for species, but also the predictions of the species that haven't been assessed so far. And that includes about two in five plant species, a number that my colleagues at Kew and collaborators have come up with. And at the same time, as so many species are uh, likely to disappear unless we drastically change uh, conditions for them, we're also discovering many new species to science. And about 2,000 new plant species and 2,000 new uh, fungal species, previously unknown to scientists, sometimes to local people, but, but they also have been described every single year. And we think now that about 20 or more percent of all plant species and over 95 percent of all fungal species still remain unknown to scientists. So at the same time as we're discovering this amazing diversity of uh, plants, fungi and other species as well, we're probably losing them faster than we can find them. And of course, Many of those effects are being caused by change to the environment, especially in the tropics, including South, in South America or Brazil, where I come from. And uh, many of those ecosystems are, are now being replaced uh, to give space for soybeans and oil palms and other commodities. But we don't have to be looking that far. And even here, closer to home, uh, the changes are also very drastic. England, for instance, has lost about 90% of all natural wetlands, and that's an ecosystem which is very diverse, both for plants but also animals. It plays important roles for carbon sequestration and uh, retention. It also affects uh, the leakage of nutrients into the oceans and our marine life. So overall, across the, the world, both uh, on land and at sea, the change we're doing to environments is uh, believed to be the number one cause to uh, the, the threat of species uh, of both plants and animals, uh, which is, of course, a very dire picture. And we're just trying to understand now where the biggest effects are going to be. And alongside habitat change, we have the effects of climate change. And we, of course, know that climate change is affecting um, everyone on this planet. There have been massive change in temperature. Uh, over the last 170 years. Many of you have seen this uh, figure before, I believe, and that really shows how temperatures have been changing and uh, especially in the last few decades, all the temperature extremes and those effects, uh, both for our own lives, but also for species is something that we need to understand uh, so that we can focus our attention to protect species against the effects of climate change. So the big question here, is how do habitat changes and global warming affect biodiversity? And we need to answer this question really to understand uh, how to best focus uh, our policies, uh, our investments in conservation, so that we can 
lead to mitigation uh, of climate change and uh, habitat loss. What I'd like to do now is really to walk you through three projects that some collaborators and myself have been working on in the use of artificial intelligence to help us, help us understand those changes and, um, and look at both uh, short-term scales, but also a bit longer uh, time scales so that we can learn a bit more uh, from the data available. And that's combining both uh, observations and records stored in our botanic gardens, in our, in our herbaria, in other collections, but, but also some data gathered through new technologies, as I'm going to show in a, in a minute. The first example, the first example here is uh, a, pro a project I've been working on together with Daniele Silvestro in Switzerland, uh, and also now uh, Kieran, a new postdoc, joining our group. And uh, it, it's really ab about understanding which areas should be protected to uh, conserve as many species and as much diversity as possible. We've been using a technique within artificial intelligence called reinforcement learning. And that's something that people have been using in gaming and finances for some time now. But I don't really think it has been applied in conservation before. And uh, I, I know this is a busy diagram, but it's basically just to show how uh, the, the system works. So it's a platform, uh, as you see, there's a loop between two main blocks and the system evolves. And the system here is this square with the number of species and, and individuals. And that changes over time as there's uh, hu human disturbance, but also climate change. And depending on how the system changes, uh, it's going to inform, uh, inform a neural network and train a model to understand what's the outcome of that. So basically, if you have a lot of disturbance in an area, some species are going to be affected more than others because they, they have different sensitivities. And that then uh, leads to some species disappearing in others, uh, potentially even increasing. And that goes around so that it informs which uh, places uh, those uh, protected areas should be placed to, to lead to the best outcomes, depending on what we're trying to optimize. I'll show a detail of this in my next slide. And what you can see here is um, just a zoom of the, of the first diagram I showed you. Uh, and that's a simulation system uh, that we've been developing. And uh, we've also been applying this to empirical systems, especially Madagascar. And uh, of course, with simulation, we know exactly what the truth should look like. Uh, so it's a bit easier to really measure uh, how, how this methodology is working. So we have a, a grid and uh, that, that consists of many different cells and within each cell there is a number of individuals and species and that evolves over time. So species expand their range and those that are affected by human disturbances will probably decrease in abundance and perhaps disappear. But then we can put a, a protection, a protection unit around some grid, some cells and that will protect the species within it, often with an edge effect. So an area where it's a bit too close to the borders uh, and species are still being affected, but a bit, a bit less than that. And what you can do here is that you can let this system evolve over time. And that's what um, this, this figure here shows, where basically um, over time, the areas that are protected will preserve uh, a higher density of species within each one of those blocks. And you see here in red, that's the areas that have been affected by humans. Uh, it could be roads or it could be cities. It could be something that, that it has a, a negative impact on different species. But basically, uh, this leads to a, a set of different areas, all under a limited budget, because of course we cannot protect everything. We need to choose carefully which areas to protect. And this system really leads to a major improvement compared to the random protection of areas or uh, if, you, if you use one of the most used uh, software in the field of systematic conservation planning called MarkSan as well. And this is for uh, disturbance, so anthropogenic dis disturbance. When it comes to climate change, what happens is that it doesn't help. If you uh, fence off a, a forest, for instance, of course, uh, climate change is still going to happen. Of course, there's a gradient of temperature, but also some extreme events, and uh, that cannot be stopped by protection of areas. You need to think about that when designing uh, reserves or protected areas so that um, species can really have somewhere to migrate in, in case that's needed. 
uh, but it does help uh, protect uh, species richness or the number of species within each one of those protected areas and the system is really powerful in identifying uh, which of those cells, what's the traits that leads to the maximum protection of species within those. And that's also not only looking at how many species there are with, within each one of those, but also the complementarity, so we don't protect the same species all over again. So you try to maximize uh, both the numbers of total species protected, but also um, they are, uh, their combined effect on species richness across the whole system. So basically, um, through a series of um, lots of simulations, we've really come up with um, this result where the protection using artificial intelligence here, reinforcement learning and neural networks, leads to a substantial improvement in the outcome of uh, area protection. So basically, if you uh, protect, if you select areas across a landscape, let's say Madagascar or an island or a big forest, if you just select randomly where to protect, you get the, the square here in the middle, the, the gray one, the darker color, uh, where there'll be a number of species. So there's uh, an axis here for species richness, one for phylogenetic diversity, for value or economic value, and the total area protected. But if you use this kind of methodology, you will uh, substantially increase the, both the species richness, the phylogenetic diversity, value and also uh, the, the area protected. So that's um, A and B here, which is, uh, which are both uh, uh, ways of gathering data on a continuous basis. So basically, if we go to a place and we, we make an inventory of all species in every cell, uh, so that's number one, or if you go to this place and only record, uh, record presence and absence, but they don't count individuals, so they don't count abundance, and that's something you can quite easily do with citizen science. A bit more error in the identification of species, but still you get a substantial improvement compared compared to the random selection of areas. But then uh, in C here, you see that if you only do a, a, an initial monitoring, if you only estimate diversity and abundance of an area, but you don't go back, uh, that's actually going to, to lead to a substantial uh, decrease in the number of species protected. There will be decrease among across each value basically, which really means that you, you need to do uh, recurrent uh, monitoring of data over time. And the reason for this is of course because uh, it, that nature is very dynamic. We have climate change, we have um, uh, human disturbance in many systems which are of course affecting uh, the status of many species and we need to understand how those changes are affecting uh, species individually but also ecosystems at large. So through a series of many sim simulations and empirical data, we've been uh, exploring the use of artificial intelligence to help us guide uh, the identification of areas for protection. And th that has some really interesting and promising results, I think. And of course, you look at this and then you think, okay, but what kind of uh, system or situation would you have as much data as needed for this kind of models? And of course, we know uh, there are not that many systems or places where there is very recurrent data or very enough quality data to, to be able to, to identify those areas for protection. But at the same time, we know also that there are some new techniques where you can use uh, environmental DNA, for instance, to identify presence and absence of species. Uh, we all, we're all familiar with uh, apps such as iNaturalist and others, which allow you to record uh, species uh, based on uh, image recognition of previously identified species and also now increasingly remote sensing techniques uh, such as LiDAR that we're using a lot at Q, where you can both measure things like carbon storage of forests and calculate value in that way, but also identify individual species such as particular trees that are threatened or uh, particularly valuable. And you can do that on a regular basis and that's going to produce a much better outcome than doing an initial single monitoring of uh, biodiversity and other values across an ecosystem. So I think moving ahead, we need to have ways of gathering data on a regular basis, and that's going to be fundamental to uh, our ability to conserve species into the future. So my second example of um, using AI in conservation and biodiversity research is about speeding up red list assessments. And um, 
those are really important for um, any kind of investment for which species are going to receive funds for conservation. Uh, we know that the International Union for Conservation of Nature, so IUCN Redlist Assessments, that's the golden standard used by um, every single country almost. And uh, it's really, they're really, really powerful at the same time as they're quite expensive and resource demanding. So at Kew, we're doing about a third of all the plant redlist assessments that takes about a day for a skilled assess assessor to do. And ideally, we not only want to increase the number of plants um, and even fungi that are assessed, but also do recurrent assessments to see how those assessments are changing over time. And you see here some different groups uh, and how uh, those assessments are actually showing that many species are more threatened uh, over time um, than, than they were in, in the past. And there have been some different approaches to do that. Alex Siska and Ima Niklugada Q, they're both working on ways of uh, doing that together with some collaborators. Uh, one thing here is that you can either uh, predict the, the exact uh, red list category of each species, or you can predict them into being either threatened or non-threatened, where you have a bit higher uh, accuracy for that. And that's something you can measure uh, against your training data set. So I think it's a really powerful way of doing that. Um, we've been looking at uh, automated red list assessment together with many colleagues uh, over the last year from Madagascar, uh, for both plants and animals. And um, the graph here in the middle shows some of the assessments that have been made already for species by, by the ICN and some of the uh, estimations we're doing with machine learning approaches, uh, such as the, the black lines here in this graph. And in some cases, there's a good uh, match, but in other cases, there is either over or under representation or under assessment of the threat risk for different species. And many of those models are actually quite simplistic. I think moving ahead, we also look into ways of increasing the accuracy and you know, making those more biologically realistic so that we can incorporate not only um, biological variables, biodiversity, the environment and human impact, but also some uh, socioeconomic factors which can help us understand which species are most likely to be uh, very threatened or not threatened at all so that we can concentrate our resources to look more carefully at a subset of those species that haven't been assessed so far. My third example here uh, about using AI in, in conservation biodiversity is actually a project we've been doing with Caroline Stromberg in the US and, and Toby Anderman, who uh, have been very interested in, uh, in reconstructing vegetation changes over time. And we were actually interested in this because uh, we were keen to see how Madagascar may have changed over time because there's, a, there's been a lot of discussion about how much rainforest and how much open habitats there have been uh, across the country. Uh, some people speculating that it was mostly rainforest, but actually uh, there seems to be some indication that it's not the case, that there were uh, quite a lot of natural grasslands across the country, uh, but quite much, exactly how much is not well known. Uh, but for this case here, we uh, developed a method and applied that to North America which is a region uh, that has a lot of fossil records and, and past vegetation is quite known. So we had something to compare with. And what Toby in particular have been, has been doing here is really to look at associations of taxa over time. So both plants and animals uh, co-occurring and what they can tell in terms of um, the kind of vegetation they will leave. So beavers, for instance, are very associated with um, you know, forests and, and, and trees that they fell. And, um, and using those associations to predict gaps in, uh, in the fossil record over time and space. So basically training a basic neural network, which not only gives you a yes and no answer, but also an estimation of the certainty around uh, those estimates. And over time, we can actually get some really high, uh, uh, high precision maps of how uh, vegetation has changed over time. And that's something that is really uh, interesting because it could be applied to other systems in other countries and continents as well. Uh, so for instance, uh, we can also measure the accuracy comparing uh, the current day and, and, uh, and the outcomes of outputs of our model. And we can also understand or at least infer how change in vegetation between forests and open habitats have taken place uh, over time. And that's, that's, that's something that really can help us understand a bit also the future impacts of climate change on vegetation, uh, which of course is going to be challenging because it's different timescales. So 
in summary, I just would like to make the point that uh, big challenges such as uh, biodiversity loss uh, caused by climate change and habitat changes uh, is a huge challenge and that requires a lot of data as well for us to, to be confident. Uh, the recurrent gathering of data, perhaps even at near real time, is going to be very critical. We can't just rely on historical collections, we need to integrate them with time series also going to the future. Uh, and AI is providing some really interesting, powerful and underexplored tools to help us in that pursuit. And that's it. I'm very excited to uh, have a discussion in, uh, a bit later in the Q&A. And thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much, Alex, for that fascinating talk. Uh, I'll repeat that. Thank you so much, Alex, for um, that, that really fascinating talk. Um, so now moving on, our uh, third speaker in this research session is um, Chris Thorogood, Deputy Director and Head of Science at Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And Chris will be telling us about um, Oxford's collection-based research um, and I'll hand over to you, Chris. My name is Chris Thorogood, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Science here at the University of Oxford Botanic Garden. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the collections-based research that we do here. Specifically, I'm going to talk about some of these botanical oddities the carnivorous plants, parasitic plants, aeroids. I'm going to talk about an interdisciplinary program that we've established here at Oxford Botanic Garden and Biomimetics. And I'm going to finish my talk with what I call astonishing plants, those that have the power to engage audiences at a time when that's really crucial. Well, let's start with a bang. This slide shows some of the carnivorous Nepenthes pitcher plants that grow on Borneo's Mount Kinabalu, a place once described by the botanist Corner as having the richest and most remarkable assemblages of plants in the world. At Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum, we are interested in the evolution of these extraordinary plants. How did these elaborate and beautiful traps come to be? If we first consider the left of this slide, at the top you can see the stalked digestive gland of a drosera leaf, and next to it a photograph of the leaf with an insect ensnared on, on those sticky tentacles. And then below that, you can just see um, the glands on the inside of uh, Nepenthes pitcher. Now, for a moment, if we consider that plant in the middle, that's a mutant leaf of a non-carnivorous plant called a codium. And you can see the extension of a tendril-like um, structure, and at the bottom, a cup-like structure. And this is broadly similar to the, the cup-like pitcher of a Nepenthes pitcher. It's something we call an epiacidiate leaf. What we consider has happened over the course of evolution is that a glandular leaf, rather like that of a sundew on the left, has undergone fusion of the leaf margins, leading to the production of a tubular so-called epicidiate leaf, um, like we can see happening in that mutant in the middle. It probably took place via a similar spontaneous mutation that, that we see from time to time in plants. And what were the selection pressures driving this evolution? Now let's consider the diagram on the right. And this is based on a theory first put forward by Givnish, and it states that there is a, an interplay between the investment of soil-borne nutrients that we see in most plants, um, consider that blue line there on the right in which nutrients are taken up from the roots, and then prey-borne nutrients from the red broken line, you can see um, insects caught in, in the trap. And this can be invested either in photosynthesis by the, the photosynthetically efficient part, the lamina at the top, um, or the trapping efficiency of prey by the, the photosynthetically inefficient pitcher trap. You can see on the photograph there that the pitcher is a sort of yellowish colour, um, it's a tube, it's not very good at photosynthesis in order to, to be good at attracting insects. Um, and in summary, it pays to invest in these photosynthetically inefficient traps in environments where there's plenty of light anyway, and the nutrients in the soil are scarce, but you can supplement those by eating insects. And this is what has given these plants a competitive edge um, over the other plants that they face in such places. 
but not all of them feed on insect prey. Several have diverged, at least partially, from the carnivorous syndrome, and they've evolved mutualistic relationships with animal partners. Our colleague Ulrika Bauer, who you can see in the photo on the right, she took that photograph of a tree shrew sitting on an Nepenthes pitcher. And the species that you can see in the diagram on the left, they all produce sturdy pitchers that derive nutrients not from insects, but from mammalian faeces, these little animals that scamper onto the pitchers and defecate into them, giving them an instant dollop of nutrition in the form of manure. So it's clear that not all Nepenthes pitchers are the simple pitfall traps that all work in the same way as we once thought, sitting, waiting for various insects to just slide in. And working with Professor Alan Gorelli here in Oxford and, and our colleagues, we've been exploring the potential for prey to behave differently on different peristome shapes. Our student Tom Strube created this graph, and here you can see plotted three different peristome types at different levels of wetness. And I should say at this point that wetness is key for the peristome becoming slippery and leading the insects to slide in. Now the lines show the evolution of the relative area in which prey can remain stable on the peristome. If you start at the top right, the peristome is fully dry, and here in 97% of the peristome area, insects can scuttle around without sliding off. But as surface wetness increases, the stability decreases, i.e. the chances of an insect falling in um, off the peristome gets higher. Now this might be expected, but it isn't the same across peristome types. As you can see, following the lines from right to left, a quick decrease in the area that remains stable is observed for the green and the blue examples, but less so for the orange. And we're interested to know whether different peristome shapes and sizes and geometries leading to different prey behaviours might correlate with different prey spectra. In other words, is this astonishing assortment of pitcher geometries that we see in the genus Nepenthes linked to different modes of nutrition that we're yet to understand. Now I'd like to move on to a different plant group, parasitic plants. They include the world's largest flowers, economically important pests, and ecosystem engineers. All of them possess a special organ called a horstorium, which is like a plug that attaches it into its so-called host plant, penetrates their tissues, and draws from them water and food, so it forms this sort of living physiological bridge between the two plants. Many of them have abandoned photosynthesis altogether. These are called hollow parasites, and they're completely dependent on other plants for their existence. The most extreme of these are called the endoparasites, and they spend their entire life cycle actually within the tissues of other plants, and they only emerge briefly to flower and set seed. And of the 4,700 or so parasitic plants described, there are four convergent endoparasitic lineages with about 80 species um, and eight genera. And you can see those four independent origins mapped onto the flowering plant family tree on the left. They exist for most of their lives as a hidden endophyte, which is a series of filaments or masses of cells from which sinkers, which we can think of as being analogous to roots, tap into the conducting tissues of their host plants, roots and stems. And these plants include the largest flower on earth, Rafflesia, that you can see in the picture on the left, um, a curious cream coloured thing called Mitrostemon in, in the centre, Cetinus, that uh, red and yellow one on the right, and Pylostyles, the, the one at the top. Working with Charles Davis from Harvard, who I'm delighted to say is giving a talk in this symposium, and other scientists, we recently examined the life history, anatomy and molecular genetics across these four independent lineages. And what we saw was a high level of convergence across these clades, but also a striking trans-kingdom convergence in life history among these endoparasitic plants, but also with disparate lineages of fungi. And this is both at the molecular and the physiological level. I'll explain what I mean. Here you can see a simplified life cycle of an endoparasitic plant at the top, and beneath it, that of a biotrophic fungus. And we've highlighted the key phases of the life history and, and how they're convergent. So starting from left to right, we see germination in response to host-derived chemical cues, followed by the production of an organ for host plant penetration and nutrient abstraction, then growth within the host tissues, and finally the production of fruiting bodies which lead to the dispersal of numerous tiny seeds. And this intimate association between either plants growing inside other plants, or fungi inside plants, or indeed other fungi, 
has led to an elevation of information exchange between host and parasite. So horizontal gene transfers, the rare exchanges of genetic materials between non-mating organisms, this has been shown to be astonishingly rampant in the parasitic plants, um, particularly the mitochondrial genome, um, as shown by Charles Davis's group. And as shown in some other weedy parasites, these connections also facilitate the bidirectional movement of things like viruses, proteins and, and RNAs. Now, these plants are very difficult to grow, which does make researching them difficult. And our knowledge of them to date has been very much skewed towards the impressive, better known examples such as Rafflesia. I'll now talk about a different group of parasitic plants. This collection of illustrations shows all of the British species of Orobanchi. These are root parasites. Um, like the examples we've seen, they lack chlorophyll. And this is a group of plants that we have a collections focus on here at Oxford to support their conservation and research. Our earlier work demonstrated that host specificity, i.e. which plants these parasites feed from, can trigger the evolution of new species in Orobanchi. So we examined the population genetic structure of a, a plant called Orobanchi minor, and we found evidence of host specific genetically defined clades. You can see that in the tree in the middle. Then we grew the plants in the laboratory on various hosts and we examined what happens beneath the soil surface. And we found distinct incompatibility interactions at, at different developmental checkpoints. So the parasite could reach a certain point of development and then become kicked out by its host. And the overall number of compatible versus incompatible interactions at the cellular level helps determine the host specificity of the parasite and at the population level, this can lead to genetic divergence on different hosts. They, they become separated and ultimately evolve to become new species. And understanding these processes can inform how we record the plants, make sense of their distributions, and in some cases inform their conservation. We recently described a new variety of Orobanchi minor that's specific to brachyglottis shrubs, which are often planted in retail car parks, such as IKEA. So natural populations of Orobanchi have shifted onto hosts in man-made environments and are in the early process of evolving new species or incipient speciation. We can also grow these plants. This is something we've been experimenting with here at Oxford Botanic Garden. Mark Brent and Russell Beaton here at the garden, our horticulturists, have successfully managed to grow some of these plants, like the one in the middle there, Orobanchi picridis, growing on a potted host plant. And so together with Fred Rumsey, our collaborator from the Natural History Museum, you can see on the right, we're exploring how we can grow more of these plants that are often neglected from cultivation in gardens and from conservation efforts due to their perceived intractability to propagation. These spectacular parasites are relatives of Orobanchi. I joined Ori Fragment Sapir, the Director of Science at Jerusalem Botanic Gardens, who is also giving a talk at this symposium, I'm pleased to say, to examine these plants growing out in the deserts of Israel and Palestine. These plants are traded widely for herbal medicine or have historical local importance as food. But despite their importance, little or nothing is known about the biology of most species and their taxonomy remains confused and that can hinder identification. Now, a growing body of research into the cultivation of some species has enabled regional supply of traditional herbal medicine at a low level cost and intervention. In the context of a global desertification crisis, which we face, there's also the significant potential to expand cultivation of Sistanki outside of China. We can grow it as an ancillary crop against vegetation planted to halt land degradation. It can grow on those shrubs as a parasite. But to realise this potential and to monitor trade to control unsustainable harvesting of wild populations, we need a robust taxonomy that's informed by morphological and molecular data. And so that's what I'm working on together with Julie Hawkins at Reading and our student Majed and others. We've been examining the taxonomic complexity of this genus with a view to informing how we use Sistanki and in the context of global challenges. Another curiosity, the family Balanophoraceae, a family replete with bizarre looking parasitic plants. The exact evolutionary origins of the Balanophoraceae were unclear until the introduction of molecular DNA sequence data. Now they're seldom encountered or collected or even seen by people in most cases, and they preserve very poorly in herbaria. We really don't know a lot about most of them. 
On the left, you can see an example called Langsdorfia, which is a poorly known genus um, that looks more like deep sea creatures than it does flowering plants. And there are just four species known, and they occur across Central and South America, Madagascar and Papua New Guinea. On the right, you can see that strange potato-like structure. That's a tuber of Balanophora tabirica, and that's one that we're actually growing here at Oxford. It's not flowered yet, but we, we do hope that it will in the future. An important group of parasitic plants I haven't talked about yet is the mycoheterotrophs. About 10% of plant species use carbon from a fungal partner, a mycorrhizal association, at some stage in their life cycle. But the dependency on fungal carbon across the plant kingdom is, is variable and often unclear. On the left, you can see some plants in the genus Oxygyna, a rare and poorly known genus. Um, and then to the right of it, a related genus called Thysmia. And all of these plants are very poorly known to science. Many of them have been seen only once, and certainly none of them exist in cultivation. They really are some of the most mysterious of all flowering plants. You can see just how extraordinary they are. Here are some examples from Malaysia. And recently, together with um, City Munira from the Forest Research Institute in Malaysia and Dome Nikong, a rainforest explorer, we described a new species from Gunung Sarut, which is a, a mountain located in the state of Terengganu in, in Malaysia. Now this plant, and I'm looking at the orange one, the cutout there on the slide, this has been seen twice only and may already be extinct because all attempts to relocate it have failed. And so we've given it a conservation status of critically endangered. But we know nothing about the plant's ecology or biology and described only months ago, it may already be extinct. I'm going to move on to a project that examines the reproductive biology of aeroids in the Mediterranean. These unusual looking plants, which will be familiar to the gardeners among us, are not pollinated by bees. Rather, they dupe flies into pollinating them through mimicry, for example, of rotting flesh or dung, without offering any rewards to their pollinator in the form of nectar. And together with my colleagues, James McCullough, James Wickens and Luciana Cavalho from the Department of Chemistry, we've been examining the chemical signature of some of the smells that these peculiar plants produce. And interestingly, some of them mimic carrion, others mimic animal dung, and one even produces a pleasing fragrance that's attractive to bees, rather like many flowers that we're familiar with, even though its ancestors would have been unpleasant smelling, which is curious. So we're establishing a new platform um, with a technology called TDGCMS and a sample collection methodology using the plants growing here at the Botanic Garden to test the hypothesis that these different aromas are more closely linked to the resources that they're mimicking chemically, um, dung or carrion for example, than has been previously considered. And interestingly, we do see differences in the traces produced by the dung mimics and the carrion mimics. Um, so you can see the ones in red at the top mimic carrion and the three black ones at the bottom mimic dung. And, and they do um, have compounds um, that, that split these two groups apart. And so we're now extending this methodology across the various collection of, of aeroids that we grow here at the garden. A final area of research we do here at the garden linked to our collections is biomimetics, an interdisciplinary field in which principles of engineering and biology are applied to the synthesis of systems that mimic biological processes. Together with my colleagues James Guan and Finn Box, we examined the slippery surfaces of the Nepenthes pitcher that I discussed earlier. Inspired by the plant, we created artificial surfaces to explore the capability of trapping, retaining and directing liquid droplets. And our work revealed a potential mechanism for developing systems in which the transport of droplets is controlled by so-called energy railings, those grooves that you can see on the image on the right of this slide. These railings provide a biomimetic means of transporting and sorting droplets, and they could be used in droplet-based fluidic devices. It could enable the efficient mass transport of liquids along predetermined pathways, inkjet printers, for example. And these observations also offer insights into the evolution of the plants. They show that the pitfall trapping mechanism is enhanced by the water infused grooves on the slippery rim, driving prey into the trap in a way that's much more tightly controlled than we considered previously. Finally, decreasing environmental awareness and disconnection with nature. These are symptoms of a growing problem that's been described as nature deficit disorder. 
And plants in particular are established to be a blind spot in the human psyche that needs that extra layer of focus. Although we owe our very existence to plants, unlike animals, many of us scarcely even notice them. And this has been described metaphorically as something called plant blindness. Two decades since that phenomenon was described, plant blindness is more relevant than it's ever been. Um, for example, in the context of an increasing rate of biodiversity loss and extinction. In fact, two in five of the world's plant species are threatened with extinction globally. And it won't be possible to address this alarming trend unless we can foster a greater environmental care and awareness of the importance of plants. So I'm going to talk briefly about how some of the strange and unusual plants that I've examined in this talk can help us to do that. Here are some examples of plants that we know people find inspiring by sharing them with our online audiences at Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum. And in particular, the botanical oddities, the curiosities that we've examined in this talk, they can be very effective at this. They can break down people's perceptions about plants, how they are and how they behave, and bring new people into the conversation about the importance of plants. In fact, these examples of unusual plants that you can see here on this slide, these reached tens of millions of people around the world, stopping people in their tracks to think about plants. Maybe examples such as these can help foster a greater care and appreciation for plants at a time when that's needed very badly. Because in light of the significant global challenges we face, botanic gardens need to be agile and inquisitive in finding new approaches to communication and engage people with the wonder and the importance of plants. And that's the end of my presentation here at the University of Oxford Botanic Garden. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much, Chris. My, you covered a lot of ground there. Um, so, um, and quite a few questions coming in there. Can I also remind the audience to please put in some questions uh, to our speakers in the Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen, because um, we'll be having a session at the end um, where the speakers will come in and be available to answer questions and take part in the discussion. So please get your questions in the Q&A. We're now going to take a short break and we will meet again in about five, five minutes.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, our next speaker is Maximilian Wiegand, director of the University of Bonn Botanic Garden. This is another garden with which we at Oxford have an MOU, and also Bonn is another in city of Oxford. Max's title um, is uh, really all about um, the opportunities and limitations of research in the living collections of botanical gardens generally. And I'm sure he'll tell us a bit about Bonn in particular. So um, over to you, Max. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to give you a short talk today on opportunities and limitations of research in the living collections of botanical gardens based on experience here at Bonn University Botanical Gardens and on the special occasion of the 400th anniversary of Oxford Botanical Gardens. I will be going over a few of the topics and techniques that we have been using to work with our living collection. and. Um, I will start off with a very rough classification of living collections in botanical gardens. Uh, this is a typical collections which nearly all of us hold, uh, which is a collection which looks like cactaceae, but as a matter of fact, um, they could also be reclassified. Uh, botanical gardens are institutions holding documented living collections in order to fulfill their mission in scientific research and teaching, education, and in species and nature conservation, as Rauer wrote in 2000. And cactaceae tend to belong to a particular class of botanical garden collections, which are the so-called stand around Yaci. There are also plants which we specifically hold for teaching or teach Yaci for purposes of species conservation or conservancy and for display purposes, such as the uh, borders of roses or tulips, which I would call display Yaci. However, a fifth group of plants that we hold in botanical gardens and which may overlap with any of the other four is what is in the focus of my presentation today. And those are the so-called research AC, the plants that we specifically do research on. The one of the modern techniques, of course, are the typical modern technique of working with plants is looking at their phylogeny with molecular techniques. And of course, living collections, if they are large, are a prime source of high quality DNA or RNA, however that be, um, for major phylogenetic studies. Um, the quality of these phylogenetic studies depends on, of course, the quality of the sampling, which depends on collection size. The study is based on and they depend on DNA quality. Of course, the best DNA or RNA you can get is from actively growing living plants. And together with our Chinese colleagues and some colleagues from, uh, from Q, we were able to do a major lamate phylogeny a few years ago, which was largely based on the collections of Bonn University Botanical Gardens. We've got a very large spread across all orders and families of the angiosperms. So we were able to provide over 200 or more than 70% of the samples from Bonn University Botanical Gardens. This is, of course, no news to you. This is a very common use for botanical gardens collections, although the use of collections is, of course, today slightly compromised by the implementation of the Nagoya Protocol. One of the large research collections we are holding at Bonn University Botanical Gardens is the collection of Boraginales, or as uh, some colleagues would like to call them, the family Boraginaceae, here with a handful of typical representatives, typical Boraginaceae, but also Cordiaceae and Eritiaceae. And we've been doing a hell of a lot of different studies on them phylogenetic ones, of course, but also a lot of morphological studies. Now, many of us uh, are able to use an SEM, a scanning electron microscope, for their uh, studies. And the SEM indeed permits an, an, an incredibly detailed look at plant surfaces and to a certain degree also at plant structures. Uh, so we did a major study on fruit evolution in hydrophilaceae, concentrating on the genus Facelia. And uh, you can see the, the ovary primordia on the upper left developing into fully functional ovaries with receptive stigmatic surfaces. And then on the right, you can see the mature fruit as they have opened and released their seeds. So these pictures are all very nice, but what you do not see is the details of placentation that are happening on the inside. And with the advent of microcomputed um, X-ray tomography or micro CT, we can now look into the 
structures we are studying non-destructively without the tedious process of sectioning and can actually study both placentation and ovule seed arrangement in unprecedented detail non-destructively. And this in this particular case has led to major insights into multiple transitions from four to many seeded capsules and vice versa in the genus Facebia elucidating the phylogenetic pathways, trajectories leading from the one to the other and uh, helping to explain the whole phenomenon of seed number variability in angiosperms, or that is at least what we would like to believe. The fruits and ovaries can be studied with microcomputed CT, but another thing that is uh, very beautiful is that you can look at what we call internal floral spaces. Now, if you look at the two flower pictures on the, in the middle right, you can see two flowers of hydrophyllum, and uh, you can see that they don't look e exactly particularly exciting, uh, but we can see that they've got these uh, strange five bulges on their petals. And if you look, look on the insert on the left hand side, you can see that the petals have strange flanges with uh, papillin action on the top, which run from the bottom of the of the corolla to the middle of the petal lobes or the corolla lobes. Now, if you investigate the entire flower under micro CT, instead of um, looking at the brutally open flower under the SEM, you can see that these strange flanges enclose nectar chambers, which are highlighted in blue on the lower right. And these nectar chambers differ dramatically in their volume and in their interconnectivity, one uh, to the other. So they form a lobed nectar container, which can be accessed by pollinators only at the very top, which you can see on the right hand side. Uh, you can measure the volume, you can measure the dimensions, you can measure the interconnectivity. So you can uh, suddenly have a whole set of insights which are of crucial importance to the functional floral morphology of these plants. And this is only possible with techniques such as micro CT, where you study the flowers on the inside without cutting them up. Um, a flower that you all know is Heliotropium corymbosum. You may know it under the name Heliotropium arborescens, a commonly cultivated, uh, highly scented vanilla flower um, from essentially from Peru. And the flowers from the outside, they don't actually look too exciting. You may wonder why anybody would want to study them, but if you put them under the micro CT, you can see that they are incredibly complex in their internal structure. So from a, looking at a plant or a destroyed flower um, from the outside, you certainly get an understanding of what happens on the inside of that flower. What you can beautifully see here is the coral uh, tube with the anthers inserted in the middle of the tube, essentially closing the tube apart from a minute pore in the middle. And underneath that opening, you can see the complex style stigma comp uh, complex, which is characteristic of the family Heliotropiaceae, as we would call them, with a uh, stigmatic ring and a sterile apex and the whole structure based on a long style, a thin style, which of course is not receptive nor secretory. So you can look on the inside of flowers and start to understand the evolution in uh, plant groups such as the Boraginales. But you can also study the complex flowers of plants such as Loisaceae, which are for various reasons, very rarely kept in botanical gardens, but very difficult to study in the wild because they are uh, usually very narrowly endemic and very rare in nature. If you're lucky enough to have them growing, you can study the internal morphology of the flowers, which is extremely intricate uh, with five floral scales made up from Staminodia, which you can see on the right hand side. And if you um, analyze the digital images you get from the micro CT, you can identify the area where the nectar is presented, the so-called nectar container at the base of these um, floral scales. And you can see the guidance structures here highlighted in green, which direct the hummingbird's beak during pollination, during flower visits to the nectar container at the base of the flower. So there's a whole lot of things that you can um, suddenly investigate by using novel technology. Um, many things you want to study in flowers um, are of course dependent on the fact that they are still living. Um, and this is um, very difficult in the field with plant groups such as Loisaceae, which are widespread, but very localized and very rare and highly seasonal. So it would be very convenient to have them all growing in your greenhouse and do your studies um, in situ instead of um, having to go to South America and hoping that it has rain. This is Nessa macrothersa, one of the most um, easily cultivated species. And Loisaceae have got, uh, this group Loisaceae, has a very peculiar phenomenon, and that is thigmonastic stay, uh, pollen presentation or stamen movement, which means that if, you, if a pollinator visits the flower, the fact of the pollinator visit, the physical manipulation, leads to pollen presentation. There are approximately 100 stamens, and they are sequentially presented upon a flower visitor. And um, 
we had a huge uh, research collection of Lower Sacy growing in our greenhouses, approximately 60 species of the relevant subgroup. And you can see two of my former PhD students here um, playing with the flowers, mimicking pollinator visits. And we got such a large data set that we can now show that not only do many of the plants react to pollinator visits, but we can even show a clear um, evolutionary trajectory with an increasing complexity and speed of reaction upon pollinator visits within the phylogenetic progression of Lower Sacy. Uh, this is the graph from the uh, publication. So we can actually show, I think for the first time, not only that plants show behavior, but that this behavior shows an evolutionary trajectory. Um, this is, of course, a very surprising result, and this is only possible if you actually have your plants growing in a scientific collection, because doing these experiments in the field, especially across um, roughly 50 to 60 species, would be not only too time consuming, but it would also impos be impossible to standardize experimental procedure in a way to actually trace evolutionary trajectories. In the coming back to the Borogen alias, uh, another thing that you can do with uh, scanning electron microscopy, apart from looking at micromorphology and morphology, you can often also look at element composition of plant surfaces. And this is a lot more exciting than you probably think. Um, a combination of material contrast with backscattered electrons in the SM and EDX uh, permits not only the identification of uh, roughly differently structured plant surfaces, but it even permits the identification of the primary elements involved. And then with some additional analyses, you can actually identify the chemical compounds involved. In this particular case, we did an extensive study of trichome mineralization in Borogenales, and we could show that uh, even trichome mineral biomineralization in the order Borogenales shows clear phylogenetic trends. So color coding on the right-hand side uh, um, is for the individual dominant elements, uh, silica in red, calcium in green, and phosphorus in blue. And you can see that within the phylogeny of the different families of heliotrope uh, of Borogenales, you find different mineralization patterns with some of them mineralized with silica only, some of them mineralized with uh, calcium and phosphorus only or calcium apatite. Um, all these studies are possible only if you've got the plants actually at your disposal in a living state, because uh, the minerals are quickly translocated if you try to fix them in uh, ordinary um, fixatives, and they are definitely no longer um, present in their original location if you try to use herbarium material for these studies. Maybe the most surprising result um, was uh, the fact that Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, the world's most boring plant, shows some striking patterns of biomineralization. This is a typical trichome of the leaf surface of Arabidopsis. And if you show, uh, if you look at it more closely with EDX, what you find is that um, the entire trichome, apart from its very base, you can see that in the major picture, is mineralized. But if you look at the inserts, you can see that there is calcium nearly all over the trichome, whereas phosphorus, the left picture on the insert, is localized in these little granules on the trichome surface. So uh, calcium phosphate, a plant mineral that we first discovered in Lower Sacy a few years ago, has actually been hiding in plain sight on the world's most investigated plant, which means that calcium phosphate, calcium apatite, appears to be a common plant mineral, quite contrary to accepted wisdom that calcium phosphate plays a role only in animal biomineralization. Of course, uh, Grasses are also heavily mineralized, and uh, the, maybe the, one of the striking things about botanical gardens is that they tend to have very poor collections of grasses. There are a few, few exceptions, but grasses are generally considered as boring and superfluous, and while gardens invest a hell of a lot of time in keeping their rose borders in order, few of them have any noteworthy collection of wild collected grasses across the tremendous spectrum of diversity they show. Uh, our studies of biomineralization of pl uh, grasses cultivated at one university botanical gardens uh, could, for instance, demonstrate these interesting patterns of biomineralization in a quartered area, a grass that you all know, one of the few that most gardens have. Uh, this one here is a hive of quartered area Orocana, a wild species from South America. And they are uh, mineralized with two different structures. On the one hand side are the systoliths, which you see on the upper right on a normal BSE image. And then on the color image, or the false color image, you can see how these uh, systoliths are uh, immersed in the upper leaf surface. But you can also see that these um, quartered areas, they've got these sharp little trichomes. And if you ever wondered why it's so easy to cut your hands on um, the leaves of that plant, then the reason is that they don't only have trichomes, but the very tip of the trichome is essentially a tiny little glass uh, peak so that the 
trichomes themselves are, of course, organic, uh, indicated by the green color here, but the very trichome tip, the one that rips your skin open, is actually made of silica. Um, trichomineralization is, a, is a, a fascinating topic, and this is just the last image on one of my favorite plant groups, the stinging nettles. And stinging nettles uh, are, of course, notoriously stinging. And the stinging hairs have been investigated over the past 200 years, but not with the techniques available at our, um, in our times. So we looked at bimineralization patterns across all plant families that uh, are provided with stinging hairs here. This is another example from uh, Loisaceae, but we also looked at those of Urticaceae. And what we find, found here was extremely striking. Um, the tip of the stinging hair of this particular plant species is mineralized with silica, phosphorus, and calcium. That's the three inner images on the insert on the right-hand side. And we can add them up into a false color image. And then you can see that the bulk of the stinging hair is indeed made up of calcium, actually most of it of calcium phosphate, but there's a tiny thin varnish or cap of silica on the very top of the stinging hair, possibly increasing its brittleness and making sure that it reliably penetrates the skin of any animal trying to eat it. Stinging nettles are one of my favorite plant groups. Um, and one thing that you all know about stinging nettles, especially the greater stinging nettle, is that they tend to have unisexual flowers and typically they are diaceous. Of course, the greater stinging nettle is often, um, often has individual monoecious clones, and then the both male, female, and monoecious individuals coexist, which we call polygamy. And in the literature, um, it has been known that Urchica is either monoecious or polygamous, but we could also show in cultivation that there are quite a few species which are either gynodiaceous or androdiaceous. And if you cultivate a larger number of species of Urtica from across the globe, literally from New Zealand to Japan and from South Africa to Norway, then you find that gender is incredibly complex in stinging nettles. Uh, gender includes, um, gender distributions are incredibly diversified. And uh, I've just given you a list of a few of the typical expressions that are found in the Urtica dioica group across the, across the globe. So you have Basiandrus monisi, where the male flowers are at the bottom of the plant, but you've also got Proxyandrus monisi, where the, plant, the male flowers are always at the basis of the individual inflorescence branches. That's the picture on the middle left, but you also get um, Sandwich monisi, you get variegated monisi where the male and the female flowers are wildly mixed on the inflorescence branches and, uh, and so on and so forth. So a study of the living plant uh, was able to expand our understanding of gender um, distributions in early case dramatically beyond what has been wild, widely accepted in the literature. Of course, phytochemical studies is something that I haven't mentioned before, but we've done that extensively and everybody has been doing that ever since our founding director at Bonn University Botanical Gardens, uh, Niels von Isenbeck, who was a, a pharmacist amongst other things. Uh, Botanical Gardens actually originated from medicinal plant collections. Nowadays with the modern um, analytical tools, of course, we are able to um, find substances that uh, our ancestors could only dream of. And we can also find many, many different substances side by side in an individual plant species. And we can compare them across many different species if we have ideally living plants in our collections. And this chemical aspect brings me to my last topic, and that is GCIMS is a typical example of a modern technology that uh, really pushes the limits of what we used to be able to analyze and what we are able to analyze now. And this is something that we recently introduced at Bonn University at Botanical Gardens for a study on um, biodiversity monitoring but we are now using it also for floral scent analyses. GCIMS is uh, gas chromatography, iron mobility spectrometry. The stacked GC columns are, are tiny, as you can see. I'm comparing them to Euro scent um, on this picture, which uh, is familiar to most of us, to our um, colleagues from the uh, Thermal UK. I'm also giving um, the measurements in imperial measure so that you know the size we are talking about. Um, so the miniaturized GCIMS is portable and battery driven. A sample, sampling times are in the range of minutes and the two dimensional segregation identification of PWOC of plant volatile organic compounds is possible very nearly in real time. So we can actually go into the garden and have the plant where it stands and take its floral scent at any time interval we want to do. And we've got some preliminary data on daffodils. You can see you don't have to enclose the flower on the upper left. You don't have to concentrate the sample. You just take the air, you sample it for a few minutes, and then 
you can analyze it right in this machine. And these are just some of the preliminary results we have on daffodils, PVOC analysis in the genus Narcissus. Uh, we are surprising, we found a relatively strong phylogenetic signal, which you can see in the color coding here on the right-hand side. That's a cluster analysis of the different um, scent profiles we got. And the color coding refers to the taxonomic group the species belong to. So you can see there is quite a good correspondence between taxonomic group and, and um, scent profile. It's still work in progress. We hope to optimize that. Um, with this very simple technique, with a very short sampling period and very short analytical times, we are able to provide a broad overview over scent profiles of plants that we have in our gardens um, with a minimum of technical effort and with the only caveat that we definitely need, of course, measurements of plant and of the respective reference compounds. Yeah, with that, I'm at the end of my talk and I would like to conclude that nature makes sure we don't run out of research questions. Technical progress makes sure we don't run, of, uh, run, run out of novel ways of investigating them. And botanical gardens make sure we don't run out of plants to answer them with. I th thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a fantastic 400th anniversary meeting. Thank you very much, Max. Um, what, what great collections you've got at Bonn. And um, I, like uh, others who've put comments in the chat, loved your taxonomy of the uh, uses of the plants uh, in your collections. Uh, wonderful stuff. So now um, our fifth speaker of this session um, is Charles Davis, Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology and Curator of Vascular Plants at the Harvard University Herbaria. Um, as Chris has said, Charles is one of our collaborators on, on, on research into parasitic plants here at Oxford. And he will be telling us about untangling the cryptic biology of the world's largest flowers. Over to you, Charles. Thank you, Simon, for the introduction. And thanks, of course, to the organizers of the symposium for inviting me. It's a wonderful honor to be here, and I'm very glad to be presenting this talk, even if only virtually. So in the last 20 years, I've had the very good fortune of working with some brilliant minds and some fantastic colleagues. And I wanted to start by acknowledging them here, especially the students, but also several postdocs as well as faculty members who have really contributed to this effort. Uh, simply put, this could not have been accomplished um, without the, the, the joint efforts of, of this team, for which I'm very grateful. Now, Rafflesiaceae are easily the most extraordinary family of flowering plants. And the species shown here is Rafflesia arnoldii, produces the largest flowers in the world, which are upwards of one meter in diameter. The species was described initially by Robert Brown nearly 200 years ago and was coined at the time as the greatest prodigy of the vegetable kingdom. Now, not surprisingly, these species are iconic in the Southeast Asian rainforest where they occur. Um, they're displayed on their money. This is the Malaysian ringgit, but they've also worked their way into popular culture. This is a Rafflesia that's actually depicted as a, a Pokemon character. And in this case, you can see uh, in cross-section, the floral bud of Rafflesia arnoldii, it's about the size of a volleyball. Um, and inside, you see some of the strange internal floral organs, which I'll talk about in the later part of my seminar. Now, the flowers have obviously captivated our attention, but equally striking is the vegetative body. And most of the cells that you see in this histology, in this cross-section, are woody host cells. And all that remains of the vegetative body in Rafflesia is this necklace of yellow cells here. So it's through this endophyte, this re reduced vegetative body, that these plants acquire all of their nutritional needs from their obligate hosts in the grapevine family. Now, you might imagine that studying the development and, and morphology and anatomy of these species is tricky, um, especially distinguishing host from parasite cells. But fortunately, early on, my student, Luke Nikolov, identified that the parasite has much larger nuclei than that of the host, which makes it a great landmark for untangling this cryptic biology. Below here, you see the reproductive sequence. The floral bud emerges uh, from deep within this 
um, woody host matrix. It erupts through the host bark and to eventually to produce this large flower. And the whole sequence here on the bottom takes place in about nine and a half months to a year and a half with uh, most of the increase in floral size occurring over the last several weeks in development. And so parasitism in general has evolved about 12 times across flowering plants. And this, not surprisingly, makes them an incredible system for studying convergence across the tree of life. So para plant parasites are those that derive some or all of their nutritional needs through a modified vegetative organ called an ostorium. And the ostorium taps directly into the host vasculature. And um, basically, you know, as a result of this, you have uh, convergent loss of, of vegetative organs, as well as in many cases, the entire loss of photosynthetic ability. And it's these shared alterations in life history um, that have led to these striking patterns of convergence. And one of those examples is shown here in the bottom. These are two distantly related species. Both of them have very similar spaghetti-like vegetative bodies with these kind of cream color coloration to them. Um, but, you know, extraordinary case of, of convergence and a wonderful study system for these kinds of questions. Now, flowering plant parasites represent a spectrum of parasitism, and they constitute two main groups. You have the hemiparasites, which are at least partially photosynthetic, and the holoparasites, which include Rafflesia, and are unable to photosynthesize. So they rely entirely on their host species to uh, complete their, their life cycle. And so Rafflesiaceae, as we recognize them today, um, include these three genera, the bulk of diversity by far and away is in the genus Rafflesia. Um, there's much still to be learned about these groups. In, in the Philippines alone, there were 11 new species of Rafflesia described in just the last 12 years. The, the family is widespread across Southeast Asia. It occurs from northern India south through Java and eastward to the Philippines. And as I mentioned before, their obligate hosts are members of the great bite family, specifically members of the genus uh, Tetrastigma. Now, it turns out that holoparasites like Rafflesiaceae have remained the last big phylogenetic mystery in flowering plant evolution. And they've really only been, uh, been resolved within the last decade or so. Uh, and one of the biggest challenges is, of course, this pattern of convergence that I alluded to before. Many of these groups were previously lumped into the same family or, or order suggesting a single common evolutionary origin, especially of these extremely reduced parasites. Um, but also um, these, these um, lineages exhibit really extreme um, elaborate morphologies, which has made them hard to compare with close putative free living relatives. In addition, they have really strange genetics, so they show elevated rates of nucleotide substitution, especially among those loci that we use to, to resolve plant phylogeny. And in particular, the plastid genome is greatly reduced, sometimes entirely gone in these species. So it's simply not a genetic toolkit we can use to compare with putative free living relatives. And this is, of course, a problem because the plastid genome especially has been the bread and butter of plant phylogenetics for the last 30 to 40 years. So I set about building the task of, of constructing or inferring a phylogeny of Rafflesia and its closest relatives, and we discovered that Rafflesia was placed within this large, mostly tropical clade, Malpighiales. This is a clade that has been the center of my attention for the last 25 years, and it includes an astonishing uh, array of diversity, including mangroves and passion flowers and willows and spurges and violets and pansies, as well as some unusual swift-flowing um, tropical aquatic groups. Um, but um, among these are, are Rafflesia, and I want to point out here the very distantly related relationships of its host species, Tetrastigma shown in yellow. But at the time, um, you know, we were only able to resolve this as a member of Malpighiales, but the internal resolution was uncertain. So we followed this up with a whole other set of genes, a whole other set of taxa, and surprisingly, we resolved Rafflesiaceae as a member of the Euphorbiaceae, broadly construed. Now, the sister lineage is now segregated, but at the time, it was placed smack dab in the middle of Euphorbiaceae. Now, no matter where you place this family, you've got a lot of explaining to do. Um, but what was what was extraordinary is that they nest within a lineage of, of plants that produce tiny flowers um, that are only about a, a one to three millimeters in diameter. And that further adds to the mystery of, of gigantism in these species. We now know that these holoparasites in particular belong to four distantly related families. They're shown here, and Rafflesiaceae is just one major subclade. But resolving the phylogenetic affinities of these holoparasites was essential to our next main goal, which was building a genome of these plants. Now, importantly, no endoparasitic plant genome has been published to date. So we set about this task. Um, believe it or not, this, this effort took 14 years, but it's really within um, the last three years that we were able to accomplish our goal, largely through new technologies as well as some informatic support. And our focal taxon is Saprea Himalayana. The plant genome assembly pipeline is, is fairly 
um, typical in this case. But what I want to draw your attention to is that the, the assembly size is about 1.3 gigabases, um, which contrasts sharply with the actual estimated genome size, which is on the order of three gigabases. So there's this disparity between the assembled genome size and the actual genome size. But in this case, we're quite confident that we fully assembled the genic regions of, of the genome, and, and that's for three reasons. Um, the first is that we have very um, high remapping rates of the Illumina short read data, similarly with the long read nanopore data, and also with the transcriptome data. So we're fairly confident that we, say, we can say something about uh, gene evolution um, uh, with, this, with this genetic resource. So what actually accounted for this discrepancy in the actual size of the genome versus our assembled uh, genome size? Well, in this case, we identified that um, about 90% of the Saprea genome consists of highly repetitive elements, especially uh, transposons. So we're pretty certain that the remainder of our genome consists of these collapsed repeat regions. In, in contrast, the closest free living relatives of Saprea populus and Maniot, uh, only about 40 to 50 percent of their genomes consist of these repeat regions, and a very small re uh, percentage of those are um, transposons. Um, but regardless, uh, this, these repeats seriously complicated our assembly and presents a paradox between uh, a large genome versus small genetic content, which we want to explore more deeply in the future. So now with this assembly in hand uh, and the annotation, our first goal is really characterize um, broad scale patterns of gene loss in these plants. And so to put this in a broader context, we contrasted Saprea with their closest free living, living relatives, but we also supplemented our analysis with two additional parasites, Striga, which is a hemiparasite, and Cascuta, which is a hemiholoparasite, and similarly contrasted those with their free living relatives. And um, what you can see is that the, the uh, pattern of gene loss scales directly with the degree of parasitism. So you see some appreciable uh, level of, of gene loss shown in yellow here in Striga, Striga which increases with Cascuta, but the levels of gene loss in Saprea are simply staggering. So we estimate that upwards of 60% of the plant buscos, the conserved plant buscos, are lost in Saprea, and that the placid genome in these species is lost entirely. So we see astonishing sort of levels of gene loss in um, these holoparasitic species, and that scales with the degree and extremity of, of parasitism in these plants. Now, and, and we do see striking patterns of functional bias in the kinds of genes loss. For example, in this, in this keg pathway diagram for chlorophyll sy synthesis, we can see that nearly all of the genes for chlorophyll A and B synthesis, which are critical photosynthetic pigments, are lost entirely in saprea. In contrast, the genes related to uh, the synthesis of vitamin B12 are perfectly retained. So striking patterns of functional bias. Now, to look at this question more broadly, um, we did a comparative assessment um, benchmarking against free living Arabidopsis, uh, uh, continuing to include Striga and Cascuta. And what we find is strong and significant losses in particular functional uh, categories, um, vegetative development, uh, nutrient metabolism, defense and stress response genes, as well as photosynthesis plastid organization. Now, you know, losses in these genes are not new to the investigation of plant parasites, but as you can see here, the degree of loss that we see in these endoparasites in Saprea are just astonishing. Similarly, we see a fifth category that's not previously represented in other plant genomes, which re may represent yet another kind of end of the spectrum in terms of gene loss. And this gene category includes um, abscisic acid uh, production as well as purine uh, catabolism. So really striking patterns in the functional loss uh, of uh, and, and convergence in these losses across these various parasitic lineages. Now, in addition to losing genes over time, parasites are also known to gain genes. And our work in this group has, has shown um, that horizontal gene transfer is quite common uh, among these plants and in parasites in general. And in this first investigation, I showed you previously that genes were clading with Malpighiales, but we found one other in mitochondrial intron region that place uh, that was placed not with Malpighiales, but instead within Vitaceae. So this is a case of host to parasite gene transfer. It's perhaps not surprising, um, given the intimacy of these associations and the fact that we know that that macromolecules, including DNA and RNA, can be trafficked um, back and forth between host and and parasite. But uh, the degree to which horizontal gene transfer occurs is still uncertain uh, among these holoparasites, and so we wanted to investigate that in a phylogenomic framework. And phylogeny has been really the gold standard for detecting horizontal gene transfer. Uh, when a gene is vertically transferred from parent to offspring, we would expect the parasite, in this case, to cluster with their close free-living relatives. However, when a gene is horizontally transferred from, from the host, we'd expect the parasite 
uh, to clade with their um, their closest host relatives. And the beauty of this system in particular is that the degree of divergence between um, the host and parasite goes back about 115 million years uh, in time, which, which makes this a wonderful and tractable system for studying this, this question at scale. And what was especially tantalizing um, in this study was our attempt to actually date the, the host and parasite lineages. And in particular, what we found is that both the stem and crown group of, of the parasites is older than the stem group uh, and crown group of the modern host tetrastigma. And what this suggests, of course, is that Rafflesiaceae were previously hosts on some other species. And you know what we figured or rationalized is that we could basically leverage uh, past horizontal gene transfers as a means to uncover former uh, host association and a history of host shifts. So you can imagine a, a host history here and that genes are kind of left along the way and we can use these as effectively genetic fossils to untangle this history. And so to explore this, we greatly expanded our, our taxon sampling. We, we sampled a, a genome of one of the hosts but also expanded across both Rafflesiaceae as well as um, Vitaceae to um, characterize horizontal gene transfer. And what we found is the following. First, we found a cluster of genes, younger genes, uh, that are um, as you expect. They, they're, they're a result of host to parasite gene transfer. They clade with their closest host relatives. But then we found a second category of genes, an older category of genes, that, placed, uh, that were placed not with tetrastigma, but rather within the genus Ampelopsis, and, and Ampelopsis is a genus that's widespread across Southeast Asia. And what we hypothesize is that Ampelopsis previously served as a host for these species before shifting onto their current hosts um, in the genus Tetrastigma. Uh, now, we, we anticipate that some of these horizontally transferred genes are functional. Um, Thigh C is essential for pyrimidine and vitamin B1 biosynthesis. And we identified that it's repeatedly transferred to, to the host. Um, the native genes, it seems, was lost and, and uh, regained at least twice. And it may be, in general, that HETs in these systems are a way in which these parasites, which face huge mutational burdens, may supplement genes lost during the evolution of the holoparasitic uh, habit and may help to balance that, uh, that equation. Now, for the last part of my talk, I want to return to um, one last aspect of their cryptic biology. And, and as you recall, I mentioned that these um, gigantic flowers evolved from tiny flowered ancestors. And so the question here is, why did they get so big? <laughs> now, we don't exactly know the answer to that, but, but it almost certainly um, uh, resides in the nature of their pollination biology. So the plants, the flowers look and smell like rotting flesh. This is the principal attraction to the female carrion flies that, that visit these flowers. Um, it's a deceitful system, it's a one-way interaction. And um, almost certainly, um, this interaction has resulted in the production of an increasingly larger flower, pot potentially as a co-evolved response between learned behavior in the flies and the production of increasingly larger um, flower. Um, but the level here of deception is astonishing in terms of the look, um, the feel, and, and the smell. And so the floral morphology of Rafflesiaceae is completely bizarre, and it's very difficult to reconcile with traditional morphology. And here you can see the breadth of kind of floral diversity within the group. They're largely similar. Most species produce these chamber-like blossoms. In fact, um, Sapria and Rafflesiae are nearly identical with the exception that Sapria produces 10 lobes versus uh, five in Rafflesia. Rhizanthes is sort of a, a weirdo. It's a chamber blossom that's actually been opened up. But, but the flowers are in fact so strange that botanists that have worked on this have really hesitated to specify um, organ homologies in, in, these, in, in these floral organs. And so um, instead of, of aligning them with, with traditional organis, organs as we might typically do, they uh, punted and, and assigned them um, you know, other, other terms. So you have in Rafflesia, perianth lobes, you have in uh, the, the diaphragm, which is the, the kind of the, the, the ceiling that uh, makes up the, the, the chamber blossom, the upper part of the chamber blossom, the perianth tube, which makes, makes up the wall of the chamber blossom, this unusual central disc structure in the middle with these radiating fin-like projections, and then underneath that, you have the reproductive parts of the flower. So these are, these are the anthers in this case. And so in order to kind of untangle the homologies of these structures, we actually used a two-parted approach. First, we used comp sort of comparative uh, developmental approaches using SEM and histology, as well as these beautiful um, um, CT X-ray tomography. And we complemented that with molecular genetics. In this case, um, using the well-established ABC model of floral development that postulates the gene activity of uh, three different genes alone and in combination, A, B, and C. And as many of you will know, um, B-class genes, for example, are expressed um, generally and associated with 
with um, petals and not sepals, for example. And so I want to start with the, the gene expression profiles. What we identified straight away is a very distinct and different um, gene expression profiles between Rafflesia and Sapria. Um, so here you see B-class identity genes expressed broadly in the perianth wall, as well as in the diaphragm. In contrast, we see B-class identity genes only expressed in the inner whorl of the perianth lobes. Um, and instead, C-class identity gene has expanded to include the perianth wall and the diaphragm. So distinctly different gene expression profiles between um, these two superficially similar chamber-like uh, blossoms. We further investigated this uh, in terms of their floral development. And here too, we found distinctly different um, patterns of development. So you see here Rafflesia. Um, very early on, you get the formation of these five perianth lobes, as well as the formation of the inner diaphragm. And we also noted this unusual sort of ring-like primordium, that space between the anther and the diaphragm. And in contrast, in Sapria, we find the early formation of two whorls, inner and outer, but these have very different shapes. So you have an outer whorl with acute um, tipped um, lobes and an inner whorl with spoon-shaped lobes, very much like you, what you'd find in um, sepals versus petals um, between, between these two uh, morphologies. And the, the diaphragm, uh, in this case, forms very late in development, and it seems to do so for, from the expansion of this ring primordium. So you get late, late stage development of the diaphragm in Sapria versus early stage development in Rafflesia. And so taken together, what gene expression and morphology tells us is that these two chambers develop differently. Um, and, and so in Rafflesia, the diaphragm uh, is made up, uh, constitutes the petals, whereas in Sapria, it's only the secondary world that forms the petals, and the diaphragm is formed through this kind of expansion of this ring-like um, primordium. So despite their superficial similarity, they're constructed quite differently. And that's further supported by morphological landmarks, um, which are distinct in terms of the placement of the rumenti and grooves between uh, Rafflesia as well as Sapria. What's interesting here is that um, where we invoke this developmental repatterning uh, along the lineage leading to Rafflesia is also where you get a burst, a secondary burst in floral gigantism. So it may be that forming the chamber wall and the diaphragm from the petal uh, provides more stability and, and allows for the production of an increasingly larger um, flower uh, through expansion. So I, I, I hope that I've convinced you um, that we resolved the cryptic biology of these plants from, from a number of different perspectives, and I've listed those here. Uh, obviously, I would argue that we've opened more channels for the cryptic biology of these species, but it's been a wonderful way to approach and integrate these data, and I'm very happy to have been here with you all today. So thanks so much for your attention. Great talk, Charles. Thank you very much. That was that was fascinating. Um, yes, another great talk in this this session. It's really been great so far, and I'm sure we'll have. Well, we've got lots of questions that have come in, especially from from the last last talk there. Um, so now to our final uh, speaker for this session. Um, this is Pete Hollingsworth. Deputy Keeper and Director of Science at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh. And Pete will be telling us all about biodiversity science at the Royal Botanic Gardens of Edinburgh. So over to you, Pete. Thank you, Simon. It's a great privilege to speak at this symposium, celebrating Botanic Gardens on the uh, momentous 400 year anniversary of the wonderful Oxford Botanic Garden. And in this presentation, I'm going to whiz through some of the work of the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, briefly introducing our history, but mainly focusing on some vignettes from our current research. So starting briefly with the history, we celebrated our 350th anniversary last year. So compared to Oxford, the botanics in Edinburgh is a mere youngster. And the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh was established as a physic garden in the grounds of Holyrood Palace in 1670 on a patch of land that was just about the size of a tennis court, cultivating 900 types of plant for medicinal use. 
and it uh, rapidly outgrew the available space. And just five years later, in 1675, a second site was acquired, located at what would now be the east end of the main uh, Edinburgh Waverley train station. And that site was about 300 foot by 190 foot in size. Now, almost 100 years after the founding of the original garden at Holyrood in 1763, the garden moved again, this time about one mile northeast to Leith Walk to a five acre site. And so at this time, the garden was beginning to grow considerably. And then about 60 years later, in 1820, we were on the move again. And uh, it was a two year process moving the garden to its current site at Inverleith. And one can only imagine the remarkable ingenuity and patience that was required to undertake this move. And today, Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh is well established at the main Inverleith site, and it's been there for just over 200 years of its 350 year history. And as well as the Edinburgh Garden, in recent years, we've taken on the care of three other gardens in Scotland, each with different environments, which enable the growth of a wider range of different plant species. So going around clockwise from the Edinburgh Garden in the top right, there's Doik in the southeast of Scotland with a rather continental climate, um, across to Logan in the southwest of Scotland with an almost subtropical climate, and up to the northwest to Ben Moor, where there's extremely high rainfall. And collectively, these four gardens with their different environments enable us to grow 13 and a half thousand plant species from 157 countries that makes up the remarkable living plant collection in our care. So that was a very brief description of history. And now I'm going to focus on some current research. And we have three priorities for our research program, discovery science, global environmental change, and conservation and sustainability. So understanding plant and fungal diversity, understanding the drivers of change, the impacts on that biodiversity, and delivering science to support conservation and the sustainable use of biodiversity. Now, taxonomy is a major focus of our discovery science program. And there's a particular focus on characterizing diversity and distributions in species rich pantropical groups such as begonia. And this slide uh, summarizes the global increase in new species descriptions in begonia. And, and it's a classic example of just how much there is still to discover about plant diversity with many species new to science described each year and in begonia with no sign of this asymptoting. Another focus of our discovery science on diversity and distributions of plants is on threat and habitat, such as this collaborative project led by Tina Sarkinen at RBGE, that's aiming to characterize the biodiversity of the extremely threatened dry forests in Peru, in part to identify priority areas for conservation, but also to communicate the importance of these remarkable forests, which are often overlooked, but have extremely high levels of endemism, and in some cases are down to only 10% of their original extent. There's an increasing emphasis in our research in general on understanding dynamics of vegetation change to guide appropriate management interventions. And one example of this is work led by PhD student Cedric Suluufu Undrana Hatcher and supervised by Caroline Lehman and Maria Vorontsova at Kew. And this has provided the first evidence of grazing adaptations in the endemic grassland vegetation of Madagascar and has opened the door for reconsidering the assembly and dynamics of these island ecosystems prior to the arrival of people. And in particular, this works challenging the view of these grasslands being human degraded wastelands in need of afforestation, but rather that they can represent ancient grassland assemblages of high biodiversity value in their own right. This interface between plant distributions, environmental change and land use is also exemplified in studies led by Antje Ahrens and Xu Zhen Xu from the Kunming Institute of Botany, working to understand risk to biodiversity and livelihoods from rubber plantations. So the global demand for car tires has driven land use conversion to rubber plantations. However, there's no oversight as to where these plantations are established. 
and combining satellite imagery and modeling showed that almost 50% of the rubber plantations are planted outside of their environmental optima which is indicated here in red, and are at risk of plantation failure. So this model prediction was also supported by ground truthing, which showed high rates of plantation loss in areas classed as unsuitable by the model. So a key output of this study is to provide information to avoid loss-loss scenarios where high biodiversity value forest is cleared for plantations, which ultimately fail and provide limited livelihood benefits. Now, one downside to the work that has been conducted to date looking at this distribution of, of rubber plantations has been the challenge of resolution when working over large geographical scales. And our earlier studies were based on a 500 meter by 500 meter resolution, which gave a broad overview, but which was too coarse for many small scale plantations. And this very recent work is now being followed up uh, with Junxia Wang using satellite imagery at a 28 meter grid scale, so very high resolution and giving for the first time high resolution maps for continental Southeast Asia, greatly enhancing our ability to monitor rubber plantation spread and forest losses. As well as an international program of collaborative biodiversity science, at the Botanics in Edinburgh, there's also a strong focus of work on biodiversity in the UK. And this includes assessing vulnerability to climate change of our most important ecosystems and their key species and characterizing and mapping this biodiversity, such as lichens in the temperate rainforests in the west of Scotland. And work led by Chris Ellis has had a particular emphasis on linking biodiversity distributions to land management solutions. And the paper here has looked at the threat of climate change to the characteristic lichens that fix nitrogen into these temperate rainforests. And in light of these projections, which shows that over time there's a considerable loss of habitat suitability due to summer drying, the study has examined how to maximize conservation gains from forest restoration. And, and the, the headline message from this paper was showing the value of targeting riparian zones for restoration to maintain suitable microhabitats for nitrogen fixing lichens, which maintain enough moisture even with future projected climate change. And in general, this is a, an, a little vignette from a body of work aiming to explore how to exploit landscape topography such as rivers, slopes and aspects and stand structure to create micro refugia that protect threatened species under climate change. Now in this uh, last part of the talk I'm going to focus in a little bit more detail uh, on a project looking at the genomic scale and the very exciting Darwin Tree of Life project. So this is part of the Earth by Genome project which has the ambitious goal of sequencing the entire genomes of all multicellular species on Earth and the Darwin Tree of Life project is the first project implementing this at scale and has the uh, smaller aim but still massively substantial of genome sequencing all 70,000 or so multicellular species in Britain and Ireland. And the project is led by the Wellcome Sanger Institute with a range of UK partners and uh, Royal Botanic Gardens, Edinburgh and Kew, along with the University of Edinburgh, are coordinating the work on plants. Now, this project offers the potential to provide groundbreaking insights into nature by providing genomic data at an unprecedented scale, essentially creating a new way of studying the natural world. Rather like the Human Genome Project, many of the discoveries will not be anticipated at the outset, but there are some particular questions that the project will be able to address and, and that excite me in particular are, are listed here. And these include advancing our understanding of how species function and the genomic base of species adaptations. Of course, a fully genome sequenced flora will greatly enhance our understanding of the distribution of genetic diversity and how that relates to species traits and attributes. And I'm not going to go through this full list here, but also just want to draw attention to something that I have a particular interest in is that the data will reveal information on the genomic 
the nature of interspecific differences, the genomic nature of the differences between species. And that will help the development of improved high resolution DNA based assays for using DNA to tell all species apart. Now, undertaking this first whole flora genome sequencing on the British and Irish flora as a test case makes perfect sense because it builds on this incredible knowledge bank of plant diversity that exists for Britain and Ireland, which will serve to contextualize the results of the genome sequence data in terms of ecology and taxonomy and organismal biology. Ultimately, this project aims to cover all native land plants in the British and Irish flora and along with some of the most important non-native species. But in the first phase running through to 2022, um, we aim to have the sequences of the entire genomes of roughly 10% of the native vascular plant and bryophyte flora, including all families within those groups. So since starting the project, uh, we've been establishing the standard operating procedures, essentially working out how to deliver. And in the last year or so, um, this has included navigating the challenges of lockdown for undertaking field work. And in light of all of this, it's really encouraging to see how many species are now in the pipeline for sequencing. And every one of these has involved collecting living material, freezing it on dry ice or liquid nitrogen soon after collection to preserve intact high molecular weight DNA, which is critical for successful genome sequencing. And actually in this symposium celebrating botanic gardens, it's important to stress how important the living collections have been to allow easy access to material, especially important at the time of restricted movement due to COVID restrictions. So sampling trees and some of the herbs is straightforward, but the for the bryophytes, there are some uh, major challenges as many of them form clumps containing multiple individuals and multiple species. And there's some painstaking dissection of specimens for sequencing. And of course, there will be downstream challenges of genome sequencing based on tiny amounts of starting tissue. Now, once the plants have been collected, identified and DNA barcoded and had their genome sizes estimated at the Botanic Gardens at Edinburgh and Kew. They're sent to the Sanger Institute on dry shippers at minus 197 degrees and processed for sequencing. And here are just some of the species that are in the genome sequencing queue, including thrift, alpine sow thistle, there's ash, juniper, CP, twin flower, small cow wheat, woolly willow and witch elm. Witch elm. And um, here's just a, a, a picture of the of one batch of samples getting ready on one of those dry shippers ready for postage down at one minus 197 degrees centigrade. And, and of course, the genome sequencing of plants is far from trivial. There's some real uh, scientific challenges here. Now, at its most simplistic sequencing entire genomes is easiest if the genomes are small and are arranged in a small number of chromosomes and that makes things easier but that isn't always the case for plants. Now we're fortunate that we know an enormous amount about the chromosome numbers of British and Irish plant species uh, due in large part to a cytological catalogue, a chromosome catalogue of the British and Irish flora led by Richard Gornall at the University of Leicester and there is knowledge on almost all plant species in the flora on how many chromosomes they have. And this shows us that there's a huge range in chromosome numbers from six to 720 with the median diploid chromosome complement of 2n equals 30. And somewhere between 10 and 20% of the flora show variation in the number of chromosomes within species. So this is really important baseline information to inform our understanding of the genome sequences. Likewise, we're extremely fortunate to have a high density of knowledge on the size of genomes of British and Irish plant species. And this is work led by Elia Leach at Royal Botanic Gardens Q. Now, sequencing plants with genomes smaller than two gigabases is much more manageable than those with larger genomes. 
And an outstanding task for the Darwin Tree of Life project that needs to be addressed is how to sequence the many large genome species in the flora. And this histogram from uh, Ilya Leach and Sahami and at Kew shows the frequency distribution of genome sizes for the British flora. There's a 500 fold variation in size, uh, including the uh, gargantuan genome of mistletoe. So about 40% of the flora is larger than two gigabases. So substantial challenges will be encountered in dealing with these large genome species. And as I mentioned before, our focus today has been very much on establishing how to make this project work as a test case for delivery here, but also for projects elsewhere. So establishing standard operating procedures, establishing a flow of well-identified samples that have been DNA barcoded, that have had their genome sizes estimated, uh, refining protocols for extracting high molecular weight DNA that's essential for reference genome generation. And now we're at that stage of getting the first plant samples through the genome production pipeline. And it's really exciting to see these first genomes being generated. So as of now, the sequence data of some sort on almost 180 species with each sequence, sorry, with each species being sequenced using a combination of different sequencing technologies to facilitate their assembly. And to date, 13 species have had initial draft assemblies produced. A further three have gone through this stage and a more in-depth curation and a further two have made it through to sufficient quality through to public release. And it feels extremely exciting being on this cusp of a major flood of new data, a new way of understanding the flora and really exciting as this flow continues from samples through to sequencing through to assemble genomes. So they were just some very brief glimpses into some of the science we're involved in at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. All of this science is collaborative and many of those collaborations are done with other botanic gardens. And I you know, really enjoy being at this symposium and greatly enjoy this collaborative element of botanic gardens working together to understand plant biodiversity. So I just want to conclude by wishing a wonderful birthday celebrations to the Oxford Botanic Garden and a major thanks for inviting me to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete, for that um, great uh, brief um, overview of all the exciting research that's going on um, at Edinburgh. Um, unfortunately, Pete isn't able to join us now for the live um, Q&A session with our speakers. So can I ask all those speakers that are able to um, come on screen to come on screen? now and I'll try and get through as many of the questions that have come in as I can and also give you the opportunity to ask each other questions because I'm sure you'll 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 have some. Um, to begin with um, there have been um, quite a few questions coming in about parasitic plants um, I think, and, and with Charles's at the end on Rafflesia. So I might just kick off with a few of those, if that's all right. Um, there was one of many um, and, and important for botanic gardens. Are any Rafflesiaceae grown in botanic gardens around the world, um, e.g. Um, in, in Southeast Asia? So perhaps that one's for you, Charles, and then maybe Chris, you'd like to comment. I was I was going to punt to Chris actually, but but the only instances I know about this are in the Bogar Botanic Garden uh, in Indonesia. Um, it's uh, 
smaller flowered rafflesia that they've had growing there within the garden grounds. Yeah, I I'd, I'd um, concur with what with what Charles says. The the only um, the only botanic garden um, example is in Bogor in, in in Indonesia, which is sort of falls within the the natural range of rafflesia. There are some unusual isolated examples of people in. Um, Sarawak, I believe, and um, so uh, Malaysian state of Borneo, who have actually managed independently of a botanic garden, as I understand, to to grow rafflesia in, in a sort of small holding um, actively, sort of almost in, in their back garden, which is quite, quite extraordinary. But it's certainly not <laughs> widespread in botanic garden collections by any means. No, and I should mention that that picture I showed of you, Chris, at Oxford, <laughs> was not with a, a, a rafflesia that we'd grown. It was a, of a rather extraordinary life-side model that you'd... It, it did you'd raise my had. eyebrows, Simon, because I didn't know you were going <laughs> to show that. Yes, well, that that's a, 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 a point to aspiration for... Um, very aspirational. ...botanic gardens to try and grow some of these ultra-challenging plants among our collections. Um, there, there are... A couple of others also on rafflesia and the like before we move on. Um, this is a, a good one. Are different species of rafflesia hosted by different species of tetrastigma? Perhaps Charles. Yeah, so they, they, they're they quite specific um, in, in many instances. So there's there's a relationship where there's one host species and, and one parasite, but, but a handful of them uh, actually can parasitize more than uh, more than a single species of, of tetrastigma. So there's some variation across the group. Um, what I would add though, is that the taxonomy of tetrastigma is not is sort of poorly known and, and understood. And this is an area where museum collections obviously help us. But one of the great challenges of, of these uh, host species is that um, they're, they're in many cases, large woody lianas that, that uh, shoot from uh, the ground and up into the canopy. So often, you know, obtaining the, the flowering and, and fruiting material that's necessary to delineate species, they're not terribly well represented in herbaria. So I think actually, um, you know, the relationship is, is very narrow um, with this one-to-one -one relationship um, and some species that parasitize more than um, one tetrastigma species, um, sometimes of distantly related tetrastigmas um, species, but uh, I, I would guess that there are surprises yet to come as we learn more about uh, the the uh, sort of taxonomy and, and diversity within within uh, the the host uh, genus Tetrastigma. Okay, thank you, Charles. Now um, moving on to to Alex. There's a a, a question about your your um, fascinating talk and um, where where do you think uh, your conservation research findings? are having or will have the most practical impact? Thank you. That's a very good question, of course. And to some extent, uh, it's very rely reliant on data and data gathering, as I was trying to make the point. Um, in many countries that Q uh, is working with, they have not yet established um, priority areas for conservation. So. We are running a program at Kew uh, called the Tropical Important Plant Areas, uh, which has been running for a few years now, um, I believe in about seven countries. And we've um, worked with partners um, across Latin America, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and identified about 144 uh, areas for prioritization for conservation in those countries. So the, the hotspots of plant diversity, so to speak. And this is a work that um, involves a lot of stakeholder, stakeholder engagement and we're hoping now that this methodology will be, will be able to speed that up and uh, improve some of that classification as well. So that we, are, we are absolutely confident that when countries decide which areas to conserve, uh, it's absolutely the best ones. And I, I believe that this is really the, the most important application area for, for this research. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, and there's a question now for you, Barbara, going back to the, the beginning. Um, this um, trigger of, of ovule and seed coat development um, after pollination, do, do, do you know anything of the nature of the cues that um, the signals, the cues that come from the pollination event that then trigger that development? So, 
for the moment, we have no clear idea. In the pollination rock, there is some uh, um, metabolites that are involved, but uh, we think that the pollen grain, uh, when is uh, inside the, uh, the ovule, um, green and uh, stay attached to the gametophyte, female gametophyte, and stay for about four, three, four months before it's able to germinate. And so we are looking for the trigger for this development. We see that uh, um, the genes uh, are, up, some genes are regulated to um, form the uh, integument, seed integument. And so the seed integument is formed before the um, fertilization, of course. So this is quite triggering because uh, usually you can talk about a seed coat when you have the embryos inside, not before. So we are looking for the triggers for the moment. Fascinating system in that uh, effectively living fossil um yeah thank you um and now coming over to you um max um a lot of people have, have put likes in for stinging nettles um amazing this this sort of sexual gender diversity among among um stinging nettles across the world um is 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 there any um ecologic do you, do you know of any yet ecological correlations between the different um, sexual systems that we see in, um, in stinging nettles. Um, for instance, um, androdiesi among some plants seems to be associated with um, particularly poor soil types and stressful environments. Um, have you got any correlations in, 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 in nettles? No, we've actually got none at all. Um, the, the interesting phenomenon is that Urtica stinging nettles, they always grow in exactly the same type of microhabitat. Uh, no matter where you look at, they, lay, uh, they grow in fertile cave mouths in New Zealand, they grow, grow in fertile moist patches in Ethiopia, they grow in the very same places in Europe. So they, they are ecologically, they've got virtually zero variability. Uh, the only phenomenon is that you get in highly seasonal habitats, you get annual ones, and in less seasonal ones, you get perennial ones. And that doesn't even correlate with phylogeny very much. There's a, there's a lot of um, shifts in life history going on within the phylogeny. Um, as a matter of fact, we've got absolutely no explanation for the different um, gender distributions that we find in Urtica. The only exception is that the annual ones tend to be well, they, they tend to be monoecious, very, very carefully um, wording that. They tend to be monoecious, but we've got a very strong indication that um, ontogeny plays a major role in the Gynodionesis and Andromonesis species, that if they are very well um, fed, they've got a lot of water, a lot of nutrients, they tend to become um, monoecious individuals and if they are somehow starved, if they're very crowded, uh, you get unisexual individuals. Um, and we never went in, I mean, we worked with 50 species in cultivation. We never went into large scale studies on individual species. So I think there's a lot of ontogenetic regulation also going on with regards to um, monisi versus unisexuality. But the gender distribution on the individual plants is highly conserved. So it's within the individual species. So where the male and the female flowers are ultimately formed, if both are formed, is highly conserved. But whether both of them are formed shows some degree of variability. Uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot about any adaptive reason behind uh, the different geometrical distributions of male and female flowers. And I'll welcome any suggestions. I can't come up with any. I've got no clue why they do it. They just do it because they can, I guess. Extraordinary. Um, right. Um, now, we haven't got that much longer um, for, for uh, 
you answering questions and we, we've got more questions than we're able to fit in answers for. Um, that, that there have been a few come in to do with horizontal gene transfer that uh, I could, uh, well, we, Charles and, and, and Chris maybe comment on these and others chip in. Um, there's one about how does horizontal gene transfer affect speciation? Um, and there's another one about whether it's possible between um, insects and plants, I suppose aphids and other herbiv intimate herbivores. Um, Charles, do you want to kick off there? Yeah, I'll start with the with you know where you left off. Uh, actually, back in in March, there was quite an exciting paper in Cell that was published that demonstrated uh, uh, that a white fly, an agricultural pest, that acquired uh, a gene from plants. So you know. <laughs> Quite a quite a long evolutionary distance in terms of gene transfer, and in this case, this um, gene allowed uh, the the insect to basically counteract uh, the defenses of the plant. So, um, really, pretty extraordinary. And I can I can post a link to that um, paper uh, in the uh, in the chat window. So, I think you know early on when we started exploring gene transfers. Um, in eukaryotes especially, there was thinking that this wouldn't be common. And uh, increasingly, as we have more and more genomes, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it appears to be quite common. Um, the extent to which it facilitates speciation, at least at macroevolutionary timescales, is, is still a bit of a, a, a mystery. But almost certainly, um, I would guess, I would wager that that's, that that's likely to be the, the case, and, and, and certainly um, this example of this agricultural insect pest is is one, I think, very nice example of that. Thank you. I guess you don't want to add any more to that, Chris. No, I, I, I don't think I could. I, only to say from a broader perspective that clearly um, host parasites are these fascinating living laboratories for, for exploring questions such as these and these sort of elevated levels of communication between hosts and parasites. So... Right. So I think um, perhaps we'll start to, uh, well, why don't, if you have any questions to ask other members of the, of, of the panel, we've got a few minutes left, perhaps time for one or two questions. No. Ah. Oh. No. Uh, actually, yes, I've got a question for Chris, because we've been looking at the emissions from RAC, from Mediterranean RAC as well, and we are having a major headache with the ammonia emissions. So we're messing up all our measurements because, um, well, usually if you use an adsorbent, it's not absorbed, so you, so you won't even see it in your analysis, maybe. But um, with the GCIMS, you get everything that the plant emits, and the ammonia emissions are just swamping every other signal. <laughs> Do you have any take on that? Because it seems to be ecologically highly relevant, ammonia being such an important molecule in, in plant-animal communication. Um, yes, yeah, so so um, the chemists with whom I work could could give you a more informed answer. What I will say is I, I share your pain, Max, because we for <laughs> For nearly four years, I think we've been trying to optimize our, our methodology. And actually, sometimes we've lost a whole year's data because I'm sure you'll have the same problem. You, you've only got a limited window to samples. This is this is the messy side that we don't present on, on our slides. Um, and, and even the, the, the particular plastic that we were using to enclose the inflorescences with the probes on which we were absorbing the compounds to later desorb them in the lab, that that ruined a whole a whole year's worth of data. So, um, so yes, what, what I can say is that the probes we're using specifically are designed to pick up um, the sulfide, so disulfides, trisulfides, oligosulfides, that kind of thing. Um, and and so, I think it's it's fair to say that in an ideal world, we would be looking at lots of different classes um, of of these volatiles that that are produced and 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 we're not for, for logistical reasons. Um, but so that sort of partly answers your question, I think, but but we haven't ha had that problem specifically. We've had many others, <laughs> um, but maybe we could we could have a, another chat off, offline and to get into some of the detail and, and share one another's um, learning, so to speak, from, from this very difficult and delicate process. 
Now let's do it. Thanks. Okay. Well, we, we're we're victims of 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 time, I'm afraid. So um, thank you all for um, joining this this session, and thank you all for your your talks and contributing to this um, this symposium. Um, it's been a great first session. Um, I wish we could all all clap, but let's all participants give a, a virtual clap for our, our speakers this afternoon. Thank you all, and I hope you'll stay around for Suzanne's talk next. Okay, thank you. Now, um, to wrap up uh, this, this session, I'd like to welcome, oh, what's she do? What's going on? Um, I'd like to welcome um, our first keynote speaker, um, Suzanne Renner. Uh, until recently, Suzanne was director of the Munich Botanic Garden, uh, a position she held for many years now focusing principally on research, Suzanne is based at Washington University uh, in St. Louis. Suzanne's research interests are extremely broad, but today she will be telling us about her fascinating research on ant plants. And Suzanne is with us live, so she will be um, running her own talk with help from our, our technical team. So over to you. Suzanne, great to have you here. Thank you, Simon. It is such a pleasure to celebrate this 400th anniversary, the 400th birthday of the Oxford Botanical Garden with all of you. And I just loved the first session. When I took this photo in February 2017, I hadn't realized that these walls actually date back to 1621, they look so well preserved. And so, sorry, I have to, I have to move forward. Ah. Reading up on the history of the Oxford Botanical Garden for this meeting, I became interested in Jacob Boppard, whom Simon mentioned in his introductory talk. And all the sites I found said that Boppard was born in Brunswick in Germany and was a mercenary before he was hired at, Q at Oxford. Now knowing Brunswick well, I was curious and searched some more and I found a nice paper on Bob Hart, it's cited here by Karen Sieber 213, which makes clear that Bob Hart was actually born in Gdansk in the kingdom of Poland. One finds his name easily among Dansk aristocratic families and belonged to a wealthy family of traders. He studied medicinal plants long before coming to Oxford. And this is why he is here depicted in this famous engraving from 1713 with his Esculapian staff. And you have all seen the skate as the background of those uh, staff and speakers from Oxford. The stork above or part is the symbol of Gdansk. And as Simon mentioned, Boppard was permitted to plant vegetables to supplement his celery. And so with this staff, he is keeping this plant eating goat at bay, doing this so successfully that the dog is not needed and is watching sleepily. This little tidbit about Boppard defending his crops from an herbivore brings me to my topic. Symbiosis between ants and plants that match human farming systems. I have to actually get off the oh. phone. Okay, that match human farming systems. Modern work on this topic actually started at Oxford. More precisely, it started with this uh, benchmark paper by Camilla Huxley from the famous Huxley family. She published a seminal paper on observations and experiments that she carried out in Papua New Guinea. 
And when my then new graduate student, Guillaume Chomiki and I were thinking about ant-plant interactions and more precisely the evolution of ant-plant interactions as the topic for his dissertation, Guillaume visited Camilla and was hugely inspired by talking to her. Now in her key experiment, Camilla used radioisotope labeled sulfate and phosphor that ants were permitted to feed on to prove that the plants are able to take up uh, minerals and molecules from the feces that the ants are depositing inside the domation. This means that there must be structures analogous to roots that enable the plant to take up these substances. Now, these genera, these ant plant uh, groups, all belong to a clade of Rubiaceae that comprises about 100 species and is confined to Australasia. So, actually, here you see the distribution of these plants. And we decided to focus on a group of ant plants that is in the genus Chromillaria that is completely restricted to Fiji. So we got funding and Guillaume has been doing field work in, in Fiji every year since 2014, except for the two COVID years. Here you see him hanging in one of these trees, studying these ant plants, all of which are epiphytes. We obtained a well-sampled phylogeny based on herbarium material to make sure that our focal group here circled in red really evolved on Fiji and doesn't consist of you know, occasional or more recent in independent introductions. It really is a clade. It soon became clear that several species can coexist on single trees. Here you see three species of, of this genus, and you see on the right the phylogeny, the relationships, and you also see uh, with their names in green, new species that uh, Guillaume discovered, he discovered several new species. And so interestingly, amazingly actually, the ants will patrol, visit and patrol different domatia, even of different species, all on that tree. The particular species of ants is unusual in having a queen live in one domation, and all the other domatia are controlled by her. Those just these other domatia only contain workers and brood. And as the colony grows, they will occupy more domatia on that tree. Now, the first question, of course, is how do these plants ever get up there? Well, it turned out that the ant species that lives in them has the habit of taking seeds from young fruits and planting them in cracks in the bark of certain species of trees, barks or whole. Only particular species of tree have the suitable bark. Here you see one and of this species, it's called Phyllidus nagazao, carrying a seed about to plant it, to really insert it into a crack in the bark. And in the inset on the, inset on the left, you see a seedling of our focal group on the right and a seedling of a related ant plant on the left. And marked with a blue bar are those parts of the seedling that will become the domation. And you can see that in our focal group, the domation develops above a, a, an elongated part. It's a hypocotyl. It's a particular elongated part below what will become the domation. So this helps these little seedlings to emerge from the crack, to really be pushed outside, because otherwise, you know, if the seed is stuck in the tree bark there, it can never uh, start putting its cotyledons out and starting its life. So if these ants are confronted with, let's say, a grain of rice used as a control here, they won't pick it up. And if they are confronted with seeds of another species that they are not of an ant plant's 
yeah, that they are not interested in, they won't pick it up either. They only take the seeds of their pre preferred species and plant only those. We did the same kind of experiment as Camilla Huxley did. That is to say, we used radioactively labeled nitrogen and phosphor to check you know, which tissues of the plant would be taken up the substances deposited through the, via the feces or pee of the ants. So we you know, let these ants feed on these substances and then check the tissues after 10 days, both of mature plants, such as the one that you see in the center of this photo, and of the seedlings, such as the one that you see in the inset. And what we found that, that is the most interesting result is that the seedlings, the control is, you know, a, a non-ant visited, ant visited ant plant tissue, that the seedlings contained high amounts of radioactively labeled, in this case, nitrogen. You see it? So this means that the ants go in there, defecate or pee, who knows, <laughs> and thereby fertilize the seedling, which is much too small for any brood or ant group of ant workers to live in there permanently. So it's really the case that these ants go in there, fertilize the seedling, go out again, you know, walk to the next seedling and so on. So now we wanted to know the details of the inner structure of the domain of the various species. And traditionally you would have collected these and cut them open, but this doesn't give you the three dimensionality really the details of what's happening inside. You need high resolution computer tomography. Max Weigand in his talk already alluded to the power of computer tomography, but the machine we had to use of course was a large one because these domatia are actually football sized. And then you need the false color, uh, uh, um, you use false colors to see the different structures inside the domatia. So let's look at one of these domatia. And this particular first one that we look at is from a species that has apical growth that will elongate and form new chambers or become larger only in one direction. And so what you see in this image is the first part in color here in red, that is what used to be the seedling, the first chamber. And then the second chamber here colored in yellow is much larger. And then there will be third and fourth chambers as I'm showing you here and I'm trying to get this movie. Okay, so the part in red used to be the seedling. The first chamber in yellow, the second chamber in blue, the third chamber in purple and the fifth in green. And this is as the grand plant elongates over the years, it will form these chambers and they are all interconnected. So how about the nitrogen uptake inside these chambers? We look in detail, if we see that the wall of the first, of the ceiling part, these walls have a warty surface. There are regularly spaced warts that you see there in the inset. And then the second chamber and third and fourth and fifth chamber built over several years have the smooth walls, as you see here in the inset on the right. And the ants will use these smooth wall chambers only for their brood. And this warty walled chambers only for defecation, and I want to say pee. So the radioactively labeled nitrogen is almost exclusively taken up by the warty walled chambers, whereas the smooth chambers contain hardly any nitrogen, or take up hardly any nitrogen. Of course, the ants themselves are full of radioactively labeled nitrogen because they have been feeding on this radioactively labeled uh, sugar solution. And here's the seedling. The seedling has a lot of the radioactively labeled nitrogen, whereas the other tissues have much less. Here you see a more detailed picture of another species of this group. And here you can see these radio, <laughs> these uh, warts, regularly spaced warts. And so we hypothesized that these would be analogous to roots. And so we used a 
transcriptome approach to, uh, to, you know, to, to see whether genes having to do, let's say, with nitrogen uptake might be overexpressed in these tissues as compared to other tissues. And that indeed turned out to be the case. You see the uh, some of the differentially expressed genes in a transcriptome of one of the species I showed you. And of course, these are only the 100 genes or so that we were able, that are relatively well known from their function in Arabidopsis. And so the 10 genes overexpressed in warty tissue, warty walled tissue, have to do with root development, including cell elongation and auxin responses. Two other genes that are also overexpressed in warty walled tissue uh, have to do with nitrogen uptake and transport. And then many genes having to do with stress responses, abiotic and biotic stress responses are also overexpressed in those tissues. Uh, and that just makes perfect sense because these are cavities filled with debris, with feces deposited there by the ants. And so, you know, we expect that there would be pathogens, fungi, uh, germinating in these tissues, and that makes it makes perfect sense that stress response gene, genes should be overexpressed there. Conversely, in the smooth walled tissues, what is overexpressed are genes having to do with suberine biosynthesis and Rex biosynthesis, and again, this makes a lot of sense. Now, what about the reward? You would think that ant plants plants that regularly interact with ants have floral nectaries or extra floral nectaries, but this is not the case at all in these species that we have been studying on Fiji. Instead, where you see in the insert here on the right, you see a young bud and you see an old flower, actually the, the white petals are about to fall off, and there is no floral nectary and no extra floral nectary, but what happens is that nectar accumulates in the cupules of old flowers once the petals have fallen off. And the ants have the habit of biting into these old cupules full with nectar, filled with nectar, to obtain the nectar, to gain access to this nectar. In this uh, paper that is cited here, we have compared the anatomy of the nectaries of the focal species and closest relatives to really you know, get at how these nectaries develop and how the nectar accumulates. But here I will just focus on one aspect, the exclusivity, the exclusiveness of this reward. So the co-evolved ant, Philidris nagazao, as I said, it has the habit of biting into old cupules to get at the nectar. Now, if you test how other ants that occur on ant plants on that same tree, will react to these spots. They don't react at all. You see in the first graph here, the other ant species, you know, living in the same environment, they do not bite into the old cupules to get at nectar. And if you prick these cupules so that the nectar, you do damage them so that the nectar, you know, comes out a little bit, then the other ants are perfectly happy to take it. And very interesting is this experiment. If you place a drop of sugar onto one of these cupules with a syringe, then the other ants, again, perfectly happy to take it, but our focal ant is a bit confused and doesn't really, you know, is not used to having its nectar sit there on top of the flower. This is an extremely unusual reward system. So now, do all the species that may coexist, of our, you know, ant plants that may coexist on such a tree follow the same strategy? Let's look at inside a domation of one of these coexisting species with diffuse growth. In this case, the domation will form, will, will enlarge and form new cavities sort of around the domation. Of course, not here where it is attached to the tree, but it could be formed, grow here or here. Okay, let's look inside. And what we found with our uh, computer tomography and, and false color imaging is. In these, that in these species, in species that have domatia with diffuse growth, there are unconnected chambers, each with its own entrance hole from the outside. So you have, for example, the purple chambers here, cavities, okay? And then the green cavities and the red cavities. 
but they are not interconnected. The ants living in the purple cavities cannot visit the ants over living in the green cavity. Okay, and as the plant ages, as the domation ages, you see this in the inside in the upper right, this becomes really intricate. Here are maybe 12 independent apartments, each only being accessible from the outside, but not being connected inside. So this then <laughs> raised the question of the holes. We have a whole study of these holes. So in our focal species, the holes in, in all these ant plants, the holes in the domitia are entirely formed by the plant. They are not cut by the ants as you might have thought. And so in the focal species that are occupied by the specialized ant Phyllides nagazau, you can see that the holes have a very particular size that exactly fits, in this case, the head diameter of the, you know, the specialized ant. But in the other ant plant species that coexist on the same tree, as the plant ages, the domitia holes, the holes in the domitia will become you know, irregular and larger. And so other ant plants, uh, other ant species may enter and even other organisms such as cockroaches and small lizards and you know, other organisms. As the plant ages, these holes become larger. But in the Scormillaria species, the holes stay the same size throughout the life of this domation, which can be several years. So going into the details of the inner wall structure of those species that have the diffuse growth, they also have diffuse wall structure. So you have a little bit smooth walls and somewhat warty parts of the wall, but it's intermixed and there will be ant brood and antification throughout this cavity. And not surprisingly, the nitrogen uptake also is less uh, differentiated than in the first species I showed you. So here, the smooth-like wall part has taken up nitrogen, but the warty-like wall part has also taken up nitrogen. It's less differentiated. So this raised the question of who obtains more nitrogen? Is it the species occupied exclusively by the specialized ant? Or is it the species occupied by ever-changing species of ants? To answer this question, Jon carried out several 16 months long exclusion experiments in which he kept the ants from visiting Domitia by using tanglefoot, you know, sticky, sticky substance applied around the trunk of the tree so that ants could not reach the Domitia they would normally have visited. And here you have a species on the left that is occupied by various ant species. And here's the radioactively labeled nitrogen. It has taken up over the 16 months. And here's another domation in the same tree from which the ants were excluded. And of course it has less nitrogen, but the difference is not that striking. But in the specialized species, two of which were studied here, that is normally occupied by Phyllides nagazau, over 16 months, the occupied domation has twice as much nitrogen than the ones from which ants were excluded. This whole thing is context dependent as anyone would, any biologist would have expected. And there is a whole set of experiments reported on in this paper. Let me just give you the upshot. So Domitia planted, the seeds of which were planted by the ants in full sun. So the plants developed in full sun. Of course, they have tons of flowers and each one, each floral cupule will have this specialized reward exclusively accessible for, you know, Phyllides nagazau that bites into the cupules to get that nectar. So great. In the full sun, the ants get a carbohydrate rich diet. They also petrol these plants much more than they would in the shade. So these plants, have almost no herbivore damage. Conversely, in the shade, the ants don't get that much nectar, they don't walk there, they don't want to petrol these plants, and so it's much more herbivore damage. But the most unexpected part for us was what happens with the nitrogen, the nitrogen. So the plants growing in the shade actually get much more nitrogen from the ants. They're all occupied by the single species of ants, right? Because in the shade, the ants have to capture insects to feed on them, yeah? Whereas in the sun, 
they get all this wonderful sugar so they don't feed on insects. So the plant gets much more, much less nitrogen when it's cultivated in full sun. Not surprisingly, the ants act in their own interest and plant the seeds mostly in full sun, but for the plant, it gets more nitrogen in the shade. Now, what about those domatia that have different species of ants living inside them over time and also over space? So here you have one of those. It has one species of ants in this domation here, and these ants will enter through the holes from the outside. They will never walk over to this apartment here, occupied by another species of ants. And maybe this apartment is empty. So here's the turnover in ant occupation in some of these species. No, in all these, actually these are all the species in the genus Squamillaria. So the three species that are occupied by various species of ants over time, Guillaume has observed this now since 2014. And so in some years, maybe it is occupied by that species and another domation next by, or in another year, it's occupied by another species. But then there are cavities that are empty, cavities that will not receive any nitrogen because there are no ants in there, so no duplication, no fertilization. Whereas in the specialized system, you basically have an occupancy rate of 99.9%. This raises many interesting questions about the coexistence of mutualists. And we have used the empirical observations on the occupancy rate and the species of ants that live in these domatia gotten together with a mathematician to develop a model. The uh, empirical data also include interaction, interactions among these ants, because as you can imagine, there are larger ant species that are more aggressive and smaller ant species that are less aggressive. And so Guillaume tested the aggressiveness, the ability of these ants to coexist on sugar solution that he placed nearby. He also introduced brood of one species into the nest of the other species to just to, to quantify the aggressiveness of these and the, the coexistence of these mutualists and so nearby, living so nearby and walking on the surface of one and the same domation is just an amazing thing uh, yeah, in terms of study questions. So how old is this system? The plants, Again, this phylogeny comprises all the species on Fiji in this clade. The plants are about three to four million years old. And the ant species Nagazao is between, let's say, 6.5 and 3 million years old. And it is distinguished from all the related species in this genus by having lost the ability to make carton nests. All the other phylogeny species build their own nest in the trees. But this one cannot do that anymore. It is entirely dependent on the plants, on the whose seeds it plants, whose do, seeds it fertilizes. So it's, it's growing its own nests, future nests, but also depends on these future nests. So I think I have illustrated that this uh, ant plant interaction is analogous to human farming systems. We have the habitual planting, we have cultivation, precision fertilization and defense. We have the harvest of an exclusive reward and we have mutual dependence. So is this sustainable? Is this a sustainable farming system? In the years that we have studied this on Fiji, the coexistence of these specialized, only occupied by Phyllidus nagazao, ants that are entirely dependent on this domation for their nesting space, and of the others that are occupied by varying species of ants, appears to be stable, excuse me, appears to be stable. But what will happen under climate change? The specialized system, as I said, is always occupied like 99.9%. Phyllidus ants are happiest in warm, lowland and intermediate, intermediate altitudes. Ant diversity and abundance is generally highest at lower altitudes and in warm climates. But the, and, and the diversity is reduced the higher up in, in the mountains and the 
cooler the climate. In fact, we have also studied the breakdown of these mutualisms. These mutualisms break down relatively easily. This one, we have not found a breakdown yet. And it may be that with climate warming, this completely stable interaction between Phyllitis nagazao and its preferred plants that it, pl that it you know, cultivates and fertilizes and defends might actually benefit compared to the other ones that depend on a diversity and abundance, great abundance of different species of ants. But this needs much more study, field work really. So I want to end with a picture of my wonderful collaborator, Guillaume Chomiki, who is now an, a NERC research fellow in the School of Biosciences and the diversity of Sheffield. And I also want to, to end with a few sentences about why this is important. These ant plant interactions are of course a subset of or an, an example of mutualisms. Mutualisms are a huge topic in evolutionary biology and conservation in evolutionary biology because of these super interesting questions of why selection doesn't, which normally favors selfishness, how is it possible that these mutualisms have evolved and persist? And in terms of the conservation of interactions, in fact, Pete Hollingsworth also alluded to this very briefly, studying the genomics of these interactions, which is only possible now, is a huge topic. So I want to make a plug here for ant plant interactions are part of the study of mutualisms, which is just super interesting and important. And with this, I want to thank you and stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, um, Suzanne, for a truly fascinating and um, at times mind boggling um, talk. Now, um, please start firing some questions into the Q and A. Um, I'm sure there are plenty out there. Um, thank you for your um, bit of research on Jacob Bobart at the, <laughs> at the beginning. Um, yes, yes, I wasn't. I, I, I said he was a local man because he was recruited locally. But you're right; he has this sort of enigmatic history um, and a yeah. lot of um, legends about him and his yeah. mercenary yeah. habits. So yeah. thank you for, yes. for bringing that in. I, I, I hadn't read the paper that knew about, the, about his, 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 his birth in Gdansk. And the interpretation that the goat is actually kept away from his vegetables. This wasn't my invention. This is actually in that research paper about Boppard. Extraordinary, because again, a, a popular myth Yes. And the one that I've articulated myself is the goat represents one of his pets. And <laughs> yes, 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 strange, I read that. <laughs> a strange thing to actually have as a pet. And now it's yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. And what's symbolic. And it says that this goat is actually emaciated because he is keeping it at bay. <laughs> you know, normally, but okay, it's all in this paper. Yes. Okay. Well, we 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 can't go on about Jacob Bobart as fascinating as he is, but he was interested in fascinating plants, and I'm sure he would have most enjoyed your your talk just now. And uh, so, um, yes, and and also for referencing Oxford and Camilla Huxley, um, I remember her fascinating lectures when I was an undergraduate and introduced me to the amazing world of, of, of ant plants. Um, so I, I'll get on with the questions without further ado. Uh, the first one that came in um, asked, are there any benefits to the trees on ah. which the squamillaria grows? Yes. I, I can answer that. Yes. I, my, we do not have quantitative data on this. We do have data on the particular species of trees that carry these epiphytes. So like I said, it's a small, relatively small subset of trees that have the epiphyte. My feeling from other studies, not ours, is that these epiphytes present a, a um, burden to the tree because when it rains, you know, these are heavy. And so the tree clearly needs to put in more lignin, more support to maintain its branches. If there are too many epiphytes sitting on these branches, it must be, a burden on the tree. 
you know, that's what I thought. Um, here's another one. Um, does the old flower cuticle biting ant behavior have <laughs> anything to do with pollination? No, it has uh, not. The reproductive function of these plants is fulfilled. So the pollinators will come by the flower is open without offering nectar. These pollinators are not nectar nectar taking. Okay, it's super interesting. Yeah, so what are the pollinators? It is, I think, we do not have good data on the pollinators, okay? We think it is small flies and bees. Oh, okay. We do not have solid data on the pollinators. Sorry, I'm... Yeah. It is really an unusual oh. type of nectar reward that the ants have evolved this you know, behavior of biting into the old flowers to get at this nectar is amazing. It is, yeah. it is indeed. Um, here's one, uh, the comment is fascinating talk. Um, didn't Guillaume get bitten by the ants? when? Yes, he, oh, yes, he <laughs> did, he did. These are very aggressive ants and he got bitten. This is why he's all, you know, all gloved up, the blue plastic gloves. And I don't know whether you saw that he had plastic around there protecting his body. It was terrible work. Yes. And it's not only the ants, there are also sometimes scorpions inside these domatia in the old ones, the old domatia. Oh dear. Um, the size of the yes. ant plants is amazing. Has any research been done into the maximum size they can reach before they would fall off the tree? Ah, excellent question. So Guillaume has weighed them in the field and they are huge. I mean, like up to let's say um, centimeters, 50 centimeters in diameter. I was amazed at the ones he brought back to Munich, football size. And when we put them into the cytometer, I mean, the most amazing thing was that some ants survived the CT scanning. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> well, I often say that the ants will be here if there's any nuclear amazing. war. Amazing, absolutely. Amazing. nuclear war, yes, yes. Right, I can't see any more questions coming in, and we do have to move yeah. on shortly. So, Suzanne, thank you so much for that wonderful talk, and um, I hope you'll stay with us for a bit oh, yes. and maybe pop in again tomorrow. But I just end with yeah. a, finishing on your your point about studying mutualisms and particularly these. These, these really understudied um, tropical mutualisms by just making a plug for looking at figs as well and what's <laughs> going on inside the fig psychonium and the amazing microcosm that we see there. So figs and ant plants, it's all got me <laughs> thinking there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would be here for the rest of the symposium. Good. Thank you. So now we're going to um, take a break for, um, I think it's 20 minutes or so. Um, I will just check. Um, yes, 20 minutes or so, reconvening um, at what time? Um, Sorry, I've lost my, my, my line here. Um, yes, re reconvening at um, 17.50 um, UK time. So it's about, yeah, less than 15 minutes. Sorry, I rambled on. We'll have a break and get back shortly. Bye for now.
Hello and welcome back to Celebrating Botanic Gardens Past, Present and Future. My name is Lauren Baker and I am the Secondary Education Officer at Oxford Botanic Garden and the event organiser. It is my pleasure today to chair the education and engagement session of our anniversary symposium, which to me could not be more important. Engaging children, teenagers and young adults with plants is absolutely vital to ensuring the successful conservation of the world's flora and biodiversity. And during this session, I want to introduce you to some fellow educators who are equally passionate about sharing their love of all things botanical. To start us off in this session is Dr. Jonathan Mitchley, or Dr. M, for those of you who follow him on Twitter, from the University of Reading. Jonathan is an associate professor in field botany and a keen advocate for botanical outreach. His talk today is entitled Plants in Education in the 21st Century, a Big Botany Challenge. Take it away, Jonathan. Hello, I'm Dr. M, otherwise known as Jonathan Mitchley from the University of Reading, and I thank the organisers for inviting me to speak at this fantastic celebration. I'm going to address some of what I see as the big botany challenges for our century. Botanic gardens play a key role in all of these challenges. I appreciate that I'm preaching to the botanically converted here, and perhaps the biggest challenge for botanists now is to preach to the unconverted, to actually convert them. In a sense, botany and the beauty fascination and importance of plants are best kept secrets. And they desperately need to become really badly kept secrets if we are to surmount the big botanical challenges anytime soon. The phrase the big botany challenge stems from our 2019 symposium held as part of our celebrations of 50 years of master's botany teaching at Reading. In November 2019 we held a symposium to tackle some of the issues of plants in our education system or the lack of plants uh, in our education system or the lack of the proper approach to plants in our education system. The big botany challenge was all about promoting passion for plants in our schools. Over 80 delegates and presenters came to Reading from over 50 different organisations, schools, education specialists, exam boards, botanic gardens, research institutions, industry specialists and conservation bodies. And we realised that to deal with big botany challenges, we need collaboration between educators, employers, industry um, and others. And these are some who are involved and you can hear their reflections on the achievements of that symposium by following the link. Now the issues and outputs of our 2019 symposium were focused on the curriculum, on resources, on getting plants into the classroom, on raising awareness of careers with botany and with plants, and overall enabling the discovery of the joy of plants as early as possible in our school students. So what is the big botany challenge in 2021, a couple of years Later. Well, I see it as getting plants to the centre of education. There's more work to be done there, but also getting plants to the centre of public consciousness, political awareness, economic development and environmental policy. And these are big botany challenges indeed. But what a difference a pandemic makes. It seems that the pandemic has actually increased plant awareness uh, in Britain and more widely. Even David Attenborough, whose focus tends to be on animals, was looking at the snowdrops in his garden and it was lifting his heart. So the pandemic seems to have made a difference to plant awareness, but we need much more. And that is the nub of the big botany challenge. Now, here's a thought experiment for you. What if our political leaders put plants at the centre of policy? We all know plants are fascinating, beautiful and central to the solution of every critical environmental issue on the planet, but what if politicians were to get this? What a difference that would make to the big botany challenges that face us today. But we can ask, why should this be so apparently preposterous? There have been nature and plant aware political leaders in the past. Think of John Muir. He was a botanist and he had significant influence on Teddy Roosevelt, but that was in 1903. Can we think of any elected nature and plant aware politicians since then? If we can't, then that probably explains a lot. 
So what I want to do for the remainder of this presentation is to touch on some of the elements of what I see as the current big botany challenge. So let's start at the top. We need to get more plants into global environmental policy. And we can wonder what Glasgow and COP26 will deliver and how much of that will be focused on plants and the way that plant can help us in environmental crises such as climate change. We need to get more botany and plants into the Millennium Development Goals because humanity's future literally depends on plants. Planting a trillion trees is just an ill-informed and actually damagingly popular soundbite. The key thing is to get more botany and more plant ecology into environmental policy to deliver the right plant in the right place and it need not always be a tree. We need to engage the younger generation with plants and botany and that's certainly a focus of my own work and the focus of our 2019 symposium. We need young ambassadors and champions for botany and although social media can be a two-edged sword I do feel it can be a force for plants and botany in the 21st century. We need to get more plants on TV and other modern mass media. It's 25 years since the private life of plants hit our screens. David Attenborough has made over 80 documentary films since then, most with a minuscule emphasis on plants. Now, documentaries are in effect part of our wider education system and we need plants in our education system at all levels. So here's some more thought experiments for you. What if we unleash the mind-blowing world of plant diversity on school children before they learn about photosynthesis and xylem and phloem in a nondescript plant? What if we train up and support teachers to have more confidence with plants? We need more and more interesting and relevant plants in the curriculum. The curriculum must be exciting if the students are to engage with plants and botany and to take this engagement and fascination forward in their lives. We need to engage our students with books by botanists to teach the fascination of plants. And this can include engaging with the plants in one's local environment. Some are rather sniffy about learning plant names. Latin names are a waste of time, they say, but knowing the names of common plants in your locality, whether that's the common names or the scientific names, gives you a firmer grounding in your local environment. I, I very much believe that. And while we're on the subject of plants in the local environment, we can see that plants are everywhere. You're never very far from a plant. In fact, you're usually within centimetres, if not millimetres, of a plant. And pavement plants are a key education tool. Even the inner city school with little more than tarmac will harbour plants. Little mosses, seedlings of wildflowers, all surviving seemingly against the odds. And these plants can be observed, admired, identified and used as examples of the extraordinary resourcefulness that is the green plant. My colleague Alistair Callum at the Big Botany Challenge 2019 um, encouraged teachers to get plants into the classroom. Grow plants in the space you're teaching in, he says. Integrate your pupils with living things. We have a video from this symposium and if you follow the link to my YouTube channel uh, you should be able to find it there. We need to take plants to everyone. We need to engage in botanical outreach. Teach the kids how to use a hand lens and you will totally alter their perception of plants. This was our activity for Fascination of Plants Day 2019, looking at smelly plants, looking at, looking at the antimicrobial properties in the lab, and looking at smelly plants outside in the Botanic Garden at Reading, looking at the ways in which plants encourage insects to pollinate the plants, and also the ways in which plants use chemical defences to deter herbivores. Fascination of Plants uh, 2021 was postponed, Will now take place on 18th of May 2022 around that time so do check out Fascination of Plants Day 2022 on the web there's a big role for botanic gardens in these kinds of international outreach events. There are big botany challenges at university level also 
the loss of botanical programs and modules, the tendency to view plants as a big turnoff for students, which can easily become a self-fulfilling prophecy, when the truth is students will respond very positively to plants if they are taught with enthusiasm, originality and relevance. Knowing about plants is a key employability skill in ecology, conservation and consultancy, amongst other employment sectors. Our MSc Species Identification and Survey Skills at the University of Reading has a remarkable employment record. And over this one year course, students learn plant and animal identification and survey skills, and they can carry out a six month summer placement with an ecological consultancy. And by the end of the placement and the course, we regularly find that the majority of students are either kept on as full time staff with their placement consultancy, or they quickly find employment elsewhere. My colleague John Warren and myself invented Botanical University Challenge, which is a fun event modelled on the famous um, BBC TV quiz um, and with the aim of promoting botany at university level. The first contest was held at Kew in 2016 and it's becoming a popular annual event with offshoots springing up in Spain and the United States recently and we hope more widely. In Feb 2021, we had 15 institutions competing necessarily online. And talking to the young participants, it's very clear to me that the big botany challenge is to provide a support network for plant aware students, botanical societies across the country and the Internet, and the web are crucial tools for this. There will be a botanical university contest in 2022 and because of the increasing uptake from institutions, we're running this over two half days. The first round will be held on the 16th and the subsequent rounds and the semis and the final will be held on the 23rd of February next year. Uh, do check out the website, get in touch if you'd like to uh, participate as a team or if you'd like to help, for example, in, in uh, setting questions and so on. So we achieved a lot at the Big Botany Challenge 2019, and I think not least in getting such a diversity of stakeholders together to, be to debate the educational challenges. There's also much else going on um, at the moment as this conference is showing, but there's still much to be done. So in terms of where next from our Big Botany Challenge Symposium 2019, um, there are discussions and, and moves afoot. Ideas from Reading from the Science and Plants for Schools group who are presenting next. Also the Oxford Botanic Garden and Arboretum who have organised this fantastic celebration. And our focus is very much on teachers and teacher trainers. Um, looking particularly at secondary schools. So um, I'm sure there will be event, upcoming events uh, to look out for. But of course, there is scope for wider collaboration um, to deal with these challenges. And there is also a need for champions to tackle the big botany challenges of broadcasting, the mass media, politics, economics and sustainable development. And these issues were discussed by BGCI's Stephen Blackmore at our 2019 symposium. And here's a short excerpt. The grassroots responses to the challenges that lay behind the sustainable development goals, so many of those trace back to botany and to plants. And as those crises grow, there's more and more of a realisation that natural solutions are a big part of what should be going on to engage with the planet's ecology. And I think we need to make certain that we position botany as being the career path for people who can contribute to those natural solutions and to deliver them. But the thing that we really rarely ever mention is who are botanists? What do they do? And I think that that needs building into our thinking for the future very much more. Because botanists are in fact the people who know how to restore damaged landscapes, how to feed people, how to repair the damages that we're recognising that have been done to our planet, how to take people to an understanding of the benefits of engaging with nature, how to create urban green spaces. Those are all jobs, I think, for botanists. What I think we should do is try to put the spotlight more firmly on who botanists are, what they can do and the difference that they can make in the world. And before I move on, notice how beautiful that symposium room is. My colleague Alistair Cullum filled the room with plants, which were both the focus of different presentations, but also to provide botanical ambience for this botanical symposium. I think a take home message here is that bring plants into the room, any room, any time. Any symposium, but certainly any symposium dealing with plants should have plants in the room. 
The presence of plants has a positive effect on our well-being, but also provide talking points, discussion points, and enhance our ability to think and discuss in original and, and novel ways. So the bottom line for the Big Botany Challenge is to enhance plant awareness, encouraging the true appreciation of the beauty, fascination, and importance of plants. As I said at the top of this presentation, it's great to preach to the converted here, but we need to continue to preach to the unconverted for all our sakes. The 21st century has to be the century of plants. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to the question session later. Thank you, Jonathan. We'll catch up with you again at the end of the session. Now I'd like to welcome Dr. Suzanne Moss, who is Head of Education and Learning at the Royal Horticultural Society. Her talk today is the Royal Horticultural Society's approach to education, from the disinterested to the doctorates. Take it away, Suzanne. Thank you very much and thanks so much for inviting me. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking at this uh, really interesting and timely conference. Um, having said that, I do feel like a little bit of an imposter because RHS gardens are not actually botanical gardens, but we do exist to promote the science, arts and practice of horticulture. So not too far removed and we are all um, shooting for the same goal. So today I'm going to look at the difference that public botanical and heritage gardens can make um, to the modern world and how we're looking to support that through education and skills. Uh, next year, the RHS is going to have been offering education for um, 200 years, uh, which we think is quite incredible. But actually, uh, the Oxford Botanical Garden makes us look like a relative newbie. Um, and it's one of the only gardens that can do that. Um, 400 years is astonishingly impressive. So the RHS started with trainees at its own garden um, in Chiswick in London in 1822. Um, our offer has significantly grown since then, as you can imagine. Um, but what are we aiming towards now in our horticultural education at the Royal Horticultural Society? Um, and also why? So these are our current goals. Um, we are aiming for three particular goals, environment and sustainability, skills and knowledge and well-being. And together, we hope that they create a package um, which is useful for everyone and interesting as well. So we hope that in environment and, and sustainability, that we can support people to support the environment and to grow sustainably and that they also become positive advocates for sustainability. So they're spreading that, that word as well. You may have seen recently our new sustainability strategy which is based around making ourselves and the way we work at the RHS more sustainable, but actually seeing what we can do to spread the word of that current amazing research which is happening in horticulture um, and to hopefully um, support and encourage people to garden more sustainably as well. There are 27 million gardeners in the UK and if we can all do that, our bit for the environment, it's gonna make such a difference. Um, skills and knowledge. So. We know there's a, a poor perception of the horticultural industry within people coming into the industry. Uh, we want more people to choose horticulture as a career. And so we're really trying to overturn that poor perception and make that more positive. We also want to develop horticultural skills. So that's with people coming into the industry and people who are developing their career. Um, and well-being as well. So we know uh, post COVID that horticulture is amazing for our well-being. Um, we want people to be connected to nature and to each other uh, and to support places to be greener, supporting the mental and physical well-being of the UK. So today um, I am going to talk mostly about skills and how that supports um, how that supports um, the horticulture industry as a whole. And lots around that is about the economics of the ornamental and environmental horticultural sector. So up until recently, we really had no idea of how big the industry was. Um, no one had ever really done a study on it before. We didn't know um, what sort of player we were in the, in the jobs market. So we did some research through the Ornamental Horticulture Roundtable Group in 2017 and 2018. 
And we found out, which was so surprising, that horticulture was worth 24.2 billion pounds to the UK economy each year. That is absolutely phenomenal. Um, as a comparison, uh, the fisheries industry, which we're all very worried about post-Brexit, um, is worth 1.6 billion to the UK economy. That's obviously really important but as well, but I think that just gives us an idea um, of how big a player horticulture is. It also supports 1.6% of all UK jobs, which is an absolutely uh, ph phenomenal amount. Uh, so on this chart here, um, public botanical and heritage gardens are represented under the tourism uh, bracket. That's the grey one on the left. So that supports 32,000 jobs in the UK every year. And garden tourism is worth 2.9 billion um, to the UK economy, which is really significant. Um, also, parks and gardens are the most popular activity for international tourists to the UK. So what does that mean for skills? Um, it means that we think that we can grow the horticultural industry up to above 40 billion by 2030. Um, but that requires skills, um, requires more skills, more knowledge and more people coming into the industry. Um, and if that many people are visiting our gardens, which they obviously are, um, we can also, that's such an opportunity for us to spread those um, messages around sustainability and well-being as well. So we never really knew much <laughs> about the skills gap either. We've been talking about in horticulture since I first came into horticulture 13 years ago. Um, we were talking about um, that there was a skills crisis, but no one ever seemed to know kind of where it was or what we should do about it. Um, so we did some research in 2019 to see where that skills gap was and what we could do about it. We found after surveying um, a thousand businesses within the ornamental and environmental horticultural sector, that there was a lack of interest in the sector, that there was a lack of suitable applicants, that once they got to us, there was a lack of appropriate and available training, and that businesses did not know about current training offers or where to find them. So if you can find for me a more damning list of <laughs> um, various the skills, I'm not sure what it would be or what we would add to that, but um, it's not great. Uh, so hopefully we can help to overturn that. The business has also told us about roles which they found difficult to fill. Um, so they said that they found skilled trades, professional and technical roles and supervisor roles difficult to fill. So essentially that told us that that's mostly roles which um, are uh, people are horticulturally trained. So they have a horticultural qualification. Um, but also it's not just people entering the industry. It's that continuing professional development when people are in the industry um, and are hoping to develop those skills. And the skills that those businesses required were, um, as we can, um, we could have probably predicted environmental skills and sustainability skills. So that's coming much more to the fore and that links back to our other objectives. Um, biosecurity, because we know that's a real uh, problem with uh, new pests and diseases coming in. Our plant knowledge, uh, soft skills, use of machinery and equipment, and very much increasingly so, um, soil science. So the business has said to us that about 14% of these roles um, had been open for three years um, and they expected the skills requirement to go up by 23% within the next uh, two years, which is going to leave quite a significant skills gap. So just to give you a brief overview of what we offer uh, at the RHS, on the left of this diagram is kind of our engagement um, uh, activity. And that moves through up to our um, higher level education. So just to pick out a couple of things for you, um, the campaign for school gardening on the left and educational visits to gardens, how we introduce um, horticulture into schools, essentially. So we hope to um, interest young people at a young age. Because we know that young people, whilst they might not make their careers decisions until they're maybe in years eight, nine, ten, um, they're discounting careers from age five to nine, essentially. So uh, we really need to be in there from a young age, getting people to know just how relevant horticulture is to their modern lives and how many opportunities there are uh, within that as well for whatever they want to do within their careers. Um, we'll talk about the uh, transition part in a second, but um, on the formal learning end, we have RHS qualifications. 
So we're an awarding organisation and we have about 80 approved centres around the country who are, offer RHS qualifications at levels one, two and three. Um, we also have, uh, we run RHS apprenticeships at our gardens at levels two and three. That's about GCSE and A level. level. Uh, we have School of Horticulture programmes, which is students in our gardens at levels three and four. So that's A level to first year of a degree. And then we have the RHS Master of Horticulture as a continuing professional development program for people who've been in the industry about four years or above um, in a supervisory role so they can really increase their supervisory skills. We also then have PhD level programmes and our science teams work with universities around the country to be able to offer that research um, uh, with, our, uh, with our RHS experts in association with the universities and then the learning that they do and that they create on sustainability and well-being and all of those are really valuable um, pieces of knowledge can then be ploughed straight back into our education systems. So we're sharing all of that knowledge throughout this um, uh, throughout this pipeline. So just to talk a little bit more about that pipeline, we've got our the educational visits to gardens and campaign for school gardening, and our short courses and workshops as well and teacher training. Um, that's all brilliant and they're engagement programs and we have lots of people involved with those every year. So, for example, 45,000 young people come to um, our gardens every year to learn about horticulture. But then how do we get them into our formal qualifications after that? Um, that's the real, uh, the real question, the real struggle that we have. How do we convince people when they've had an amazing experience in our gardens or in their schools? Um, and I think we all probably have this problem. <laughs> that actually horticulture is a brilliant career for them, whether they're creative, whether they're scientific, whether they're interested in working with their hands or in research or whatever it is, um, how can we get them in there? So we are looking at that, uh, that transition period at the minute, looking at how we can provide better careers advice, looking at how we can provide better um, work experience opportunities for people um, to have a taster of the horticultural industry so they're not committing uh, but just encouraging people and removing those barriers to coming into horticulture as a career. We also do influence and advocacy. So I mentioned earlier the Ornamental Horticulture Roundtable Group. So um, the RHS currently chairs that. It's a group of um, uh, influential organisations within, um, within ornamental and environmental horticulture which is essentially a government uh, uh, based support group so that we can get together, uh, lobby for what we what the change we need to see um, at government. And all the research that I've spoken about today has come through the Ornamental Horticulture Roundtable Group, and that is making a difference. We've also contributed to um, the development of new government led uh, qualifications and learning programmes. So essentially at the minute, um, down the vocational route, they're um, looking at apprenticeships and T-levels. Um, apprenticeships, I, I think you probably all know, are employer-led, so uh, apprentices are employees of the horticultural industry in a particular business, and they spend 20% of their time off the job learning at college or at a training provider, um, so they get the knowledge portion of their learning. Um, a T-level or a technical level is essentially the other way around. So they will spend a couple of years at college with um, a portion out at a, a business, out at an employer of work experience for about three months. The first horticultural tea level is coming online in 2023. So we all really need to be uh, aware of that, ready for it. There hopefully will be people coming through wanting to do work experience uh, in our businesses and really helping themselves um, to make that transition into horticulture career. Now, we really support uh, the apprentices and T-levels. They're great programmes. Um, we've been involved in their development, but they are really broad. So they're designed to give people um, an introduction into um, the horticulture and landscape industry at the same time. So they can make a decision as to where they go. We think that the um, our very specific qualifications in horticulture and qualifications, for example, for career changes who might not be able to commit to an apprenticeship or T-level full-time, um, we know career changes are a big market for us in horticulture, um, are really important. So we're continuing to develop our RHS qualifications. Um, and we also support in other things like, uh, for example, the new OCR GCSE in natural history, which we're supporting with. 
So development and challenges. Obviously, uh, we're looking at sustainability now, um, and we're looking at how we can embed all of those sustainability um, goals throughout all of our education programs and uh, share that knowledge more widely with people. Uh, we're looking at inclusion um, and diversity. We know we're not the most diverse industry in horticulture, but imagine if we can get um, all of those skills by becoming more diverse as an industry and all of those new skills that we could welcome into the industry. So uh, we're really working on that through careers pipelines and seeing how we can get people from that engagement stage um, and working with community groups who are doing awesome work um, and encourage new people and new skills uh, into the industry to support us. So I think uh, that's a whistle stop tour through it um, and the solutions to the horticultural skills gap. They're not simple, they're not short term, but neither are they insurmountable. Uh, we've all got, we have all of us on this call, you know, we're all passionate about it. Um, by looking outwards, really harvesting um, and harnessing the amazing skills and enthusiasm that we've got, um, there is absolutely no reason why we shouldn't build an even larger and a more effective horticultural industry for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, and we'll catch up with you soon. And if I can just remind everyone, we've had a few questions coming in already, but if you do have any questions for our speakers in this session, do remember to pop them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So our third talk in this session is from Dan Jenkins and Alex Jenkin, who both, both work for Science and Plants in Schools, otherwise known as SAPS. Alex is the project manager for schools and Dan is the head of SAPS and they are here today to talk to us about engaging people with plants through formal education. Over to you both. Good afternoon. It's fantastic to be here uh, this afternoon to talk a little bit about the work that we do at the Gatsby Plant Science Education Programme. So thank you so much to Lauren and congratulations to the Oxford Botanic Garden on their 400th anniversary. It's really nice to be able to bring you some of the ideas that we do uh, to support young people and inspire them about plant science. So we're a programme and we're based in the Botanic Garden in Cambridge. Um, and we are a joint project at the Gardens and the Sainsbury Laboratory in Cambridge. Uh, it's fantastic to be immersed in the beautiful surroundings that we have there, um, as many of the audiences, I suspect, in their own host institutions. Um, and what we're about, we're funded by the Gatsby Charitable Foundation, um, and we are funded to try and boost the interest in plant science for those young people that are going through their formal education. And partly what we're about is to respond to that uh, problem with the plant pipeline that Jonathan Mitchell might be talking about this afternoon. So um, what we're here to do is to try and boost the interest in plant science. So we have two areas of activity that we work across, one of which is with primary school, secondary education and post-16 teachers and technicians in schools and colleges across the UK. Uh, and that's through our project called Science and Plants for Schools. We're known by teachers as SAPS, um, and some of you may be familiar with our work. And a little bit later, Alex is going to introduce some of the projects that we do, the SAPS project. The other activity that we do is working with students, and that's working with post-16 students and undergraduates um, through our higher education activity. And I'm going to introduce a little bit about what we do for that part of the program uh, a little bit later, but mostly we're going to be focusing on the work that we do to enthuse and inspire young people uh, about plants through schooling. So we're a relatively small team. Um, here's the, the uh, diagram of all of the people that are in our team. There's myself and Alex, um, as along with Jamie and Chris, who work on the SAPS side of the, the activities. Chris is a practicing head of biology at a sixth form college and he brings that element of um, real know-how of what's going on in schools to our program so that we're making sure that we're responding to the needs and demands of teachers across the UK to, to best represent plants in the classroom. 
And then we've got the higher education side of our program. So that's Andrea and Claire and Charlotte, and they work to support young students um, in various projects that I'll outline a little bit later. So um, I'm going to hand over to Alex. So Alex Jenkin, uh, who is the project manager for SAPS, and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do at SAPS to try and inspire. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, yeah, so as Dan said, I'll be giving you a bit of a whistle stop tour of the different things that we do. Uh, the SAPS programme has been running for over 30 years, um, working with uh, school science teachers and technicians to develop resources for school science teachers and technicians. So uh, one of our real strengths is that we work with teachers and technicians to develop the resources that they that they're looking for and that they need to, to teach the things they're teaching day to day. Um, a lot of what we're doing is about building confidence and enthusiasm um, within uh, the education profession, teaching plants. Many people who come to um, work as a school science technician or work as a, a biology teacher or a chemistry teacher having to teach biology may not have done any study on plants since their own school days so we're really about um supporting them with extra knowledge and um, particularly we've had a focus on practical resources but we do lots of other things as well um, and our approach to inspiration has two uh two prongs to it uh so we're thinking as well as those very useful resources for teachers we're also sort of adding in uh, the exciting contexts and hooks about plants, so um, things to inspire in that way. And then the other the other side of that is that, as I'm sure uh, many people here today already know, that plants are amazing anyway. So there are incredible things that plants do that sometimes we just need to sit back and think, wow, that's that's amazing. So we try to highlight some of that. All of our resources are available on our website, which is www.saps.org.uk. Um, all freely available. Um, we have a UK remit, uh, but we can um, use, uh, anyone can use our resources. Uh, we have around, in the last month, we had about 65,000 unique users on our website. So we do, there are plenty of people coming to look for, um, look for our resources and use them. Um, Dan, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So here are some of our examples of some of our resources. They all are designed to support the curriculum. Um, so the curricula at the moment are very busy, they're packed with information. So all of our resources um, support that teaching. Uh, we can see some of them there. That's an example of one of our posters on plant disease. There's one of our videos demonstrating our practical work and right at the bottom there we've got our animations which are very popular uh, for discussing some core plant topics uh, we've also got specific resources around context as well and i mentioned um the practical science as well um, as i said they're all free they're all free to use uh, we do have a secondary focus but there are primary resources as well and one of the advantages of being part of um, the Botanic Garden community is that we have people working in, in the Botanic Garden and in the Sainsbury Laboratory as well, who are um, who give us inspiration for resources and support in that development. So it's great to have that expertise. And saying that, if there's anyone out there who's got ideas for resources, for teaching resources, then do get in touch with us and we can see whether that's something that we'd be able to support you with or um, might be able to uh, develop that idea further. So I'll have the next slide, please, Dan. Thank you. We're not just about looking at um, those resources on our website. We've also thinking about um, professional development of teachers and moving towards thinking about how we teach about plants. So thinking around pedagogy. Um, we've had a very successful online course developed with STEM Learning here in the UK which is teaching biology, inspiring students with plant science, which looks at how you can use plants as an example or throughout the whole of the biology curriculum. We had around um, on that on online course, we've had um, around oh, over 3000 um, learners on that course, which is fantastic, more than we'd ever be able to reach 
um, by doing in-person or face-to-face training. Uh, we're hoping to have a future online course supporting a core topic in plant science, so teaching photosynthesis. Uh, and we've got some other pedagogy resources that Chris Graham is working on. Um, as Dan mentioned, Chris is a teacher in our team, and he's looking again at how, how we can use plants across the whole of biology. Um, Dan, if I could have the next slide, please. And of course, none of this is any good if we don't aren't able to get in touch with teachers. Teachers are notoriously time poor, technicians as well are under pressure. So we try to reach teachers in lots of different ways. We have uh, a scheme where we send out USBs with resources on, with SAPS branding on to early career teachers. We sent out 898 of those in the last academic year. Um, and that's to, to trainees um, training across the UK. We reach around 40 to 50% of biology trainees in the UK each year via that scheme. Uh, we also work with their trainers. So we run an annual training event for initial teacher educators, and that allows them to come and play with some of our resources, get to know SAPS a bit, and uh, get to know some of the different things that we do. Uh, we have a lecture at that event given by Beverly Glover, who will be giving a lecture uh, tomorrow, I believe, as part of this um, as this a part of this uh, conference. And we also have a newsletter that we send out twice termly, which reaches uh, just under eight and a half thousand people. So we do we do have a good reach um, out to lots of different people. Uh, and finally, just on the next slide, we've got uh, social media channels. So do have a look. Um, at those. Um, all our videos are hosted on our YouTube channel. So if you want to see, have a quick look at what our, some of our practicals are, then that's probably the best way of, of doing that. I'm going to hand over back to Dan to talk a bit more about what we're doing in terms of thinking about the biology curriculum as a whole and how plants fit into that. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. So uh, the school curriculum, lots of people um, makes suggestions that there is not a great deal of plants uh, content within the school curriculum. Um, I disagree, there's a reasonable amount. And what we try to do here at SAPS is make sure that that curriculum is broad and balanced uh, to allow plants to flourish within it. So um, for those international um, viewers here, we've, we've got various national curriculum that, uh, we've, that are followed across the regions of the UK. Um, and most of those, uh, are highly specified. So that leaves little wiggle room for teachers to, to deviate from that, that national curriculum and, and teach subjects that might be core to their heart or uh, of interest to them. Um, but what we try to do is represent the best way to teach that biology curriculum through plants. So uh, many, many of the biology topics that are taught across the, the key stages um, are common across the kingdoms. So plants can be used in fantastic ways to introduce novel concepts or novel contexts uh, to the school um, in the school curriculum. So what we try to do is not just bang in more plants and that, that's, that's not going to be helpful because it's hugely, hugely crammed in at the moment, um, certainly in parts of England and Wales. Um, what we try to do is make sure that you can exemplify those topics and those areas of the curriculum using plants as an example. And one of the projects that Chris is working on um, is how enzymes can be used um, throughout that entire curriculum. Every time an enzyme appears within the curriculum, how can you use a plant example there rather than uh, the, the go to animal example, for example? So there are many things that we can do with that school curriculum. I could talk at length about this. And what we're trying to do is prepare ourselves to be able to represent a really positive experience of plants in the curriculum. Uh, for any future curriculum change. We're always looking for new ideas, so do get in touch if you've got any particular feelings or um, comments on, on the curriculum that you'd like to contribute. Um, so that wraps up the, the brief summary of what we do on the, the SAP side of things. We do represent the entire of the UK, uh, or try to, um, so we, we have our work cut out for us. We're always looking for people to work with um, to extend our reach, um, but uh, so do, do please get in touch. So uh, the uh, next slide, here we go, is where we're going to talk about the higher education side of our project. So 
This um, has got one um, major project, the Gatsby Plant Science Summer School. So that's a, a project that's been going for about 15 years, started at the University of Leeds, funded by, by Gatsby, um, and it's to try and infuse undergraduates so that at the end of their first year uh, of a bioscience course or second year in Scotland, um, from 28 universities across the UK, and we take them to a, to a venue when, when we can in person to uh, enthrall them with plants, whether that's through um, excellent lectures from inspirational plant scientists from, from all over the world, or through practical activities, or through um, tutorials and seminars. So there's loads that happens in that week, um, but the key to the, the success and the impact of this project is that we then support those alumni um, throughout the rest of their university career by um, helping them uh, pursue any of the opportunities that might be out there and, and, and making them aware of those kinds of opportunities that you can have for work experience, for studentships, for internships, for sandwich placements, or, or whatever the sorts of things are that they can um, grab to, to pursue um, future studies or careers in, in plant science. So, uh, and at the moment, what's fantastic is we've got a whole load of those alumni that are, are what are called plant champions within their host institutions. So they're the ones that are going to go out and try and persuade others and help persuade others that plants should be part of their futures. So that's the undergraduate audience. Um, moving down to that post-16 audience, so 16 to 18 year olds in full-time education in the UK, um, we have two projects that we've developed um, recently. Uh, one is a future learn course, so that's a massive open online course. That was developed with some EU funding to try and illustrate through food biotechnology, agricultural technology, uh, and biotechnology that uh, plants are a fascinating uh, uh, part of um, food tech. So uh, it's developed specifically for 16 to 19 year olds. And in our first um, year of this course running back in 2019, uh, we were really pleased to get over 3,000 learners on that course. So a really good way to help in introduce the idea that plants are core to the food that you eat. Uh, with a view that those A-level biology students, uh, for example, that might want to study this course, um, can draw inspiration and, and demonstrate their interest in the subject uh, to their peers. The other side of uh, the, the work that we're doing on this at the moment is something called our Into Biology website. This will change name very shortly uh, and is being revamped. Um, but it's a site to try and uh, present all of those options that you have available to you as a a post-16 or undergraduate student uh, for things like what courses could you study, what skills might you need to go into plant science, um, those plant science opportunities that are out there, um, project ideas that you could do, do as a post-16 student or as an undergraduate. Um, loads of ideas there um, and that's one of the other examples that we have to uh, engage young people uh, through the online arena uh, to try and promote plant science. We do other projects, um, and if anyone's interested in any of those, do get in touch. But I hope what we've done this afternoon is just introduce you some of those, uh, show, so, sorry, showcase some of those ideas that we have that we're, we've been doing over the, the, the past um, few years to try and infuse and enthrall young people with plants, because we know, we know, most people here know they're great and amazing, but it's tra about trying to spread that message. Um, so do get in touch. Um, I'd like to briefly thank Alex for, for um, her time this afternoon to introduce some of those SAPS uh, projects um, and once again thank uh, and congratulate Oxford Botanic Garden for inviting us along this afternoon and I look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan and Alex. I know I found SAPS an invaluable resource when I was teaching, and it was really nice to see a summary of everything you guys are working on. Now, our final speaker of this session is Suzanne Hermiston, who is Head of Education at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. For Suzanne's talk, we're focusing on a different but equally important age group as she provides us with an overview of the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh's education programme and the establishment of an outdoor nursery on site. 
Over to you, Suzanne. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks for the opportunity to present at the Oxford Botanic Gardens 400th Anniversary Symposium. Having celebrated our own 350th anniversary in 2020, we have centuries of research and education in common, and I'm delighted to be taking part in my role as Head of Education at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, or RBGE for short. I'm hoping that in my presentation today, I'll be able to showcase the breadth of our education offer and the important role we play in achieving the garden's mission of exploring, conserving and explaining the world of plants for a better future and our vision for a world that increasingly values, protects and benefits from plants. I'd also like to give you all an insight into the future of education at the garden and one particularly exciting project we're currently involved in. But before I do so, I must first set the scene by acknowledging the work we've undertaken in the last 18 months. When I joined RBGE in March 2020, I came in with the vision of transforming our educational provision, which already consisted of primary and secondary school programmes, an extensive suite of short courses, a degree and postgraduate courses delivered in partnership with academic institutions, as well as online learning courses and RBGE certified programmes in herbology and botanical illustration. Little did I know that on the 23rd of March 2020, that transition would literally take place overnight. Myself and the team, made up of 19 tutors, six online learning staff and five administrators, found ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic, where the priority became ensuring the continuity of provision for our hundreds of learners, as well as maintain, maintaining a high quality learning experience for all, from school pupils to tertiary students and those studying on RBGE programmes. This was no mean feat and is testament to the passion, commitment, skills and expertise of the education team at RBGE. This involved learning new skills to convey information to students in interactive formats and embracing working from home. Tutors found themselves capturing video, creating audio and editing images, not to mention getting to grips with new equipment and legislative requirements such as copyright and accessibility for the online world. Literally everything had to go online, including school resources to support homeschoolers with our resident black cat becoming an unofficial mascot for young learners exploring our new virtual resources. Although this approach was successful, we were mindful of the remaining digital divide, which meant not all students could access our activities in this way. And therefore, we also printed thousands of copies to be distributed via local food bank. Overall, our primary materials supported around 3000 learners during the first lockdown alone, a fact we are extremely proud of. We supported others during COVID by encouraging people to make positive use of their time whilst furloughed by offering discounted rates on our online courses and discovered that it wasn't only toilet rolls which were experiencing panic buying. Our RHS qualifications saw a huge uptake with over 2,000 students studying with us at the height of the pandemic. Never one to rest on our laurels, we also used the time productively to develop a brand new free online programme and I've read, I have already seen over 750 learners who have taken action for climate change by completing the Plants and Climate Change course. In amongst all these developments, our prior priority remained our students, and we continue to support them in completing their studies, with one of our greatest achievements being an online exhibition showcasing the culmination of our graduates' work in November 2020. So that is where we are now. And the reason for starting with such a recap is to emphasise the work involved in establishing a whole new era of educational delivery. With this in mind, we have taken this opportunity to evaluate the current learning offer and consider the needs of our learners post COVID. The effect of lockdown on people's reconnection with nature cannot be underestimated, and it's up to us to maximise this enhanced interest and appreciation of our planet to secure long term behaviour change. We also have a unique opportunity at RBGE to reimagine our education offer as we commence the largest project in the garden's 351 years, the Edinburgh Biomes Project. Edinburgh Biomes is a seven year construction and restoration project funded by philanthropic support and the Scottish Government, addressing the twin challenges of the climate emergency and biodiversity crisis. Simultaneously, it offers an opportunity to meet changing infrastructure needs and create facilities which adequately cater for our future students and generations of conservationists. 
the Biomes Project will reduce RBG's carbon footprint, create space for interdisciplinary collaborative research and build a new centre for excellence in plant health, not to mention protecting Scotland's heritage through the restoration of our iconic Grade A listed glass houses. Each one of these elements of the build offer an opportunity for further engagement and we are excited by the potential of this project, which has education at its very heart, offers to reimagine our offer during the next seven years. Reflecting on COVID and the significance of Edinburgh Biomes has resulted in several projects being developed to relaunch RBG's education in the coming months, with the aim of supporting green recovery and celebrating our future aspirations. Our plans have a particular focus on providing opportunities for graduates looking for continued study, those who have been made redundant and for those who have discovered new interests as a result of lockdown. Delivering programmes which help young people to identify new career opportunities to guarantee the future of horticultural practice and conservation horticulture. Educating learners as to how horticultural practice can have a direct impact on climate change and biodiversity loss and meeting the name, needs of a changed horticulture industry through ongoing CPD and employee upskilling in areas of urban greening which support green recovery. These plans include engaging with learners as early as possible through an outdoor nursery pilot, a refresh of the schools programme including a pick and mix approach to enable schools to combine online and on-site visits whenever possible. This provides the added advantage of being able to engage young learners over a longer period and subsequently gain a deeper insight into their learning and behaviours towards climate change and biodiversity loss. And the development of a virtual work placement for secondary school pupils. Covid not only reduced the learning opportunities for pupils at school, but also meant that many young adults didn't have access to work placements as they would normally within the Scottish education system around S4, 5 and 6, that's ages 16 to 18. Our online work experience resources aim to address this gap as does the development of apprenticeship and internship opportunities. Finally, we are also looking at the potential extension of our hybrid learning models. There is no doubt that a return to complete normality for education is not only unlikely but also undesirable. Utilising the lessons learned from the past months, there is scope to increase engagement with learners nationally and internationally by considering opportunities to deliver a fully online version of our flagship MSc and extend access to our HND BSc programme through online delivery of theory elements and completion of practical activities at any one of the three regional gardens, which are located in the Scottish Borders, Dumfries and Galloway and Argyll and Butte. So now I'd like to return to the outdoor nursery project I mentioned briefly earlier. Our wee garden has a simple overall goal, to inspire children to learn and to encourage them to inspire others to take action against the climate emergency. Welcome to Our Wee Garden. The project started with the quest for a suitable site within the garden, which is harder than you may think. We have 70 acres in Edinburgh, which is home to the National Botanical Collection, and we wanted to balance respect for the collection with space for the children to explore and lead their own learning. Eventually, we came across a small unused space next to an area known as the Garden of Tranquility, which aims to offer a safe space for older visitors and those with additional needs. By locating the nursery here, it was hoped that there may also be opportunities for intergenerational learning between the two groups using the space. All in all, it was ideal, but definitely needed a bit of work. With lots of hard work and help from our colleagues in horticulture and estates, we were able to transform the space into an exciting and stimulating learning environment where we now welcome around 20 children aged three to five, four days a week. We're working with two local nurseries on a six month pilot with key aims and objectives. We want to extend our reach to children as early as possible, instead of waiting until they reach primary school age around five years old. This will ensure we engage with them about nature from the very beginning. We want to increase the skill set of our talented education officers to enable them to engage with children of all ages and ability and to support Scottish Government's provision of 1,140 hours of free childcare by offering another early year setting in the form of our outdoor nursery. We want to show our local community that we are part of the lifelong learning journey by offering new opportunities for nursery children and perhaps even parent and toddler sessions. To protect the future of the garden and the planet by instilling a love of nature and commitment to taking action against climate change 
and to support our colleagues in other gardens by establishing guidelines and frameworks for early years delivery across the UK in botanical settings. Of equal importance is also the aspirations we have for the children themselves. We want them to develop a deep sense of belonging and subsequent respect for people, places and plants. To explore and engage in nature play, returning them to a time of risk taking where they can learn to manage their own behaviour in a safe and supported environment. To build a sense of self-belief and continued enjoyment of the outdoors throughout the seasons, which will have a positive impact on both their physical and mental well-being. To create a connection with the garden and a sense of ownership. We want the children to protect their garden with the aim of expanding that care to the planet more widely. We're very fortunate to be working with two highly experienced partners in the Outdoor Nursery Project, colleagues from both the University of Edinburgh and Thrive Outdoors, with the ultimate aim of answering one very simple question. Can you actually run an outdoor nursery in a botanic garden? Part of trying to answer this question will come in the weeks that follow as we review the lessons learned. So far, this has included the importance of starting small and ensuring you have the support of all colleagues. Watching the site before you commit to design to see how it behaves in wet, cold, windy and hot weather. Considering the need for a ground maintenance and management plan, as our wee garden offers little opportunity for site rotation, so ground maintenance is essential. Ensuring you have a dedicated early years practitioner is essential. This should be someone who cultivates positivity, isn't easily daunted and brings a flexible can-do approach. It's also important to learn more about initiatives such as Forest Kindergarten and Outdoor Learning for Early Years, which has been crucial to this project. Seek advice and support from the professionals in this field. And remember that running a nursery in a botanic garden is new to everyone, so clarify expectations from all parties early on and be sure to highlight the importance of garden specifics such as biosecurity and botanical knowledge, which may be an unknown to those participating in the pilot. The pilot will end in March 2022 and the accompanying research will be finalised shortly afterwards. During the summer of 2022, we're hoping to make recommendations as to what our early year provision should look like in the future. This could take many different forms, from a private on-site nursery hosted by RBGE themselves, to a satellite setting for an existing nursery or a bookable space for any early years group. Whatever the outcome, our core purpose remains the same to offer a variety of educational programmes which meet the needs of all. After all, our future is in their hands. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. It is my pleasure now to welcome back all speakers from this event to join me for the panel Q&A session. Nearly there. There we go. Hello, everybody. Oh, wait, we're missing one. Where is Suzanne? Here she comes. There we are. Hi, Suzanne. So thank you, everybody, um, for your contributions to that session. It was really wonderful. And I would like to kick things off. Um, because this conference is digital and in a, a normal, you know, a normal year or a normal two years, as we're soon approaching, we may have tried to have do, done a symposium like this in person at Oxford. Digital learning has really kind of taken a stride in the last few years and we've reached new audiences. Um, and I guess my question for all of us is, we know that there's amazing reach potential as seen, for example, with the, the SAPS course, which had 3000 attendees, that's amazing. How do we get the balance right though, between reaching these new audiences with digital platforms and still bringing the physical plants in because we know the, the impact that the, the physical plants has on people's engagement. Could I um, start with Jonathan? <laughs> yes, you can. Um, I think it's hybrid, isn't it? I think that's the answer that we're getting from education is that we have to do both. I think what I think, though, is we have to do more talking to each other. And I actually think 
Um, it's quite interesting looking at the questions that we've had not many questions in this session compared to the research questions uh, sessions. And I'm just wondering if we need to do more we have need more joined up botanists in the sense of all botanists should be thinking about education if they're researchers and all all education should be thinking about research if they're so i i think we need some kind of association of botanists in a way that will actually allow us all to be thinking about these issues so i i it doesn't answer your question um <laughs> but it i think i think it is about communication at all levels um and then we can put together our, our different experiences. That's my thought. What about you, Suzanne? Uh, what does the RHS think about the sort of digital uh, and physical overlaps? I think it's really interesting, isn't it? And I think we're all we're all figuring it out as we go along, really. I think we're not sure we've we've gone through that uh, the period of doing everything or most things on site. And then we were all forced into doing everything online. Um, and now we're all trying to find what is that balance. And I don't think, I, I certainly don't have that answer yet. And I'm not sure any, anyone does yet. And we're all find, feeling our way. But I guess um, it gives us a lot of opportunity to kind of to um, investigate that and to now talk to all of our um, all of our stakeholders like schools and our visitors to our gardens to see what they want. Um, because I know lots of people have found lots of the things that we've done online so much more accessible. I mean, there you you have I assume you're now over a thousand people signed up for this symposium. That's incredible, and the accessibility of that knowledge that would not have been available um, if it was a, an in-person event is is brilliant. But at the same time, it's different audiences. So you're right. So for for kids, um, that hands-on experience with plants will always be um you know just such an amazing thing so bring them to gardens where possible but actually you know it is great if they can't come we found that we were reaching so many more schools mm. when we did our teaching online um during the pandemic so i think it's, it is as jonathan says it's about finding that balance um and if anyone finds it let me know <laughs> i guess the same must be true for saps as well you've and so many online and in-person events you must have some wonderful data sets <laughs> well, well um, it's a really interesting question and, and i don't think there's a single answer to that um, question i think you know different audience types um like different types of ways of interacting we, we did some really interesting work um because of lockdown where we did um a train the trainer event so that's trying to train uh the trainers of the future teachers so working with initial teacher education um, and we actually did something a bit like a cook along where we had a bunch of um, teacher trainers dotted all over the UK um, listening to our suggestions for some really exciting practical like investigative ideas that you can use in the classroom so they can relay those onto their trainees when they're back in, in their, their sessions. Um, but they all did it from home. So we, we I mean, Alex spent hours, you know, days, weeks, possibly planning this, it was far more complicated and time consuming than just doing a bog standard face to face event. But actually, again, that accessibility was massively increased. And I think for us, um, often what we get, we get a spark um, ignited at some of those events that we run. And what we're looking for is that meaningful moment where, they're, where people are re-engaging with plants, particularly teachers and teacher trainers, and they've been often they've been teaching for such a long time they're kind of they're bogged down in the kind of standard stuff and and they're not actually able to, to excel and enjoy teaching the, the wonder that is plant biology or, or any element of biology so giving that opportunity i think whether that is online or remotely or hybrid for that meaningful connection i think is really important um, for, for, for the way that we want to work Definitely, thank you. And Suzanne, there's more of a, a targeted question for you here at RBG. Um, reaching children about the importance of plants is very important. And I feel this works well for you because your nursery project, Our Wee Garden, is just wonderful. And the question is, um, what can gardens do to support adults who are parents and encourage them to motivate their children? And I feel your nursery project was just such a nice link here of how we can support parents can you think of any other ways that we can support parents to motivate their children to engage with plants yeah absolutely it's one of the things we were really aware of was that when we were starting to talk with the nurseries it was really important that we had the parents on board as well and um, so we did a lot of work with the nurseries to kind of 
educate the parents as to what was happening. And we're still working through that, to be honest, because there's definitely a, a gap in the kind of understanding. So, you know, we still have parent helpers turning up in trainers and, you know, white trousers and they're going into a muddy field. And, you know, we're trying to educate them as we go along. Um, but the other thing is we've done some surveys with some of the parents as well, and they're very open and honest to the fact that they have a lack of knowledge and lack of understanding that they want help with. So I think mm. there's a couple of things. One thing we're looking at is a possible parent and toddler event, so a sort of group where um, parents come along with their children as early as possible so that we start getting them on board early. The other thing is sort of parent and child workshops then actually the older children can come along and, and do something together with their parents. So um, one of the things we're looking at is sort of a, a tea course, you know, so they could come along and with a herbologist make um, a sort of fruit infusion themselves um, and then take it away. And it's something that they're actually working on together. So we're very aware that that is an issue and we're trying to resolve it that way. Fascinating. <laughs> Jonathan? Yeah, could I just add a couple of things? I think that's great yes. what Suzanne's just said. Um, but I think what, when we talk to, to people that like plants, very often they like plants because of their grandparents or their parents. So I think we mustn't forget that. Maybe we've lost that a bit in, in recent decades. But also you can view it the other way around, that excited kids going back, having experienced plants, can take some back into the, the home. And also just looking at the older level, I, I talked to students recently in relation to our Botanical University Challenge um, uh, project that we're developing. And it's <laughs> students like plants. I mean, I think we must be very careful, and I've done this myself a bit, just to assume that people, you know, they, all students are going to find plants boring. They're <laughs> not. They are not. A lot of uh, zoology and other um, professors might consider that students are going to find plants boring. And a lot of higher level academics, uh, particularly in management, will say we can't have that plant degree because there aren't enough students. Well, I mean, um, in, in that sense, I think we need to be looking in, uh, um, about uh, the sort of um, uh, plant animal microbe um, story. I think that's a really important point that we, we, we're not necessarily looking for, um, you know, uh, 70, million, 70 million botanists, but we are looking for 70 million um, uh, or, or lots of people who are aware that the plants are part of this amazing um, tapestry. And I think the ant plant talk was just a, a stunner of a, an example to show, to remind us that and also that could be used in education. So a few thoughts there garbled but thrown in. Yes, I must admit the ant plant is a favourite of mine to crack out when schools come because um, it doesn't necessarily grab their attention if they are walking around the glass houses yeah. by themselves. And so being able to kind of pick up this unusual looking thing and, and tell this range of stories really does stories. make them look at the plants that they would usually ignore, which is very powerful. Uh, Suzanne, I've got a a question for yourself about um, qualifications. You mentioned the T levels, which were fascinating. And one listener or audience member is looking for advice on what you might recommend a young person should look for in order to have a career in horticulture, perhaps pre T levels. What sort of starting route could they take before taking a T level, as it were? That's a really good question. And I think um, T levels don't come with any particular uh, entry requirements. So it and they, as I said, they're so broad mm. that they give you the opportunity to, to have a taste of lots of different areas of horticulture. Um, same with apprenticeships, depending on where you go. Um, and, you know, we know I mentioned in my talk that there are so many different areas of horticulture that you can go into. You can go into botany or you can go into creative pursuits or research or education or journalism. So really, um, I would just suggest that people focus on what they're interested in. If they're interested in creativity and taking that into horticulture, that they that they study those things. It really is um, very individual, I would say. Yeah, no, definitely. I think a general a general passion will be an excellent starting point and exploring more of what they enjoy as well. I found um, the list of subjects that you put down as sort of you know needing more skills, including soil science, fascinating. Because I remember doing a soil science module at university and. I'm not really engaging with it at the time. It just wasn't for me. By contrast, my, my friend absolutely loved it, thought it was riveting. And um, it's such an important part of the sort of plant health system now that, yeah, you just go where, where your interests take you. Um, 
Alex and Dan, I've got one for you guys. Um, what do you think SAP's major achievement has been over the last sort of three decades? And what is your biggest challenge now um, to achieving your aims in the future? Um, so uh, we saw that question come in. I think I know who asked that question. Um, so thank you, Jonathan. Um, I mean, it's a really, really good question. SAPS, so SAPS has been going since 1989, when a teacher approached the Gatsby Foundation to try and get some exciting ways to get more plants into the classroom. And ever since then, we've been very much based in the practical work um, area of trying to get more plant science into the school classroom through lots of really good plant science activities. Not the bubbling pondweed that doesn't work, but the <laughs> way of using pondweed that does work. Um, the ways of, of getting really active and interesting ideas of using plants so that that initial kind of introduction to plants in the secondary classroom isn't a failure or is, is something that engages young people. So, so some of our successes, I, I, I guess, I mean, I can't take credit for all of these by a long way because I've only been part of the programme for 10 years, but um, parts of the national uh, curriculum um, and the specifications that followed on from that have got mention of specific activities that we've worked with teachers to develop over the years. Those are really workable examples. They're affordable, they're engaging, they work every time. Um, those are real successes to, that, that are core compulsory parts of the activities that teachers have to do now. And that, that's really, um, a really a testament to those teachers that we've worked with over the years to develop some fantastic teaching ideas. Um, I, I think some of the challenges that we face um, are to do with the way that the curriculum is assessed, that focus on content and not understanding, and that's far, far bigger than uh, just applied science. That goes across biology. But I think that's where some of the work that we're trying to do at the moment, that I, I mentioned in the video earlier, um, about helping teachers and uh, the curriculum designers to see that plants can be used throughout biology to exemplify ideas, to demonstrate topics, to, to draw on a wider variety of living organisms through your compulsory biology teaching is a really important thing to do because that will help people appreciate that plants have you know, a significant place in, in the world and the way it works and the way we can use them to help solve some of those global challenges that have been discussed earlier. Um, Alex, I don't know if you, you've got a few ideas that you uh, um, might want to put forward there as well. Um, yeah, I was just going to add to that that point, that last point you were saying that, you know, it's about developing well-rounded biologists as well, biologists who think about 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 concepts and applying their, bio, their biology knowledge to a biological problem, no matter what kingdom that is in. Um, and so having examples from across different kingdoms really makes makes an impact there. Um, I mean, on a, I certainly are thinking about those challenges on a, on a practical level. One of the things we do a lot of is engaging with initial teacher education. And um, our understanding is and ha it ha there has been a move towards decentralizing that um, and that, that our understanding is there's an expectation that that might be further decentralized. So um, more school based initial teacher education rather than um, based in higher education institutions. And that makes it really hard for us to reach those trainee teachers. It's, um, there are a lot more pressures on, on those training situations. It's much harder for us to reach them. So on that sort of day-to-day -day getting our projects done level, that's, that's tough because we don't, we just, how do we get that information to, to the, the teachers who really want it and want to use it, but we can't contact them. Yeah, uh, interesting point, absolutely. Um, we're coming towards the end, so I'd like to wrap up with, with one final question that's been submitted, which is, um, collectively, do you guys think that there's a fundamental problem within the curriculum not containing enough plant material, or is it more of a problem that the material isn't being utilised correctly? Jonathan, do you want to start things off? Well, I, th I think... <laughs> I agree with that, uh, but I think there are others that are better qualified. I mean, we looked into this for the for the symposium. We did an, an curriculum analysis, and Dan was quite right when he said that there's actually quite a lot of plants in the curriculum, but um, it might not be very interesting, or it might not be very well done, or the teachers may not be feel confident to do it. And I, so I think there's lots of different ways, but there's no doubt. I mean, we have to do everything we can 
Um, um, and, and the stuff SAPS is doing is, is one very important element, getting plants in the classroom, which is the, 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 the topic of the video that I mentioned. Um, you know, there are lots of different things we can do, but there is no doubt that it's 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 more. Yeah, there is there is an issue of, of, of curriculum. And I do think this joining up of plants, animals and microbes for the future. And I've talked with Dan about this before, I'm sure with the SAPS group, that this is something that people are thinking about. In a way that's more important but there are lots of different ways that we need to be making the plants that are there uh, more relevant more interesting more exciting because we've seen from here and we know it's preaching to the converted but preaching to the unconverted and and showing the the absolute fascination and how important the examples are to 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 explain you know to seeing how plants cope with the same um uh, uh struggles the same the same challenges that animals do but they do it in very different off, sometimes similar but often very different ways and that can be fabulous so it's opening the door and using all the different opening the window but using lots of different approaches does anyone have anything else they would like to add to that one before i uh, draw us to a, a close just quickly if i may i think yeah i think they're really good points um, it's almost an academic point, isn't it? Because we can say, yeah, we'd love more plants in the curriculum, we'd love horticulture as a GCSE, but the likelihood of that happening is very low. Um, and we've been told that, you know, repeatedly by the government. And we can continue to lobby for that. And, you know, it would come with a lot of issues of its own um, that we would have to surmount and do a big promotion campaign on horticulture so that, um, so that it became popular, taught and accessible to all levels of students. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there is, as Jonathan and Dan have said, there is lots of scope within the current cur curriculum. We just have to take advantage of that currently. Thank you. Um, we've had some questions throughout this session that we just don't have time to get to today. If I could ask you guys to have a little look through them and you can type your answers and that will make it visible to the rest of the audience. That would be fabulous. Um, it's now time for us to take a... 10 minute break. Yes, we will be back at 20 past seven with our keynote speaker for the evening, William Friedman. We'll see you soon. Thank you.
Welcome back everybody and after two really wonderful um, sessions this afternoon we've reached the um, final talk of the day and our second keynote lecture which is given by Ned Friedman, Arnold Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Harvard and Director of the Arnold Arboretum. Ned's talk is entitled, The Magic and Meaning of a Garden of Trees. And Ned, very much looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Over to you. And hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, if not, I, I assume someone uh, behind the controls will yell at me and, and let me know. But it's a great pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon and this evening, uh, depending on where you are in the time zone, uh, to wrap up uh, today's incredibly interesting sessions, uh, this morning's research uh, in gardens, as well as this afternoon's uh, very one, uh, uplifting uh, discussions of education and educational opportunities at gardens uh, has been a tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, and inspiring group of presentations. So I'm at the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University, and uh, you can see our magnificent part of our magnificent Magnolia collection uh, in this image. Um, and I just want to congratulate Oxford Botanic Gardens uh, for uh, reaching 400. Uh, in America, the uh, idea that there would be a garden 400 years old uh, obviously has not crossed our minds yet. Uh, the Arnold Arboretum uh, of Harvard University was actually the first public arboretum uh, to be established uh, in the new world. And as you can see here from some of the early artwork, uh, we were established uh, in 1872, meaning that although we're not hitting 400, we are hitting 150 in uh, 2022 next year. So we too will be having quite a bit of celebrating to do, as well as hard thinking about what the next 150 years mean to the Arnold Arboretum uh, and our constituencies. So for those of you who have not been to the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University, uh, let me just tell you that uh, Harvard University is spread across the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, which is where most people see, would normally uh, visit Harvard University, where Harvard College is. And this is in Cambridge, but uh, the Business School, the Medical School, the School of Public Health, uh, and also the Arnold Arboretum are all across the river from uh, uh, Cambridge in Boston itself. And so the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University is about six miles uh, away from uh, the center uh, sort of campus of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Our founding has a rather interesting story, which goes all the way back to 1842, when a good deal of land that had been acquired essentially by a gentleman farmer uh, who had been a merchant and a trader uh, bequeathed this land uh, to Harvard University. Uh, but without any funding, uh, the land basically sat uh, until 1872, when a wealthy uh, whaling merchant from New Bedford uh, actually gave funds to create the first endowments of the Arnold Arboretum. And uh, that was our year of founding. In 1873, the first director of the Arnold Arboretum was appointed, and that was Charles Sprague Sargent. Uh, I sometimes am amazed to think that I'm only the eighth director of the Arnold Arboretum in its 149 year history. Sargent was a man of enormous appetites and aspiration, and he immediately turned to Frederick Law Olmsted to design with him the Arnold Arboretum. For those of you who uh, may be wondering who Frederick Law Olmsted is, he was one of the co-designers of Central Park in New York City, one of his first actual uh, landscape and park design. And in the 1880s, late 1870s and early 1880s, he created a magnificent canvas on which the Arnold Arboretum would be built in terms of reading the terrain, uh, learning uh, how to think about the movements of people within the, the Arboretum and its grounds. And uh, this remains one of his great masterpieces of park and landscape design uh, to this very day, and very much uh, kept to his original uh, designs and plans. 
Now, when they were creating Harvard's Museum of Trees, both Sargent and Olmsted, but particularly Sargent, was convinced that uh, they would require a, a funding to really build all of the roadway systems and everything else. And they turned to the city of Boston and thought that if it could be incorporated into the park system that was being built, uh, that they could form a unique partnership. And in doing so, Harvard granted all of the land of the Arnold Arboretum uh, to the city of Boston to become part of its park system. And we took a lease that was a thousand year lease back uh, to control the property and to run this wonderful arboretum, which is also uh, a free uh, everyday part of the public park system here in Boston. So even though we're only 150, I can tell you by design, we are supposed to exist for at least 2000 years. And we're just in the infancy of our journey uh, as a garden, an arboretum and a public park. Harvard controls the property, as I mentioned, and maintains the living collections and landscapes. So everyone who works here is, is someone who is at Harvard. We have roughly 16,000 accessioned woody plants and roughly 2,100 temperate woody plant species. It is an extraordinary crew of horticulturalists and arborists, some of the best in the world. And uh, as a landscape and as a collection of museum objects, uh, it is an inspiration, I think, to all who visit. To give you some idea of the quality of our collections, we are taxonomically arranged. We are home to 62 different species of Acer, of maples. This is an enormous uh, quantity of species when you think about the fact that many maples would not be able to grow in Boston because they're subtropical. But in fact, this is the finest collection of maples in the world. And this is true of many of our taxonomic collections. We have been circling the world, uh, particularly going to Asia, where there is the highest level of biodiversity of temperate woody plants anywhere, uh, to collect and bring these plants back to Boston to grow on our grounds. And here you can see from our archives in 1908, uh, part of a, a three-year expedition led by the Englishman, Ernest Henry Wilson, who was then hired, who had worked for Veatch, and then was hired by the Arnold Arboretum and spent the rest of his career at the Arnold Arboretum as a great collector and um, uh, an amazing plants person. But we continue to this day to circle the globe. Uh, right now we're in the midst, except for the uh, pandemic, of collecting and usually launching four or five major expeditions per year to Japan, uh, to China in conservation and efforts, uh, and also heavily in uh, the southeastern US where our biodiversity hotspot is uh, for temperate woody plants. You can read more about what we're doing to add another several hundred uh, taxa to our living collections to make it even stronger over the long part. If you go to our, our uh, Arnold Arboretum publication, Arnoldia. Importantly, in 2011, I opened up a brand new 45,000 square foot research facility right on the grounds, meaning that one can be working in the trees and back collecting DNA or on a microscope within a matter of minutes. And we now have roughly 100 different research projects in the living collections every year. I am one of three professors at Harvard whose research program is based in this building uh, with my graduate students, postdocs, and technicians. So that's a little bit of background about the Arnold Arboretum, and I invite all of you to visit uh, should you get the chance to be in Boston. Now on to the, the main topic. I want to reflect a little bit on the world that we live in and how we see plants. For me, plants in the Anthropocene have become a remarkable set of images that always seem to peer through the world of green involving satellites. Here, a satellite image from NASA, uh, perhaps another satellite image showing uh, all of the tropical rainforests and the deep green of South America, all of the deforestation caused by all of the fires that are burning uh, in, 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 the, in Brazil and, and elsewhere. Um, these incredible images that basically give us walls of pixelated green. At the same time that we live in this environmental age that has been shaped by human activity, it's fair to say that we live in the, what I call the genomocene. And in the genomocene, I think we look at plants through the letters A, T, C, and G, strings of base pairs along this wonderful molecule DNA. We look at chromosomes, we unwind them, we find the uh, letters, we figure out the genes, we assemble, we compare, and we create phylogenies. But again, plants in all of these endeavors become mere abstractions. We see plants in this day through the lens of technology too frequently, 
and plants have become, as I said, an abstraction. My question, where are the organisms? And I want to bring Johann Wolfgang von Goethe into the uh, discussion today, uh, because of course there is much to learn from him uh, and his interactions with organisms and plants. As many of you will know, in the 1780s, he got rather sick of his duties in the Weimar uh, Republic and took off for Italy. And he ended up writing a wonderful book, one of my favorites, Italian Journey. He made all kinds of observations in Italy of, of museums, uh, art museums, of architecture, uh, for which he's well known. But in this book, you will find many observations of natural history. Today, I watched the amusing behavior of the mussels, limpets, and crabs. What an amazing thing a living organism is. How adaptable, how there, and how itself. How useful to my knowledge of natural history, scrappy though it is, has been to me and how I look forward to increasing it. And as he wrote from Rome in 1787, while working, walking in the public gardens of Palermo, it came to me in a flash that in the organ of the plant, which we are accustomed to call the leaf, lies the true Proteus who can hide or reveal himself in vegetal forms. From first to last, the plant is nothing but leaf. So Goethe went to the gardens to see his organisms in the form of plants. And of course, this led to his landmark publication in 1790 on the metamorphosis of plants, which really was the birth of the discipline of plant morphology. So again, taking inspiration from Goethe and Italian journey, he also wrote, to wander about among a vegetation which is new to one is pleasant and instructive. It is the same with familiar objects. In the end, we cease to think about them at all. What is seeing without thinking? And this is a really elegant way of saying that all too often we live in a world which is plant blind, that we suffer from plant blindness, that although we are surrounded with plants, we don't see them. We simply do not take them in as individual organisms that are surrounding us worthy of observation. So here is a, a look down at the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University, my office and laboratory are in this new research area. And I actually only live just two blocks from the Arnold Arboretum. And I've been wandering the grounds for nearly 11 years with just a pocket camera in hand to meet the organisms here. Uh, I won't probably get to all 16,000, I suspect, and photograph them, look at these images, reflect on them, and just to show you where I've been, I try to wander as much as I can aimlessly. I have been the blue dots show you uh, where I, uh, organisms for which I have taken a picture. To date, of the 16,000 accessions we have here, I'm almost up to 3,000. I won't live long enough to get uh, even halfway and almost up to 13,000 images, all of which are posted in our image database. If you want to have an image uh, for teaching purposes or anything else, of witch hazel flowers in the winter in flower, uh, just go to our plant image search function and dial it in with hemimelis. So I want to reflect on my obsessions uh, for the rest of the uh, time here uh, through the four seasons that make Arboretum such wonderful places. Unlike a lot of botanical gardens that really uh, in some ways uh, slow down in the winter, uh, Looking at trees in the winter uh, with snow on them is absolutely every bit as good as being here in the spring, summer, or fall. So let's begin with winter. There's nothing quite like a blizzard in the Arnold Arboretum, and I remember this blizzard well. Uh, this is about six years ago. We're looking into the pine collection. Uh, the snow is flying sideways. Almost everything is monochromatic. And then the next day, the skies opened up. And I went back to look at the next door neighbor spruces and firs against a deep blue sky. And I realized the genius of Frederick Law Olmsted with these reveals around these Olmstedian curves. But one thing I always love to do in the winter, uh, beyond looking at the architecture of the bones of trees, is to go and seek out bark. And I just want to share over the last many years, the smooth barks I've met uh, in abstraction, I'd like to think, at the Arnold Arboretum. 
I love uh, the barks of the snake bark maples, which you may know are all Asian, except for one species that made that biogeographic journey from Asia to North America and settled in as Acer pensylvanicum. But these are some remarkable organisms, and uh, they are aptly named the snake bark maples because they have that beautiful smooth skin with the waxes that look like snake skin. They need not be green. Some of them are, depending on the time of the year, white and orangish yellow, peach, lime, a little bit of olive here in our, our North American species, Acer pensylvanicum. And then there is the magnificent smooth barked uh, Acer grissium, the paper bark maple that uh, we first received uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, an incredible bark that peels, and when the sun is low in the, uh, in the horizon, the peels of bark light up as if on fire as the sun passes through them. And in abstraction, it is a magnificent thing to stand next to a paper bark maple uh, in the winter uh, on a sunny day. And then I wander into the uh, beautiful birch collections and we see the whites with the lenticels, the creams of different species, or over to the lilacs to see the beautiful uh, olives and oranges and browns and tans, or to cornice to our wonderful uh, dogwoods uh, with their reds and uh, their mottled barks like the Coosa dogwood here or to our Stewardia collection, which really is showing us patina, what I think of as patina. The dark, um, beautiful brown that you see in the center being the most recently exposed bark, and the lighter flight uh, uh, segments that you see around it reflecting older sections of bark in which the upper portion had peeled earlier, and they have acquired and dulled over time, uh, essentially aging into this older set of colors and slightly different textures. But here we have another species of Stewardia, again, reminding me something of, of lizard skin uh, and, and beautiful plates uh, that peel independently. And here, Pseudo Stewardia pseudocamellia, again, with much more recently revealed bark in the center and the deep gray patina of older bark showing on the surface. And occasionally I'm just shocked by what I see here in the elm family, the Zelkovas from, from China. In the winter, they begin to approach what I think of as tree giraffes with large sections of bright orange barks, uh, all surrounded by, of course, the browner or tanner uh, barks. But sometimes at their peak in January, they truly are uh, spotted with blotches of, of brilliant orange. Or Halesia with its stripes and dark uh, sort of ruby red uh, alternating with stripes of white. And perhaps my favorite, one that I've been going to observe every winter as well as other seasons, but most intense in the winter, is the lace bark pine, Pinus bungiana, with the reds and the greens, the flaking and the aging. But sometimes a different specimen will throw orange and lime green. And perhaps the most breathtaking view I ever saw of a lace bark pine in the winter, here with silvers, grapefruit rind, uh, reds, and you can see up above the beginning of a peel here that will reveal new younger bark below. Uh, it's a magical tree. North and south facing parts of the trunk look different if you just go around 180 degrees, and they change through the seasons. They are truly dynamic. But in winter, in my view, bark is the thing to see, and this is an obsession of mine. Of course, the London Plain with its interesting textures, almost like some sort of abstract set of lines that, that are grooved into these very smooth barks and the unusual shapes uh, that uh, always uh, delight my eye, at least, uh, that show up when you just approach the trees. Now, spring is a magnificent time to come to the Arnold Arboretum. And if we do our job correctly, we don't have to tell people to be joyful. People and children will do cartwheels if our cherries are on show and healthy, and if we've done our pruning correctly. And I can tell you, we end up, especially during the pandemic, we've had since the beginning of the pandemic, roughly four or five million visitors on the grounds of the Arnold Arboretum, and we never closed for a single minute uh, of, of the past two years. Of course, our crabapple collection, one of the finest in the world, is magnificent in the spring, and people come from everywhere to see it. 
But I am after other game in the spring, not that I don't love the crab apples. And I am after conifer cones. And most people will think of pine cones or other conifer cones when they think of them and conjure an image, they're thinking of mature cones. For example, this Table Mountain Pine uh, and its beautiful umbos and sharp prickles, uh, but with a patina of brown or gray. Uh, this is a serotonous species, so these are very old cones. But when conifer cones emerge from bud in the spring, every year I know that spring has arrived when the first of the larix or large species open up and they are anything but brown. That is the only color you will not find in a conifer cone. You find pinks, reds, purples. And here you have a Siberian larch with its beautiful cone. This is the seed cone just after the bud is burst. And this is an ephemeral set of events. At most, this will be around for a week with this color before it fades or transitions to green and then ultimately to other darker colors. Here is another species of larix with a ruby red uh, set of colors uh, upon cone emergence and some waxes you can see on the back. And another species uh, here, you see Kempferi of Larch uh, against a beautiful blue sky uh, in April. And Sudasuga, the Douglas fir, actually one of the most dramatic cones. And this cone is at least an inch uh, in overall length with these incredible uh, bracts uh, with the long pointed teeth, uh, something to be seen and sought out every spring. And if you wait too long, matter of weeks, this very same cone that you saw with this great brilliant set of pinks becomes green with little fringes of red and ultimately brown. It's an ephemeral set of things to seek out. And then after all of that, we turn to the spruces and the spruces are really a magnificent collection at the Arnold Arboretum. We have well over 20 species. Uh, here is Picea jesuensis uh, with the magnificent cones as well as the flushing needles. Uh, and the waxes on the actual bracts that subtend the ovuliferous scales. Picea wilsonii with its little cap of bud scales. Picea lichiangensis from China, magnificent, literally glowing. And these are large cones, at least an inch and a quarter in length. Uh, just extraordinary to see a tree lit up uh, with these cones on a sunny day but they aren't always all red. Some of it is environmental, some of it is genetic, but here we have a plain old Norway spruce lit up in yellow with a little bit of pink at the top. And another Norway spruce, which is a little bit of yellow at the bottom with much more pink at the top and a fringe, if you look at the yellow oviliferous scales, a fringe of pink on the margins of each scale. And here is one from another tree, it's just showing you how much variation there can be just within a species growing on our grounds in color. This is Picea abies again, all red, no yellow. And here the dragon spruce, Picea aspirata, uh, with magnificent large cones, uh, just beautiful, brilliant reds. But lest you think that every spruce is going to be red, uh, this year I finally got a chance to see uh, the uh, dragon tail spruce, Picea, Picea palita. And there, in glowing in the sun, were beautiful ovulifer scales subtended by small bracts that were basically a lime green. And in abstraction, just magnificent to come back to, but only for a week. And if I miss them this year, I have to wait another year. So the cones of the Ardell Arboretum in the spring are the thing that I have ritualized to a certain extent, and I continue to be surprised. The pines come on with their darker red and purple as they flush. Here you see the Mugo pine just at the point of bud break with the scales and the ovulus uh, scales and the bracts. And then finally, the firs. Here we have the Korean fir, only green. And this year, something I had never seen before, the Himalayan fern, uh, here a small specimen, uh, essentially almost jet black cones with a beautiful glow of purple when you get a little closer. This was something I had not anticipated. And fortunately it was a young tree so I could see the cones uh, and it may have been one of the first years that it actually reproduced, but it took my breath away. It was the highlight of my spring. Then we move into summer. And I think of all of the greenness of the grounds and an arboretum is just embodiment of leaves and photosynthesis and a good deal still of flowering going on. 
But for me, there's a regular uh, ritual that I uh, visit the rhododendrons and I look at Vissen threads. And many people will say, I've never heard of a Vissen thread. And as a graduate student, I had read all about what Vissen threads are, and I'm going to tell you what they are in a second. But it's one thing to intellectualize something in a paper or a book, and it's another thing to see it. And through the years from my graduate school, school days on, I had never done anything except know about them. I had never seen them. And I'd never sought them out, frankly. And then one day I went after the rain had stopped at the Arnold Arboretum to look at rhododendrons to see the droplets on the surfaces of the various flowers and the leaves. And I took this picture of a Chinese rhododendron species, rhododendron fortunii. And I came back and as I do with each image, I uh, that evening look at it, I frame it up, I think about it, I reflect, and I notice something very strange. Here is, of course, you've got the petals, you've got this beautiful green long style and stigma, and then around it you have the male parts, the stamens, and these are the anthers. And I looked and I noticed that the anthers had something coming out of them, and I started to look more carefully. And here on a sunny day, I found that coming out of each anther was a string of pollen grains joined one to the other by what I had read about, which is a mechanical structure called a Vissen thread. And in this species, the Vissen threads must be very strong. If I just tap the flower, each of the anthers will pour out all of its contents in a single string of pollen grains. Here they are again, and you can see these are poricidal anthers. This means that when they are releasing their pollen, they literally pop off a cap and open up a pore. And if they're just jiggled a little bit, they end up pouring out beautiful uh, strings of pollen grains, more beautiful than any pearl necklace or diamond necklace you could see in the finest of Tiffany's or any jewelry store in London, for example. And here they are close up again, these beautiful chains. It turns out all rhododendron species do this. But how many of you have actually walked by a rhododendron and seen it? And yet all of us have been in gardens with rhododendrons in flower. And here they are. I did put them under my stereo microscope to show you what the pores look like. And, and here you can just pull them right out uh, by running your finger across the pore. They just literally uh, stick to your finger. There is the entire content of a single uh, chamber of an anther uh, from rhododendron fortunii. And again, under the stereo microscope, they're actually tetrads of pollen grains. And let me show you now the beautiful wiry coil of Vissen threads that I'd read about as a young man uh, many years ago, but got to see for the first time by accident, by wandering and looking at organisms in the Arnold Arboretum. And here they are under the scanning electron microscope. But this is something any of us can do if we make our mind up to go to a garden or to our backyards and interact with a rhododendron. And now I wanna take you to autumn, which is the season we're in now. And at the Arnold Arboretum, if you come to the second highest point in Boston, which is not a particularly high point, Nevertheless, you have a beautiful view over our 281 acres uh, to see the skyline of Boston and the trees across the property uh, in their various shades of green, um, browns, golds, uh, and everything else. And if you come to our hickory collections with the light low in the sky in the late afternoon, you walk in an understory that's dark and you look up and you see the shocks of gold in the hickories uh, lit up, uh, literally glowing. Uh, and it is a magnificent thing to take in. So I'd like to emphasize how important it is to look up during the fall. Uh, it's wonderful to have vistas, but sometimes you just need to get under a tree. And I've been doing this for years, and I do it actually in the winter. I do it actually in the spring too. But the fall is quite a wonderful time to just get under a tree. And here you have one of the willow oak uh, just starting to get its beautiful colors, but you get the architecture. And on a sunny day, you get the glow of the leaves. Our sweet gums, one of my favorite specimens here, a massive specimen with beautiful bark uh, and that beautiful characteristic of having fully green leaves at the same time that you have fully uh, gold leaves, uh, but great architecture. And here, one of our hickories uh, with its dark brown bark and uh, its glowing uh, canopy of gold. And another one of our hickories uh, with its incredibly large compound leaves uh, just glowing in our collections. And here, the golden larch from China, 
uh, with this beautiful monopodial form uh, straight up into the sky and yellow green uh, of the needles and the short shoots uh, aglow. And I just sometimes park myself for a little while to contemplate things. Uh, here, just a beautiful sugar maple uh, with its great color uh, in the fall or the reds of the black oak uh, here at the Arnold Arboretum at that perfect moment when every leaf just seems to be as red as it could possibly be, or the smoke tree against the blue sky, or the ginkgo lit up by the sun at its peak, or the dawn redwood. And the Arnold Arboretum was the first garden in the world to have seeds come from China after its discovery being alive uh, in the 1940s. We received our first seeds uh, in 1948 in January, and we have the oldest trees in cultivation still here on the grounds outside of China. And as simple as a plain old red maple leaf is always well framed at the end of the year in the fall against a blue sky. The fruits are always on show in the fall in an arboretum, even if it's just a simple hawthorn with the old sepals and the old uh, curled remnants of the stamens and the filaments, they're quite beautiful. Or the viburnums against a blue sky, or something like the catalpas. And I do love catalpas and their wild long fruits uh, just framed by nothing but blue or Eliagnus with its amazing peltate uh, hairs, uh, trichomes on the fruits, or something that's throwing a late flower like this uh, Chinese abelia, or something that's not throwing a late flower too, but the fall flowering American species of Hamamelis, Hamamelis or witch hazel virginiana, uh, which is normally flowering in the fall. Uh, the only witch hazel, in fact, the rest all flower uh, in, the spring, in the winter. So I want to finish by just talking about one single organism in this collection at the Arnold Arboretum and a magnificent mutant, the sun and the moon. And I go back to Aristotle in the fourth century BCE. He wrote, why is it uh, and that an eclipse of the sun, if one looks at it through a sieve or through leaves such as a plane tree or other broadleaf tree, or if one joins the fingers of one hand over their fi the fingers of the other, the rays are crescent-shaped where they reach the earth. This was from his Problematica. And we have this wonderful European beach. It's, this, it's a, a, a mutant form, Tortuosa, that grows in the wild in France, Germany, and in Poland and populations there. This was a gift to us from uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Kew in 1888, and we've been taking care of it ever since. And on a specific day that you can see listed in the bottom right, I went to this tree because there was going to be a solar eclipse in New England. And I knew the bark would be smooth, and if I just sat there quietly alone, even though there were people everywhere, under this one tree, I would begin to see the moon carve out the sun into crescents that were caused by the pinholes of the leaves as acting as pinhole cameras in the canopy above my head. And here you can see the solar eclipse rotating through um, beautifully uh, with this incredible moon cutting out the sun uh, into these crescents on the smooth bark of a beach. And here on the ground, you can see the hundreds of images from the pinholes uh, of the overlapping leaves of this one single magnificent specimen of the tortuosa form of European beach. It was perhaps the highlight of my life in the collections here. So I stopped by saying, we have to come back to Goethe and we have to take the botanical garden world, our gardens and our arboreta, and remember that they are the entry point for people to interact with plants as organisms, as the actual embodiment of the photosynthetic world. And as Goethe said, what an amazing thing a living organism is, how adaptable, how there, and how itself. Thank you. Ned, thank you so much. Ned, thank you so much. That was a, a magical talk, and um, what a what a talk to end on, um, really. And with those um, pinhole images of the of, of the eclipse, my goodness, uh, that that truly is magic. Um, I said about wonder at the start of the day. The wonder in a in a in a bee orchid, and we've ended 
with an absolute show of botanical wonders. Thank you so much. And the, 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 the comments that have been coming in through the chat um, are just amazing. You, you really have uh, uh, brought imagery of, of, of plants to an art form this evening. So, so thank you. And it was, it was great and so, somewhat ironic that we began with Goethe in the form of mm -hmm. um, Goethe's Camerops Humilis, that great ancient palm in the garden at Padua. And you've ended uh, the day referencing Goethe and uh, what a great sort of round circle of the day it's it's been there there, there are plenty of questions um a lot of the comments were coming through um about those amazing well bark and cones which of course have been a highlight of your um your, your, your blog postings from harvard especially during the 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 the, the the pandemic and the lockdowns, which have been great inspiration to, to, to me and I'm sure many thousands of people that have looked at them. Um, those incredible colours of cones. And when, when you showed the Himalayan fur slide, um, I, I just gasped as you probably did when you, when you saw it, quite extraordinary. Um, well, there are some questions and they're, 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 they're some quite obvious questions. Um, starting off with the bark, Ned, um, what, what are the, does anyone know the functions of those different colored bits of bark on the same, on the same tree and maybe the, diff, the variation in bark color that we see? Um, I don't think we do. I, I, I think the greens, uh, a lot, all smooth bark species of trees always have a photosynthetic uh, layer of bark under the outer dead bark. Uh, so I can say that uh, as bark gets pushed out into the sort of outermost layers, you could imagine it coming and emerging with greens at times. But uh, at other times, the oranges, these, these what I assume are potentially carotenoid pigments, I don't believe people have studied them uh, in, in any way functionally. Uh, so I, I, I think it's just fascinating. I, 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 I think that's part of what makes me enjoy it so much is I have no idea why. But as with so much of biology, there are a million ways to do things. And for some reason, uh, all of them or many of them seem to work. Um, but the answer is I certainly don't know. And I, I will just tell you, it's anecdotal. I just feel that uh, bark is most intense in the winter. And it may just be because the sun is more intense and you're getting a little bit lower angle and the leaves are off the trees, but, but they really do seem to glow in the winter. So unfortunately, I don't know. Well, that's good. It's good to not know the answers, mm -hmm. isn't it? That's why yeah. we're biologists to find out. And then perhaps something you can answer then, um, the Vicin threads, we, we, we've had a couple of questions in. What, what are the function of those Vicin threads in the rhododendrons? Um, they haven't specifically been studied, but the assumption is that this is one of these things where aggregate uh, sort of uh, groups, large, larger groups of pollen grains going on one pollinator and moving uh, for pollinator efficiency to another flower uh, uh, is the case. Certainly in azaleas, uh, there have been some studies that show uh, that moths and but butterflies move, uh, you know, these strings of, of, of uh, pollen grains uh, quite effectively. Um, I think it would be a wonderful thing to do uh, some real pollinator studies. This would require, in the case of this species, probably working in China. One thing we did do, uh, I didn't show the video of it, uh, we brought these in and uh, we uh, did some very high speed videography, you know, several thousand frames per second. Um, and we then uh, took the, uh, a vibrating mechanism uh, and tuned it to essentially a, a bee that does buzz pollination, about 220 vibrations per second. Um, and we just had fun. I, I don't know that bees pollinate this <laughs> the species or not, but I can tell you that when you buzz these things at, at those frequencies, you see this magnificent set of shards of strings of, of these little strings, and they're just flying out and they will almost certainly hit the insect right there. We did some videography uh, in the living collections following bees that did come to our, 
our rhododendrons, and you could see buzz pollination, and you could see these fragments, uh, you know, really just hitting the bee everywhere. So it's, it's certainly an evolved pollination strategy, and I do know that most of the rhododendrons that I've tapped, um, it's rare that you'll get something where the entire content of the anther comes out at one time. Mostly you'll get bits and pieces of shorter, shorter pieces. But if you have Fortunii, and I don't know that you do uh, in Oxford, um, please visit it. it. It never disappoints. And it's got the weirdest bubblegum smell that you've ever, you know, sort of countered in a rhododendron. Yeah, I think we do have it at the um, Harcourt Arboretum. So ah, okay. I, will, I will go and look at these uh, rhododendrons in a completely different way now, Ned. And, and, and just following on from that, when, when or, or do the tetrads separate into individual grains or are they all... I don't think they do. Um, they'll, be, they'll be dispersed as tetrads uh, in, in, in rhododendron and then uh, they will arrive on the stigmatic surface as tetrads. Okay, I don't think we have. It's it just keep that. There's there's lots more comments. I mean about how beautiful everything is, rather than specific questions. That's so, fine. That's all I intended was to remind people that the botanical gardens of the world are the place where the world should meet plants, uh, as well as of course the natural world. But for so many people who live in cities and and who don't have access to nature, uh, gardens are where organisms are front and center. Certainly. And what a great, great note to end on. So, Ned, thank you very much for that um, piece de resistance at the end of what's been a, a long but a, a, a amazing day. And um, thank you to all our speakers today. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody um, or as many as possible again tomorrow as we continue uh, this symposium. So um, thank you all and thank you, Ned, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.